week. It really, it really gives us some time. Yeah. And I put it. I put your removal word in there. Well, that's. Anyway. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I would like to uh, call this meeting to order. Uh, my name is Amarjit Sohi. I'm the, uh, I'm the chair of the Transportation Committee, and other members are Consul Walters, Consul Anderson, and Consul S. Linger. And we also joined with Consul Andrew Nack and Consul Mike Nichol. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, can uh, Consul Anderson, can you I will please? move adoption of the agenda of February 5 Transportation Committee. All in favor of the adoption of the agenda? That is uh, carried. Uh, Consul Esselinger, can you please move the minutes? So All so in uh, favor of adopting the minutes of January 21st? That is carried. Any protocol items? Seeing none, we carry on. We go to select items for debate. Councillor Walters, want to go first? Uh, yeah, I'll uh, select uh, 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, 6.5, and 6.6. Okay. And 8.1. And 8.1. Well, that doesn't leave much to be. <laughs> thought I'd do it all. Why don't you do it? I'll move 6.7. Well. <laughs> all right. Okay. I'll move the remainder. So 6.7 is going to be approved. So all in favor of accepting 6.7 as approved. Uh, 5, 1, 2, and 3. And, and, the, and the status the reports. So... Can you please read back to us what we have approved? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Transportation Committee has today passed the following um, reports, uh, status reports for revised due dates, roadways snow clearing calls, revised due date March 5, 2014, bicycle network consultation and evaluation of 121 Avenue and 76 Avenue, revised due date to be determined, Long-term bus fleet strategy, proportion technology review, revised due date, March 5, 2014. And item 6.7, Fish Creek excavating change order request, provision of dollar stone aggregate. Good. Thank you. Um, request to speak. I'll move that we hear in 6.3 from Trish Scubus, uh, Liam Crotty. Uh, in 6.4, Christopher Chan, Donald Darnell, Tim Querent, Gesser, uh, Neil Dunwald, Axel von Bertoldi, uh, Robin Derry, Liam Crotty, Michael McFinn, Dion Buse, Ross Gooding, and in 6.6, 6, Syed Saharwardi, and that these speakers be heard in panels. So all in favor to uh, uh, hear from speakers? That is carried. Uh, the request for time specifics. We do have one uh, approved already part of the agenda, which is at 130 for religious assembly parking and traffic options. Uh, is there any other request for uh, time specifics? Are we there? There's one at uh, 345. There's one. At, uh, can we can we leave that time specific request to the end of all other items and see where we are if there's any chance that we're close? Uh, this is the this is the, this would be the third item. Oh no, just no, hold on. Six point three. Six point three will be the forty five request. Yeah. So you're suggesting that we move that to the end of the agenda? Yes, or make a decision at the end of the agenda. I mean, if we're finished at everything else at 2.30, we could... So, okay, so why don't we wait till we get to that point yep. then, right? And at that time, we'll decide. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. Any consular inquiries? Good. None. 
All right, status reports. We are on to our first item. Uh, So I have a question uh, uh, to clerks uh, uh, to the clerk on uh, six point one and six point two. They are uh, not cross referenced, but they are connected reports. So if there's a, if there's desire on the part of the uh, the uh, the ETSAP to uh, have them uh, heard together instead of separately, you'll be fine with that. We can cross reference them. Yes, you can. Okay, good, because that'll help us move the uh, agenda a little bit quicker. So 6.1 to 6.2 be cross-referenced. Do we need to vote on that? Uh, you'll need a motion, yes. So can you, Councilor Anderson? I'll move that we hear 6, 1, and 2 together. You all in favor? That is carried. Good. All right, we are on to 6.1 and 6.2. Please come forward. Well, thank you for being here. Um, are you making a presentation? Uh, no, we weren't formally making a presentation. We were actually going to be answering any questions that you might have on the two reports that our committee um, on these two topics submitted that are part of your documents okay. and certainly provide clarification. So I'm Von Hoy. I'm the ch current chair of uh, Edmonton Transit System Advisory Board. I have with me uh, Amy Mannix, and Bruce Robinson and Amy will, her committee have been responsible for a great deal of the research behind the two documents that were submitted to you. So three of us here to speak to that if you have questions. Good, okay. So, uh, uh, and as well, can you please uh, move the mic close to you and speak up into, uh, into the mic as well? And uh, so we'll go into, uh, into questions. Uh, uh, committee members, any questions to the, uh, to the board members? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll go uh, uh, first then. Uh, on the, uh, if I understand correctly, on, on 6.1, you have two issues. One is the analysis done related to the fair evasion. You're questioning uh, whether there are savings as suggested in the business case because of not having barriers to, uh, uh, to stop people from getting into, a, into the system, right? And the second part is, uh, uh, is related to the, uh, the cost of the technology itself. You're saying that the, the technology, the cost might be underestimated? Uh, we, we're just making a suggestion that perhaps there's some contingencies in the business plan since in other systems which are regional based, uh, cost increases have occurred with the introduction of a smart card. Right, okay. So you have made these suggestions as, uh, to the administration as well, right? Because I see the, the letter that was sent uh, to, uh, to Mrs. Stewart on, um, on this. So they are aware of your concerns. And we, uh, saw, we had subsequent um, subsequent meeting with administration, you which did. was quite good. So, you know, we were happy with what came out of that discussion. You are happy with what came out yeah, of the discussion? So. Um, we have Can you turn your mic on, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, we had a very productive discussion, uh, and and there were there there is a lot behind the business case that was done. I guess some of our board members felt that um, that there would still be issues with fair evasion because we're not sure that fair evaders will end up paying if if they have to pay under a smart card system that they might just not write at all. 
but also that there's no barriers in place that would still be honoured based within the stations themselves. Okay. So if we receive that information, uh, 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 the report for information, and you will continue your conversation with your administration, and uh, that's will you try to have that uh, ongoing dialogue. On 6.2, uh, I did have a question related to the uh, whether if we don't have the technology in place to gather the data on uh, where people are getting on, where people are getting off, how far they're traveling, uh, we can't really look at distance-based fare system until we have that data. So your suggestion of waiting till uh, we come up with a different uh, fare system Am, am I understanding you? Am I, so I don't understand you correctly. Well, let me uh, I'll clarify that. These, because the reason why these two are connected, the board's perspective on the smart fare issue and uh, ETS buying technology um, to go from the cash box system that you've got right now is that council really needs to come to decisions around um, a next level of fare structure and next level of fare structures across the region. So in our document that deals with that, we talk about peak fares, um, off-peak fares, and um, some concession f fares. Okay. And um, we're concerned, the board's concerned of seeing ETS buy into smart technology without fare structure actually thoroughly um, in place and develop that would serve a larger region rather than just the metropolitan area um, because the technology may not service necessarily what you want to do ahead of you, right? Good. Any questions, uh, Councillor Walters? So on that point, and I appreciate uh, that you've made that case that we should wait, but doesn't the technology that we'd have available to us to, to go to tender on provide us the flexibility to change you know, the expression of the, you know, you know, how people engage in the fair system and change the structure itself? Um, yes, it, it will be an account-based system, so there is, there is some flexibility there, but we just have some concerns, for instance, whether you want swipe on plus swipe off technology, and that'll mm -hmm. make a difference to the cost. Also, um, in the commissioning phase, for rolling out the smart card, you want to be testing the fares that you're going to use in practice. And that, for example, that's where Calgary's had issues with their introduction of smart fares, and that's led to delays because when they found they got to the commissioning phase, the technology wasn't working. And so we'd like to see, um, we'd like to see a decision made on the fare structure that you'd like in place first so that then that, that can be properly um, purchased with the smart cards and then tested. So if we have the, the, the structure in place before we get the technology and then we want to change the structure again at some point, you're suggesting that we're, we'll deal with limitations, so wouldn't we always be in this predicament? I, th I think to, to answer that in the board's view, if there is a more wider based fee struct fair structure, um, for ETS now, you're probably going to have, uh, you know, technology system that will have the capacity to deal we'll with catch more up. additions later, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you can assume that all the technology around these smart fare cards is going to become more flexible as time goes on, or is that not a fair assumption? I associate that with all technology, perhaps yeah, erroneously. So, so, so did I. Um, and several of us, we attended the uh, transit conference down in Calgary, uh, the, the CUTA conference. And I actually asked that very question to some of the suppliers. And it was quite surprising that the, some of the systems do have limitations. They can only go so far. Like these are businesses who are targeting, you know, specific segments of the market. And some of the supplier the vendors, systems were designed for this, some were designed for this. All of them are flexible enough that, yes, you can almost do whatever you want, but there are additional you know, costs involved in that once you have your base system in place. And we can't predict those costs because they will change. <clears throat> so we're... And that's why, you know, you, we just think you should have a clear idea what you want from your transit system. Just go, you, we don't think you need to delay buying the smart card until after, you know, they, the two of them should be more in integrated. They should be moving right. forward 
I think that, that that's how this process started 18 months ago. The two of them were almost in step. Right. And over time, they the smart card has got ahead of the fare issue. Right. I think I think it's important to add that the ETSAB is looking at this issue, which is around um, growth and um, continued innovation of the transit system that Edmonton has right now. But we're looking at it into the future where, you know, we have other municipalities that are part of a system-wide transit uh, cost sharing, right? Right. So that's important. Okay. That's okay for now. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Essendon. Thank you very much. I'd like to pick the conversation up there. Um, two questions. Really, if we had the smart fare technology, would we not be able to gather data that allowed us to move into uh, additional fare structure if we wanted? Because I think that would be valuable if we were going to consider an option. Uh, and the other question is, um, I understood that if you went to smart fare um, technology, it would also improve promote growth or more users may choose it. Did you discover any either of those? So those are my questions. Um, so with the second question, that was part of the business case, was the idea that smart cards might help for growth in passenger numbers. And that was an element of the business case which wasn't um, explicitly included in, in that benefit cost balance. And okay. Could you repeat your first question, please? The first question is, uh, if we went to smart fare technology, would it not give us additional data to be able to make choices whether we went to a, a hybrid fare structure or some of the other ones you looked at? Um, sure, it'll, it, it'll give you data. I guess it's just, when we discussed this with the administration, they said, well, it's the chicken and the egg. And I guess an issue our board had was just that um, the idea that this smart card technology that's being uh, looked at at the moment will be off the shelf and we're not sure that that will be sufficient for the fare structures that we think would be appropriate for Edmonton. Uh, further to that, um, you had done some research and, and heard discussion from other cities that have gone to the smart fare technology and, and I'm curious, um, you have cautioned us about some of the challenges they're faces but what are some of the opportunities that they've gained through going that way? Well, I'll go <clears throat> first. Certainly um, increased ridership and a lot more flexibility um, for users of the system, um, uh, making it uh, faster and, and more accessible. And to clarify too with our board, we, we do feel that the current payment system is, is very much out of date. So, so we support uh, any betterment of technology related to the payment system. Okay. And my, my final question is regarding um, your suggestion about the short distance fare or considering a peak or off-peak fares. Um, is there any evidence to indicate that that really improves ridership or is it just an additional option? So we didn't collect data. Our analysis was just conceptual in nature. Uh, perhaps it's a question to direct to administration if you're interested in those options. No, I just want to know if your research covered that. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Councillor uh, Mayor Avison. Um, apologies that I missed the, the presentation and just a question on process. Do we get an opportunity to ask questions of administration as well? Uh, we will after okay. this, yeah. Okay. Um, so if I understand correctly, you think smart card is worth pursuing regardless of whether it helps with the fare, fare evasion or not because much was made last week of the your questions around the assumptions around whether it's going to save money on the fare evasion but whether it does or doesn't there's other value such as being able to have a flexible fare system which i think you're advocating for in the second report that's before us correct Okay, and then people have talked about the data, which may be useful for us in terms of system planning and understanding how our users uh, want to use the system, whether we can, you know, create a direct route where there's a lot of transfers happening right now, for example. Uh, one of the other, I don't, in your thinking about this, um, did you take a look at the regional fair strategy report? Uh, the board has looked at the, the regional report, and I think 
certainly that's had a lot to do with uh, why so much effort was put into um, our comparison analysis. Um, at some point, Edmonton's going to, you know, need to join hands with the municipalities, and I would say it's really on that cusp now, and this technology um, will help that. Um, it's unfortunate that in the three press releases over the weekend, uh, beginning of this week, it came out um, sounding as though uh, ETSAB had issues with the idea of smart fare, smart card. We don't. We're advocates and supporters of it. What What's important, though, is, uh, and the, the um, transit review that's going on right now has indicated that um, council now needs to make some um, prioritize decisions on what it wants to do around its fares. Um, as the system grows, there's going to be more cost My time's up Mr. Recovery. Hoy, so let me just move on to the next question, which is um, uh, the reason I raised the, the regional study is that it encountered the same chicken and egg question, which is right now there's 170 plus different ways to pay for transit out in the region. And at some point, it, everyone agrees it may be desirable to harmonize that, but we weren't at that point yet, so the suggestion was that we still ought to move ahead because the data that you collect is not only valuable to a single system, but it's really valuable in a region where you can sort out whose citizens are riding whose buses at whose time and driving whose costs with what revenue. That's, that's one of the big um, inter-regional uh, value propositions behind this is, is the data about who's crossing borders. And everyone sees value in that. Um, and that was seen as desirable in and of itself even before you harmonized it with the fare structure for the region. So there's recommendations in the report about moving to a zone fare for the region, which is a kind of distance-based system, different than what you're talking about with the short, the short base. But my point is that um, the region flagged the need for there to be flexibility into the future looking ahead to adopting a new fare system that might be harmonized for the region and also taking into account that there are eight or nine different fare systems today. So that's hardwired into everybody's thinking about um, the flexibility that needs to be put into the RFP for what this system would need to be able to accommodate. Now there really are two issues that you've raised. One is time of day, which I think any system if it has a clock in it, ought to be able to do. And the other is distance. And I, you mentioned the um, there's a zone approach, and you're you're not you're not supporting that at this point in the city context. You're saying there should be a short distance fare. Do you think the only way to do that is to have a tap out reader on the bus? Yes. Okay. So uh, can I um, just respond to some of your earlier comments? Um, we just looked. No, at no. Actually, it's my it's. Uh, I okay. want to explore the question about the, the tap out reader. So the issue is that in order to do a, um, a distance based fare, uh, you need to be able to tap in and then to validate that you've only traveled X or less distance, you need to be able to tap out either at a, at a tapping out reader at an LRT station or, or um, a tap out uh, station on either the front or back doors of the bus. That has considerable extra cost to have that reader installed, and that wasn't part of our system. So I think that's the, that's the, the one X factor here. Um, but the question would be for administration when we get to it is whether we could future-proof to add that reader at a future stage if we wanted to. So, so if, we, if, we, if we protected for that, would that satisfy that concern? That's the question I have. I, I guess the short trip fare that we're advocating for is on a, on a finer scale than what a zone-based fare would be. And we're only looking at within Edmonton itself. So you're talking about a regional system with regional zones, whereas we're talking about just within Edmonton itself, we think that there's opportunities for different fare structures. And so um, in the purchase of a smart fare equipment, we'd like to see the commissioning phase, the, the design to actually include some of these components that might be sp specific to Edmonton. Thank you, Mayor Everson. Uh, Councillor Anderson? Do you still have response to the Mayor's comments that you wanted to make? Because I'd like to hear them. 
just what I just mentioned then, which was that um, there's regional zone possibilities. We were just looking within Edmonton itself. And so that's something that's separate to what the region has been um, planning for in, in the re regional fair structure report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nicol. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And first of all, I just want to give you uh, the board uh, compliment. Straight to the point, plain English, easy to understand. I wish they were all like this. Good for you. And I, and I really do, uh, I do appreciate it. Um, I was the first, when, it, when fair evasion first came up, I was the council that initiated the audit back in 2004 and 5. Um, and to the back then, I think Councillor Gibbons you, and Anderson, you might remember, it was up to a million dollars at one point that some of the numbers we were talking about. Um, so I do appreciate your, the, the, the issues around uh, that you've raised about fair evasion, but isn't it also a question of there is a policy, are there policy impediments in place when, for example, if a person just gets on the bus and refu refuses to pay and what do you do? It's just, it's just, what do you do? Um, so a smart fare might help with that. There's, yeah. Yeah. there's beeps and there's lights and things so that when somebody enters, it, it's obvious that they they have, they have or they haven't paid. Yeah. So there's that side of it. Um, and, and, and I, and I, and I agree with the mayor. I mean, the, the benefits grossly outweigh the, the, the potential. It's unfortunately that we don't have the modeling about, uh, how much. Right, but the mayor is absolutely right because this is this to me is a is a is a very good news story. I want to just move on to some of the talking about the 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 fare structures, and some of the assumptions that your board maybe have talked about. Now, when we start moving around zones and alternative pricing structures, there's an assumption of elasticity to the to the, to the model. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're thinking around some of that uh, was? I know it's a little bit economics one oh one, but it's really uh, fundamental to, your, to, to these alternative zoning strategies, is it not? Sure. I guess um, on weekends that um, you, you would imagine that there would be a bit more flexibility or elasticity in, in demand. So if people have got spare time. They don't necessarily have to travel, say, to work or things. So the lowering, putting in place an off-peak fare might encourage a lot extra ridership. Whereas if you had a peak off-peak during the day, uh, when pre people are travelling at peak times, they have to get to work. You see, you see, my point is, is you're, you, you've hit it on, even though you, you don't really say it in terms of customer terms, being able to track when, where, who, all those sorts of things provides, provides so much more, um, let's say, uh, options, what can be pursued, what can't be pursued, because it's the old adage, what gets measured gets fixed, right? And, and of course, council has heard me say that many, many times, and they'll hear it many, many more. <laughs> now, I also want to talk about uh, customers' perception of fairness, and, and, it, and it kind of spills over to the page on uh, regarding short trips and value, their conception of value and that goes to your zoning uh, pricing structures and so on. Did your committee discuss those sorts of balancing those issues out? Because I'll give you a perfect example. I had a constituent with three kids and it almost, uh, when it came to taking them to the doc, one to the doctor, it was almost cheaper to take a taxi in terms of the time that that had to be measured in terms of when the bus showed up and the three kids and all that sort of stuff. So. How do, how do I respond to her with that this system is going to uh, perhaps improve uh, the kind of service she's going to be getting towards that kind of question? There was a fairness issue she talked about, utility issue she talked about, and those sorts of things. I, I know well, it's a I tough question. In the, in the background to the report on this issue, um, you know, the off-peak fare, we see that as contributing to um, um, making transit more viable for people to make those kinds of trips, right? Right now, you pay the same fare regardless of what time of 
Tehran. So the example that we use is a couple that of ours wants to come downtown, do some shopping, go to a movie, have dinner, and go home. It's still cheaper to get in a car and park it downtown then that's not what you want to do. The transit system's about getting people moving around the city, more, as many as possible, on the system, so there's a better economy and cost recovery. Right now, the LRT's empty at times during the day. I'm just down to my yellow light. So before you keep continuing to answer that, I wanted to, you said prioritization of fare structures. Yep. Uh, if you can also give me your comments around that, about, because I'm all about making a list, right? about what priorities we should have. Yes, okay. So we suggest that um, you could implement straight away an off-peak fare on weekends because we don't think you need a smart card in order to be able to do that. So that's one way to start testing out these ideas is to perhaps do a pilot program to try it out on weekends and holidays. So maybe that would be the case that you would just use a single ticket per day, rather than that being a 90-minute ticket, it then becomes a daily ticket. And that could be done, I, I'd imagine, with, without too much trouble. Now, with the other options, they do rely potentially on a, on a, smart, fed, a smart card to be able to implement. And so we say that that's for a later time. But we do feel that both the peak off peak would help to alleviate some of the stresses on the system currently. So there is excess demand, particularly along the south side LRT route. Um, that's, but even the north side, I've had issues as well, where you just can't get on the train or you certainly can't get a, a seat. And so we feel that that would help to alleviate that problem. The other one is that Edmonton's growing in size. So sure, you might have a regional zone-based system but within Edmonton itself, it's, it's quite large, and we just don't see the equity in having somebody who's only travelling two, two train stops compared to someone who's travelling from Clareview to South Edmonton Common. It doesn't make sense that they're paying the same amount. Thank you, uh, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I just you know a couple just to pick up on a couple of points quickly, the Councillor Nickel to follow up because there we have a family pass. Um, I remember debating it here, but I think we have so many ad hoc kind of different fares right now, it's confusing people. They don't necessarily know they're there. I think we did them with all the best intention in the world, but it does strike me that they're not necessarily serving the purpose we put them into. So simplicity is part of what we need to be able to achieve here in understanding, correct? Um, and and it's, you know, it's also interesting, I mean, the other thing about, and I think you've got this in your report, about, the, about making it easier to hop on and off for a short. I know, you know, I have a bus pass, so I will, I will take I will, I will go a couple of stops. I don't think I would have done that if I didn't have that bus pass. So um, that's also part of just making it easy for people to think about using it for the short trips, but, which is a very different way of using the system from what we're currently set up for. Correct? Yeah. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, because uh, I, I, I do, I, I have to say I, I had some frustration um, with, with slowing down the smart cards. So I just want to explore this a bit further with you because, quite frankly, and I understand you guys have had a chance to weigh in what feels to me fairly late in the day, and we probably should have given you a much better chance to weigh in earlier. Um, but this is about five or six years now of being, of, of being brought a system, us saying go for it, or go further, bring us up back, and then coming back and going, oh, wait, 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 we found something better. And, I, and at a certain point, I think we have to jump. And I'm really concerned, and I wouldn't mind your thoughts on this, about sending us back into yet another study of yet another system. I don't think is, I don't, and I, I wouldn't mind hearing you say that, because I, I think, unfortunately, that may be the consequence of this. And it's, at a certain point, you have to go with the technology that's available and not always imagine the technology that may be available two or three years from now. So, Councillor Henderson, I'm going to support your comment. We're saying jump and go for it, absolutely. What we're saying is jump and go for it with some developmental work around other ideas that you could add to this for fair. And that, and that work is happening right now. I, I guess my question is, I think what I'm hearing, ideally what we need to be doing is we need to understand all the things that we want to keep on the table and, and insist on a system that's flexible enough to deal with those. I mean, that really is, you're cautioning us about, you're cautioning us about getting an inflexible system. Yeah, you don't want to, you know, um, have the experience that uh, other 
municipal yeah. colleagues have had the you know put eight million dollars into a system and and find it doesn't work in commissioning and have to add more money to right. it so right. better to, better to, to you know and I think this is the you know it's interesting and we we put on the table in the business case this idea fair evasion was never the reason we went down this road but it was put on the table as a way of trying to pitch a business case I think correct fair evasion is not the reason we're doing it it's not the best reason for doing it so part of what you're saying is that we're going to do this there's major benefits to doing this in terms of understanding how our system works, in terms of convenience for users. Let's not insist on something that has to meet the strict cheapest form of business case in order and then get a product that isn't what we need it to do, correct? I mean, the business case, you know, the, the bottom line at some point, we need to decide what's most important for us out of this system and make sure that's what we get out of the system, correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, and that may have to do with, because, and I, and I'm just scared that the idea of sort of focusing on 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 something which seems to me a lesser piece of it, which I don't think was your intention, is going to drive us in the opposite direction. Yes, we, we I guess we just wanted to correct the record. Perhaps. Okay. Um, okay, I, I I think we're all on the same page, and I and I I I, I mean one of the things I mean I, I wouldn't mind your thoughts while you're here. It strikes me that there's a lot of things we can do with our fair system. We're in the middle of doing that right now. I'm guessing it won't be definitive, that you know that you're going to be adjusting it over time and you need the ability to adjust it over time. So that's, I mean, I, in terms of this check and egg piece, I think adaptability is probably more important than anything else, correct? Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nax. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for your presentation and thank you so much for your work. We'll go to admin. Councillor Anderson. Um, Mr. Stolte et al. Um, you have read both of these reports. You have had conversations with the Transit Advisory Board in meeting format on these issues. That's correct. Is there anything here that you have either already evaluated or are going to evaluate it? Is there anything here that you have not already evaluated or have plans to evaluate in the future that may be considered by you as you bring further material back to committee? Um, the, the information that was brought to us by Heads Up reinforces the position that staff has been taking through the process as well it gives us the chance to go back and double check some of the things that we have done like information from BC Transit did they run into this problem obviously they didn't based on the discussions with their staff yesterday is that they've only implemented 10 percent of their smart card the experience in Calgary as Ed Sabbath said it wasn't looking at new technology or the best technology that we can come up with um, we've had successes the big thing is that Edmonton Transit, the city of Edmonton, has come up with, uh, with our DATS model with the Trapeze software, which was a leader in Canada and was able to save us a million and a half dollars in, in reconciling our trips, as well as smart bus technology. We're on the cutting edge of smart bus technology, and it's being well accepted by the citizens. So based on those credentials, I think um, working with, continuing to work with ETSAP in the positive way, um, they are supporting public transit. I think it's the way to go. Do you think there's any need for committee to direct you to look into anything that is contained in these two, or are you in the process of doing that or have done that? Um, it's our goal at the end of this project to be hand in hand with EDSAP and with the council to raise the flag and say, this is the best system for Edmonton. So um, no, it's, we, we're ready to just continue to work with EDSAP. The, the fair evasion issue is not an issue on buses, correct, with a smart card? That is swiped and the driver sees it and, and reads the activity the card causes, correct? Very, correct. So but you're evasion, swiping it in front of a driver. But fair evasion will always be there, um, irregardless, and we'll have the checks and balances 
um, since Councillor Nichols' time and Councillor Gibbons, we've aggressively pursued clamping down on people. Okay, that's, uh, that, that's not where I'm going. The comments about the board being unsure that the savings listed uh, are going to be realized. My question is, using a card on a bus solves the fare evasion problem on a bus. To a degree. As well as we can. Yes. The issue is having no barrier opened by a card when you go to a, uh, an LRT station or get on the LRT. That is still uh, a matter of trusting the rider. That's correct. Have we examined the benefit to solving the fare evasion problem against the cost of installing these barriers? Has that material been th thoroughly looked into and has committee and or council uh, seen it in a report of some kind that I've missed reading? They have. Um, the previous committee, I'm not sure how many years ago, two or three years ago, asked us to look at putting gates in the LRT station and it was cost prohibitive at the time. And as far as you're concerned, it is still cost prohibitive? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Everson. So just on the fare evasion, I think the assumption is that with a system like this, you make it easier to pay uh, because you don't have necessarily a bus pass that runs out at the end of the month. You have a system that can bill you automatically and be topped up or that you can top up from home and that it's easier for people who want to be compliant to have, in essence, fewer excuses not to because it's a straightforward and convenient system. That's, that's the whole point of this is meant to be more convenient for our riders. That's the proposition to the public, right? Yes, that's correct. And it's expected that with that will come a reduction in fare evasion of people who probably want to do the right thing, but it was just inconvenient for them or they forgot to, they forgot to validate their ticket or whatever. Uh, a lot of well-meaning people wind up without necessarily validating their fare properly. That's correct. So that's, that's some of the fare evasion reduction that's assumed here. The other is that um, if you've got an electronic media, it's much faster for your transit peace officers to do fare checking on the system, correct? That's correct. Instead of people digging around looking for their bus transfer, you've got, the, and they've got an electronic reader and it's either been validated or not. That's so correct. So you can move through a train a lot faster and, and identify people who are um, not paying the fares more quickly, process them, and have a, a, a more visible deterrent of them moving through the system faster. I mean, there, there are things that the technology enables that, that over and above a gate still encourage compliance with our fare policy. As well, on heavy loading areas like university or, or downtown, we can open up the back doors and have a, a, someone with a smart card just tap getting on, and it's just like paying a fare. And then you spot checks on the system. In some jurisdictions, it's called the POP method. Um, so then that's, that's, that's the issue of the value around fare evasion. The, the uh, next question I have is around flexibility. Um, it should be easy to do time of day. I actually think that's worth looking at and I'm glad that ETSAB raised it because um, I think in the fullness of time we should look at some kind of off-peak um, when, when we do get to that point with our fare strategy. I actually think that's something we should pursue. That's something that you can future-proof the system for. That's correct. Okay. Now, distance is a little trickier one because um, if you, without a tap in and, and a tap out, uh, it's a little harder to do that, right? That's correct. But Unless you're coming in from, say, uh, one of our neighboring cities and you have one smart card, you can see what's picking, you're picking up from other just regional as the ETSAB had spoke about. But that's, that's different, and I also take their point that, that they're trying to not penalize people from taking a short trip because that's actually really beneficial for us downtown. For example, if over lunch hour, people can take a short trip, and right now they would just they would drive instead or they would walk or they would just not take the trip at all. That's so there's correct. opportunity to gain marginal revenue there at no marginal cost if the system's under capacity and to develop a transit rider um, lifestyle, I suppose. That's correct. So is that something that we can future-proof for in uh, saying, okay, well, we might procure a system today, we might want to protect for the opportunity to put unload readers on the back doors of buses, for example? 
Okay, but if we were to put that in at the get-go, I'm guessing there's an incremental cost for that. I don't know if you have any idea what that would be at this point. No, but the technology would be there. The black box would be able to would be able to accept it. Now, I suppose if you got back off the front of the bus and tapped and validated that it was a short trip, it it might be possible to do that, but only if you got back off at the front of the bus. And we encourage people to get out through the back door so we keep the the flow of traffic going. Right. Um, the um, now the big question is the chicken and egg question, which is, do you change the fare structure at the same time as you adopt the technology? And I understand an argument that says you want to prove that your new fare system can work, uh, that your new fare policy, your fare structure can work with the fare technology at the same time. The challenge is, from what I understand, a lot of places they, where they've tried to do that. Um, the changing both at the same time is very, very stressful for riders. And in Ottawa, there was a lot of resistance to the smart card system, not simply because there was a change in the technology, but because they changed the fare structure at the same time. People ended up blaming the technology for what was really a beef they had with the fact that the annual pass went away, which was a fair policy change that happened at the same time as the technology change. So, so the advice I've heard is do one or the other, don't try to do both at the same times because it's a change management issue for uh, riders in terms of their threshold for adopting new technology and new patterns of payment at the same time. Comments on that? That's correct. Um, the, the important thing is that we have to look at the strategy. There's two different things, the strategy for the smart card, the strategy for the fair policy. The fair policy looks at what subsidies do we want, so what does the council want to do, where do we want to discount rides? Um, what is the revenue you want transit to bring in? And then the smart card, smart card technology needs to be able to uh, migrate into that. And we have to make sure that happens, which we are. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Walters. Thank you. I just wanted to explore the um, fare structure a little bit in terms of our context. So we, as you're aware, we have our regional uh, our, our neighbors involved in our transit system. Then we have our out, outer suburban neighborhoods, which you know our service to them technically defines our system as a coverage system, uh, as we talked about in this broader philosophical conversation about ridership versus coverage. One of the trade-offs between ridership and coverage is the equity versus the efficiency and the cost of the system. Does this hybrid system that is scores the highest in this report, in your view, help us kind of live with both of those a little more comfortably. I know that the consultant told us you can't have our cake and eat it too on coverage and efficiency, but does the hybrid fare system? Just talking about inside of Edmonton before I ask a little deeper about the regional equity question. I, I believe, Councillor, that what we have to do is look at what is the subsidy that we should be taking from the tax base. The bigger question, what's the subsidy that we want to take from the tax base for public transit? Then from there, we have to look at the efficiencies of the system, and we have to look at the user pay part portion of it. Right. So I think it's a larger discussion right. that we have to have. So once we know what our target is for what our, our, our grant fund is, then we can work back from there. So we're, we're going to have that conversation, certainly, but in you know, your view right now, how to, does the hybrid system help us manage both of those philosophies if we inevitably continue to operate under both of those philosophies? have to go back and examine the numbers around it um, even so you don't know yet is what no, you're saying. We, okay. we wouldn't and where, where you look at um, off-peak costs say for the weekends mm -hmm. people buy passes and when we calculate um, the pass multipliers the number of times people actually use on average is about 48 times a month so will people not buy the passes and go to the discount fares which would mean a loss in revenue that's a business case we'd have to review okay thank you Thank you. Councillor Esselinger. Thank you. And that's really where I was going to ask my questions, was trying to understand uh, that fare structure, because I, I wonder the same thing. If you had a pass and now you could get reduced fares on the weekend, would you still get a bus pass? Um, I just wondered what evidence you might have seen, whether uh, the short trip fares and the off-peak hour passes really increase riderships, or is it just the same people using different systems? I think we, there's this, the third um, option that happens there is that Edmonton is the, has had the highest ridership 
in all of Canada in the past five years. Our usage is constant. We see people on the routes packed during the days as well. So the cost-benefit analysis is we would call into question. What's worked in other municipalities is having a sponsored bus as a shuttle bus running around, a small bus, uh, and I use Quebec City as an example, to being able to service the downtown core on a regular basis. That, and at one point it was sponsored by local businesses. I mean, we've always talked about that and using thinking new technology and the way we're trying to move the system forward is maybe the opportunity to use a couple of those small electric buses. Um, and getting into that, that's part of our planning area that we're strategically looking towards. So it's an option for those short trips that would work better as a sponsorship. Yes, when I, I read the report, I, I was concerned when they suggested that a convenient alternative of walking might be used because I think we would encourage people to walk if it was really a, a short distance. It'd be better for all of us. So um, I'd be interested in that report, and I, I really appreciate those. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Nickel. Thank you very much. I don't want to leave you with the impression it's about fare evasion. It's not. Okay. Correct. And uh, notes and given the scope and scale of Edmonton Transit, just we got to understand that there will be some fare evasion, and it's just a question of how much, right? And you, there's. So I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that. This, this system is about mitigating fare evasion 100%, because that won't happen, will it? Not at all. No. It's how, so it's let's, how we let, manage the fare evasion. Yeah, it's, 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 let's, let's, be, uh, let's be realistic about that. It's about building that capacity for, for an options in your transit service and the data that you're going to collect around it for better measurements, so therefore it's better implementation, correct? Correct. At the end of the day. My one, um, I have just a couple of questions uh, with regards to... Um, uh, the tap out issue, I do have a concern about a two step tap out because every time you introduce a step to, a second step to any customer model, you know what that causes issues right so i 'll just express that and you can come back and maybe uh, deal with that. The second issue is the i t when you do bring back the the full blown proposal which i 'm very supportive is the IT life cycle of the actual technology in and of itself. So we have a full understanding as, because we know technology changes at a, at a tremendous pace. So I'd like an expectation of, you know, when, when a new system might be introduced and understanding those costs and so on. You follow what I'm saying there? 100%. Okay. And uh, I have to agree with uh, the mayor. Uh, do one thing at a time do it well, then do the second thing. Because all too often, we try to, as, as a municipality, even provincial and federal governments, if you try to do too many things at once, it all kind of falls apart. So with, um, um, put the system in, get it working, then we can have that, that, uh, then we can have that discussion on fares once that system has become accepted. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does, Councillor. Okay. Um, I just, uh, yeah, and just to speak to it real quick, Mr. Chairman, I want to give that pa past council full credit for, for putting this, this kind of uh, system forward. It is, uh, it's progressive, it's smart, and it, I think in the long run, the citizens are going to be very happy with it. Uh, and it gets to uh, enabling transit, the kind of data they need just to make the service better, and so we can make, and that data comes back. I don't know if you've ever seen Mr. Stolte's performance metrics, but he's got a great system right now. But uh, he's even, this will make it even better. So, and kudos for, uh, to the mayor for, uh, for the regional aspect of this, uh, because this, this is very important and has been, and it's one of the wins, the regional wins, that we never get to talk about. We always talk about bad news, don't we, Mr. Mayor? But this is one of the good news stories. So good for, good for all of you. We talk about both, they just only pick up on the bad news. Councillor Henderson. Um, uh, interesting, you know, brisk, briskness has never been our strong suit, but we have been talking about this for a long time, and I think so we're now right. on the third version of the system that I think was originally being pitched, and I think the previous council said, go for it each time, not with money yet, but, but at least with, for the technology point of view. So my question is, where are we at? How close are we actually to moving this forward? Because it's not going to get put in place overnight. I actually suspect we'll be, we probably would be in a position to do some stuff 
around the, the, the fair piece if we wanted while we were waiting for this to arrive. But it would be nice to know that we're going to be able to green light something soon. So where is that at? Um, we've had all the municipalities that are partners in this agree to resolution with Councillor or Mayor Ivinson, who was the chair of the committee last year. We have submitted the submission for the green trip money, which is $20 million. Um, we've had staff work on this project for over two years. Um, we have the RFP, and it's quite detailed, and we've had professionals working on it as well. It's quite detailed. We'll be ready to, prepared to send it out, it'll be shelf ready um, or shovel ready by uh, June, July of this year. So if the funding comes into place, if um, depending on how we might be able to finance it, um, we'll be there. So it'd be the seven million dollars we're short um, to proceed with it. So back in our court, good. Um, and uh, just in terms of my memory is, you know, in terms of this question of flexibility, one and and future, one of the one of the reasons of that you were pitching the last system that we brought to you the last time we said go for it um, was that the the technology all sits back in in a mainframe, not on the bus, not in the card, correct? That's correct. So that it is adaptable, precisely yes. so that you, it's easy to change, it's easy to update over time because very little of it's actually in the reading technology. Most of it will be sitting in a, in a central location, correct? And that, yes. was, that was one of the reasons you brought that advice forward of a system that we should be looking at. That's correct. Correct? And that's, we've already, that's the bit that we told you to go ahead with. Yes. Correct? Okay. Um, and, and we're in the middle of doing this, our thinking about fares, so, and I'm guessing, even if we gave you the go ahead this spring, which I'm guessing probably who knows how that plays out? I don't want to assume that that'll, I'll, I'll, I will be jumping with glee if that happens, but I'm skeptical. Um, uh, when we would still not be able to be in place for a couple of years with it, right? We anticipate it take about three years to complete. So, so there is the ability in the meantime, while that's coming along, to start, in, if, to, to start looking at some changes that we could do without needing the new technology to do it to our fare structure if we so chose, in terms of this not trying to do them both at the same time. That's correct. City administration is preparing a report for discussion papers through the finance area that's I've been on the working committee. And we're talking about fares and um, fees in the larger context. So council can make a decision how we structure our fees and fares, not only for transit, but for other um, costs or revenues that are being brought in. So we'd like to have the larger discussion and we have the time to do that. And we're fully in, immersed with that working committee. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm hoping we can give you the go-ahead on this soon. I think April, April may be a bit, a bit, anyway, but um, it's good to hear that and the ball's in our court. It'll be proposed during the, the capital Thank budget. You. Capital budget, which means, yeah, okay, that's what, that's what I thought was probably yes. more likely. All right, fair enough. Thank you, uh, Councillor Oshry. Thank you. Um, just to follow up, it wasn't, wasn't my question initially, but why three years? Why is it going to take so long well there's about a thousand buses to to outfit and it's getting the, all the the hardware is the big challenge with that nobody has a thousand pieces of the equipment sitting on the shelf so it's, it's not the software piece it's the hardware piece it's the hardware piece and it's three years yes i just find that astonishing we might be able to tighten it up depending on who's who is i mean saying three years on the outside if we move it up again i mean i want to make sure that we do it right and do it properly and depending on who the successful bidder is, and it's just not the cheapest system, there's a whole metrics of measurements that hardware we're using. You're talking. It, hardware and, and implementation will be part of it. Uh, okay, uh, going on the, the software side, have we, so have we, and I'm sorry, I'm still new, and I'm gonna be saying that for three years now, but have we, have we picked a software, the software for it? No. So we're still figuring out which one is the, is the best It'll be part and parcel of the RFP. Okay, and so we're, uh, we're not necessarily going with the newest and the greatest. We're going to hopefully go with something proven? Yeah, it's not technology. We're not going to be cutting edge technology when it comes to IT. It's we want success. Yes, excellent. Um, yeah, my experience is uh, being the first is not necessarily the best. Correct. In fact, it's never the best. I agree. <laughs> Unless maybe if you're Apple or something. But um, So now, just sort of um, changing tunes a little bit, uh, can you just explain to me the off-peak? So if we're looking at having a different rate for off-peak, we, don't we have less buses running, obviously, on off-peak? Do we need to have more ridership to... Are those buses still empty? Or is that what we're trying to do here, is, in, is have more riders in the off-peak time because <coughs> even though we have less buses going, they're still empty? That's the option around it. 
um, some people have charged a dollar fare where ridership's off and revenues are off, and they use it as an opportunity for people to, to try the system out, to move to the system. We have a big migration to the system right now, so it, it's one of those things we have to look at from a subsidization level, because if you're not paying down your existing, if you're paying down an existing rider, there's a loss in revenue from their business plan. Okay, and the, and the zone system, so, um, I mean, we talked about fairness and, uh, and you know, I sort of look at it as a cost recovery, cost recovery, and I know we don't recover all the costs, but a higher percentage of the cost recovery, let's just say. Um, in a zone system, when, when someone's going a longer way, they're using up more fuel and operator time and wear and tear on the buses, et cetera. So from a fairness perspective, there's one side that would say, well, we should be charging them more. So if they were coming out from the far west end where my ward is to downtown or the north end, you know, they're going to be using up a lot more of that service, so we should be cost, we should be charging them more. On the other hand, you don't necessarily want to discourage someone from taking transit um, from the far west end of, of, of the city because if it's too expensive, they're going to end up driving, potentially. Um, but why are we not... It seems to me that we're not really ser ser seriously considering the zone methodology. Strict, is that strictly because we don't want to have a second reader on a bus? No, it, was, it would be just... From a practical standpoint, from a user standpoint, the impact on the current ridership, are we going to start charging zone fares? I'm just using this for an example. Yeah. It's something we'll look at, certainly will, from the fare standpoint, is what about students that are going to be changing over zones? What about the seniors that are going to be changing over zones? It's just not the monthly pass holders that are affected by it. Yeah, well, I mean, students and seniors, you have different, potentially have different fares. I'm, I'm just... That I'm just... That becomes part of the discussion yeah. that we're going to have about wh who gets subsidized for what. Yeah, I, I just, you know, um, I would just, again, think the zone, the zone system is something that I would like you, I mean, I'm not allowed to tell you that, but my opinion is it would be, uh, an, you know, a, a, something we should maybe be looking at as, as a, a bit more seriously. I mean, we are trying to uh, um, make it fair, and, and I'm not saying we necessarily have to charge ex exponentially more, but we can charge exponentially less for short trips but really try to get more of a cost recovery model going. And we'll put that into the mix for you, Councillor, yeah. no problem. Okay. Um, I mean, this is not necessarily a transit question, but it's sort of a city question. If we're trying to encourage um, people to live in the core and, and move more towards the centre of the city, uh, is, transit, is the cost of transit not one way that we could encourage people to do that or discourage them from, from not doing that? that that's an opportunity. Um, it's along the same lines as an employer sponsoring a pass for its employees. We have some, some employers that buy passes for their employees to encourage employment. It's the backfilling of jobs and new subdivisions. Um, we've proposed in several cities that the developer buy a, month, a monthly bus pass for a year for the family. Um, so it's along the same lines as the downtown backfill I'm just, challenge. From a zone perspective, if it costs somebody four dollars for you know, make a five dollars to come from far in the west end maybe they're gonna decide we're gonna move closer to this to this core yes. where i travel every day that's an opportunity okay all right thank you very much thank you so if we receive uh, these both reports for information that's correct. you will continue to work with uh, the advisory board uh, to have their input into uh, into the in, into the smart fare technology and uh, and also the designing of we have this review going on concurrently with the with the overall transit where and and fare structure is part of that so, but you'll continue to have your conversation with the board 100 percent okay well uh, councillor anderson uh, would you be prepared to uh, move this for information i'll move uh, that we receive six one and two for information well thank you i just want to briefly speak to this um i think uh, uh First of all, on behalf of the committee, I'm pretty sure everyone here, uh, all the council members, I want to thank uh, uh, the board uh, for your ongoing uh, input into, into the system. You're all volunteers and you uh, uh, take your own time and uh, do all this analysis and provide that insight uh, uh, to us and to the administration. Thank you so much on behalf of uh, all of us. And Mr. Stolte, I, you know, uh, we need to move, move forward on this uh, as quickly as possible. And I think you heard on this side, uh, this is uh, uh, this is about taking our our transit system into uh, into the next century and uh, and providing the c customer convenience, collecting data and creating more effective and efficient system for people people to use. But whatever we do on the fare structure, please do not lose sight of the fact that 50 percent of the people who use our system have a family income less than fifty thousand dollars. 
whatever we do, we cannot afford in a way to create challenges for them to make system unaffordable. And they're the one who end up traveling long distance on the system because affordable housing and jobs do not match in the same proximity of where they live, right, and where they work. I think we need to be very cautious of um, the realities of the users and, uh, and our city when we move forward on this project. So thank you so much. With that, uh, oh, Mayor Everson. Well, uh, I think the, the virtues of proceeding with, with um, smart fare are well understood at this point, so I won't belabor them other than to just say that, I mean, this really is about convenience for our customers and riders, first and foremost. And secondly, it allows us uh, to make better data-driven decisions about where to deploy scarce resources in transit. And, um, and if it can reduce fare evasion and, and have some other benefits, then that's, those are bonuses, really, in my view. Um, I, uh, I think this is part of the importance of this is political in the sense that there is a really important opportunity to, to create a tangible example of regional collaboration. You know, it's not just that we've agreed to do it, it's that money's been identified from our neighbors to help share in the cost of this. Uh, and it will allow us not only to have that data to make decisions as Edmonton Transit, but data to help sort out cost and benefits and burdens of regional transit, which is really key for elevating the level of debate in the region about who should bear what costs for the, the burdens of growth. So this is really a, an integral piece of a much larger puzzle around the region and cost and equity and convenience and mobility for people moving throughout the, the city and region. So um, I'm glad we had a chance to talk about it and, and I too appreciate the, the work of um, ETSAP to provide advice to the system and, and would just encourage that as we continue, encourage us all to maintain an engagement with ETSAB so that as we continue to think about how we might evolve our fare structure over time that we, we benefit from, from uh, their advice and their research as well as we keep in mind their advice today. So, thanks. Thank you, Mayor. So, uh, all in favor to receive uh, 5.1 uh, and 6.1 uh, and 6.2 for information. All in favor? That is scary. Thank you so much. All right. Moving on to... Six, four. Six, four. Why is this... This is third item of business. Third item of business. We passed it as third item of business. At agenda review. Okay. Our next item is... Uh, 6.4, uh, consultation process on bike lane installation. Third item of third item of business. Agenda review said it is third item of business because there were so many speakers. Ten. Four. We wanted to give them some kind of certainty about when it was going to be dealt with so we could come down and waste a morning instead of wasting a whole day. Before we go to the administration, we do have an additional speaker on 6.4. So, Councillor Esslinger, if you could move that, please. Um, the recommendation of the committee would hear from Duncan Kinney from the West Town Complete Streets as part of 6.4. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Go ahead. Do you have a presentation? Yes. Councillor Sohi, we do have a presentation. Michelle Shalafu is going to present our public involvement on the 2013 on-street bicycle lanes. Okay, thank you. That went total wrong way. Hello, and thank you for having us here. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about this, so we're very happy to sit down and talk about the process we used in 2013, some of the highlights of it, but we also want to talk about some of the changes and challenges we've experienced since 2010. Um, talk a little bit about how we're planning to adapt to the future, uh, to some of what we've heard. But more important, more importantly, or we have a really important outcome, we're hoping to get some good information from you as council on how we can better improve how we do these in the future. So you have a good perspective and we need to benefit from it. 
the 2013 program was founded uh, in the 2009, 2009 Bicycle Transportation Plan, um, this, which this called for the bikes to become, or for Edmonton to be a bike-friendly city, which is a simple phrase with a lot of implications. It also envisioned a comprehensive network of cycling facilities uh, and, and with a range of cycling facilities. So everything from the um, sharrows and bike lanes that I think have been talked about more frequently lately uh, to some of the more complex infrastructure that could potentially include a dedicated space to separate cyclists from other transportation modes. Our process took place from January to April we had three essential phases, uh, the first being a stakeholder consultation phase where we brought in a range of community leagues, schools, cycling groups, businesses, etc. Uh, together and, and take a look at our, take an, an initial view at our plans and help us identify some issues and concerns. We took that information, went forward to a public, um, public phase, which stakeholder input still continued, but this is when we had our open houses and our online survey. We also had a number of one-on-one -on -one meetings with people in specific locations. So if you're a church, for example, um, there's, and you had some issues, we, we went out and, and met on site to talk to them about those issues. The last phase we call the pre-construction phase, but it's the report back phase um, we, where we took efforts to, to share what we had heard and what we did with it, and also just to share the final designs before construction started. We started doing this in 2010, and we've been learning and adapting and, and evolving ever since. Uh, one of the bigger changes we made was that we actually added a consultation component, and I know some of the counselors around here were, are familiar with some of those discussions, but. So at the time, we, we figured if we did the, um, applied our design standards in a certain way, there really wasn't a way that we could adapt to some of the community issues. Um, and, and so there was some discussion on that, and we did have experiences where we got that local knowledge, and we were able to um, adapt. So now we have a new way that we were more flexible in those uh, design standards, and we, did, we, have, we built in that part of the system. Another change that we went through is, or another learning that we have had is uh, large versus small venues. So in 2012, um, the approach we took was to kind of have localized meetings, a larger number of meetings in a more localized area. And uh, despite um, the full arsenal of communications we could throw at it, we had some really low attendance. And that's a problem to have low attendance and low um, public input during the public input piece. So moving forward, it's, it, we need a critical mass of people to be able to ensure there is awareness of what the project is and what the opportunities for input are um, to move forward on these initiatives. We were always talking and notifying stakeholders. Uh, we sent them letters, but uh, this year, we felt there was a greater need to build relationships and bring together all the different stakeholders into one conversation. So that was a, a good addition. Challenges. We've had a few. Um, despite our best work in 2009, I think it's just a, a general reality that citizens are not aware that future boat routes are coming to their area. And so some of the challenge we have is we, the first they learn is when we go out with public involvement and it's a four month process and that's not enough time for issues and concerns to sink in or, or, um, uh, or to be dealt with. Because we're at an early stage of the program, we know we need to do more um, on the public awareness and understanding side. We do have a very extensive public education program our, our team works in collaboration and partners with a wide variety of groups, everyone from the Edmonton Bicycle Commuters to the Alberta Motor Association. Um, it's a multifaceted approach. We, you know, it goes from working with 
um, groups to get information about these built, put into the driver training guides, um, to doing some street signs and, and ads. We also, some people may have noticed we did some Lego videos. We, we have to liken it to an early stage of um, recycling. At, it took many years of education and outreach in order for people to um, really be able to in order for, for people to start recycling like they do today. Um, with the infrastructure that we're building, having people see it, feel it, experience, that's also a big important part of how they um, understand an area and we don't have a lot of infrastructure out there. You guys are well aware, um, stakeholders are diverse, they have a lot of different points of view, sometimes conflicting. And it's important for us to hear and to listen to them all, but just by the very fact that they have different interests, we can't please everyone. One of the um, actions we are committed to going forward is to do a comprehensive review of the bike routes that we've built to date. From a public involvement perspective, we want to take a little bit of a different turn. And uh, when we are going into the neighborhood areas, and we have um, the bicycle transportation route. We also want to talk and have a discussion about other potential routes in the area and the pros and cons of those. And at the end of that conversation, we'll be able to determine which route um, would deliver the best ridership, and that may or may not be the route identified in the bicycle transportation plan. Um, again, just to reiterate, uh, the advice the council could provide on how we do these deliver, uh, deliver the neighborhood routes or, um, or the wider bicycle plan or consultation on the citywide plans, it would be really helpful. We do have um, the motion from last March to go back to 76th Avenue and 121st Avenue, and it's our hope we can take that input and, and apply it to the future studies. And for the program itself, the shift is going to the high demand corridors. These are the ones in the big um, central areas. We've started work on the an 83rd Avenue route near the university and 102nd Avenue in Oliver and Glenora. These are going to be different than the neighborhood routes. There's uh, more complex infrastructure, more complex operations. So. There's going to be impacts, and we'll have a discussion about that, but uh, we just need to be aware that that's not going to be easy. Finally, as we um, shift our program in this direction, it may mean that we are building fewer bike lanes in the short term, and that's important for you to know uh, because we have some strategic documents that, may be, that have anticipated a larger program. So thank you. That's the presentation. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we'll uh, go to uh, speakers next. Uh, I understand we would have to uh, panel the speakers uh, in two panels, right? Yes, Mr. Chair. There are 11 speakers altogether. So if you go six right. first, five later, or five first, sec uh, six second? It doesn't matter which one. We'll go for six in the first panel then. So uh, uh, Christopher Chan. Is Chris here, please? Uh, Donald Darnell. Tim Q. Rengesser. Got it? Yeah, right on. Neil Dunwald. Neil? Alex von Bertoldi. So will be number five and number six. Robin Derry. Robin? Please. I will uh, quickly explain to you the process. Uh, each of you will have uh, five minutes uh, to make your presentation. Green light will indicate that your time is starting, and uh, yellow means that you have one minute remaining, and uh, red light means that your time has expired. So uh, 
uh, please go ahead. Uh, Christopher. Hi. My name is Chris Chan. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Edmonton Bicycle Commuter Society. We're a nonprofit. We represent over 1,100 paid members, and we support all forms of cycling in Edmonton through our volunteer run bike shops, on road cycling training, and our programs for youth and special needs children. Today's a good day for bike infrastructure in Edmonton. Today, we start the discussion already acknowledging that cycling infrastructure makes the city a better place to live. Studies across North America show that supporting active transportation is good for business. It's of course good for air quality, it reduces noise, and it makes communities safer. Fewer cars mean fewer collisions, less congestion, and less demand for parking. And active living dramatically lessens an individual's cost to the healthcare system. And of course, bike infrastructure can be, bil be built for a fraction of the cost of building car infrastructure. Building a livable city, one where its citizens of any age or ability can stand outside and actually enjoy the experience, means building a city that embraces and supports active transportation. It's not just about people that want to ride a bike safely. It's about making the city more livable for everyone. Building a strong, sustainable, livable city isn't a matter of ideology. It's a matter of adopting practical strategies and evaluating results to incrementally improve quality of life. Today we're here to discuss not whether bike infrastructure is good for Edmonton or whether it's worth money. We've got the policies, we've got the master plans, we've got the ways. The city has a vision which says it's good and it's worth it. Today we're here to discuss how to improve that infrastructure, to recognize that the cheapest way to do it is not always the best way, and to look at how we can improve the buy-in and, and, and the consultation processes. Our top priorities, EBC's top priorities, are building high quality infrastructure through 83rd Ave and 102 Ave. It's gonna cost more to build this right, with traffic calming and landscaping through residential areas, and along busier sections, protected cycle tracks separated from auto, auto traffic. But it's worth it. The communities want this, and it aligns with the city's own top priorities. And we look forward to the extended consulta consultation process beginning this year so that there are no big surprises down the line. We're looking forward to starting in on that consultation even before there's design plans. Not all bike infrastructure is created equal, nor should it be. Not all the routes are the same. And some roads, roads need stronger protection or increased travel priority, and some already calm streets can benefit simply from signage and wayfinding. Existing on-road bike infrastructure in Edmonton has generally been built to suit a more confident cyclist. There are many reasons for this, including engineering restrictions and cost. And when you get down to actually trying to map out bike routes, you come to the realization that there often aren't many direct cost-effective options to get across major roads or ravines in Edmonton. So right now, we have the best that could be done with the resources available. And it's worth mentioning that they do serve a significant portion of the population. About 10% of the general population is, is comfortable with the kinds of bike lanes that we have in Edmonton right now. With unlimited resources, could they be made even more accessible? Sure. With, with our limited resources, is there room for improvement? Maybe, but there are three criteria that the city needs to consider when deciding to change or relocate a bike lane. Safety, design capacity, and viability of alternatives. Decisions need to be evidence-based and not based only on the perception of users. And there must be clarity on purposes of roadways. 106th Street, for example, is a residential collector road. It's not supposed to be high volume or high speed. And that's what 111th Street and Gateway and Calgary Trail are built for. Sufficient time must be given to evaluate and gather evidence. Many of the 2013 bike routes were built in, this, in the last fall. Deciding six months later to remove them is neither financially prudent nor time enough for meaningful data collection. And the only exception would be if there has been a significant and noticeable sustained increase in collision rates, then of course you'd want to evaluate, reevaluate those immediately. Spending money to remove existing bike infrastructure must be strictly tied to funding for replacement alternatives. The focus must be on improving infrastructure and not removing choice. 
Cycling infrastructure must find a balance and work in the context of a city that's grown up around the personal automobile. But so too must automobile infrastructure find a balance and work in the context of a city that recognizes that its future lies in shifting that focus, and that an ideological devotion to high speeds and more cars leads only to more traffic congestion. Let Edmonton find its balance on the right side of the future by fully funding 83rd Ave and 102 Ave, and by evaluating existing infrastructure based on rational, objective evidence. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Uh, Mr. Darnell. Good morning, councillors, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm Don Darnell. I live on the south side of Edmonton in uh, Aspen Gardens, a neighborhood I love. Um, I have here a report. I think many of you have had a chance to look at it before. It's one in a long series of research on uh, uh, safety in uh, and cycle infrastructure in cities in uh, North America and in Europe. Um, this in particular is done in two cities in, in Canada. Um, the main lesson from this research is that design of bike infrastructure has a big impact on usage and on safety. Not immediate, it takes time for these things to settle in, but uh, substantial impact. The safest infrastructure requires some investment, uh, like uh, what I believe is planned for the Strathcona area and downtown. Uh, I strongly support spending our tax dollars on these sorts of revitalizing, focused, pedestrian-oriented developments. Uh, I think they're key to Edmonton's success as a city. Um, but the research also shows that very minor investment, uh, such as the bike lanes recently painted near my neighborhood in Aspen Gardens, um, also have a big impact on safety, uh, reducing injury by as much as half. Again, it takes some time to realize those benefits for people to get used to the, to the infrastructure. Um, but sometimes we hear concerns voiced about the safety of these uh, painted lines on the, on the roadways. And I, I just want to point out the research is really quite clear on this. Uh, we're talking about half the risk of injury for the cost of paint on the roads. Um, Sharrows, by the way, uh, don't seem to have a big impact on safety, although they certainly have other benefits. Um, I drive frequently on 40 Avenue and 106th Street to uh, where the, uh, I would say, newly endangered bike lanes are. Um, and in driving on them, I'm convinced that these streets are already safer uh, in October and November when they first went in. Uh, traffic is more orderly. Uh, safe speeds are more common, and I'm talking about vehicular uh, auto traffic here. Um, and there are many people in my neighborhood, um, and people that I know and care about, who uh, who cycle. I cycle some on these streets and and uh, throughout the city. Um, and I'm really glad that this infrastructure is available. I'm glad to see it expanding. Uh, just to point out a few, there are a bunch of kids in our neighborhood. It's like living in the 50s in Aspen Gardens. Kids roam the neighborhood on these quiet streets on their bicycles. And as they get a little older and more adventurous and more independent, uh, they make their way uh, along uh, 40 Avenue out towards the library. Uh, kids are making their way to school, to uh, Harry Ainley and to Strathcona High School. My son, uh, who has Tourette's syndrome and is probably better that he not drive for a little while, he still has that independence and freedom when he comes back from university to make his own way over to uh, the White Mud Library or, or to get on the LRT trail to go downtown. Um, uh, my daughter uh, has all these activities at Strathcona High School and she now has a more protected route for getting uh, to Scona from our neighborhood. Um, uh, my own wife commutes to work only in, in fair weather, but she uh, takes a full hour commute uh, to, to get to work and back. Um, and for all these folks, uh, 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 cutting the risk of injury for them by half is a big deal. Uh, I don't intend to have any other wife. Um, and I, I really care about these people that are going out. I, I, I feel like I should enumerate just a couple of other examples just to bring it to home, so I hope you keep these folks in mind. Um, my dentist, who lives just around the corner from me, he commutes to his office every morning on his bicycle. Um, uh, everybody I've ever met who works at the University of Alberta seems to <laughs> bicycle commute. Um, 
I like it that we are invested, uh, that we have invested a small fraction of our transportation budget to make life more pleasant and safer for people on foot and on bikes. And I hope when you are looking into budgeting for this type of infrastructure, the fancy stuff, uh, like in Strathcona and downtown, and the cheap stuff, it, you'll keep in mind that the expense is very small relative to what we pay for interchanges and roads that are exclusively for cars. And when you are hearing people a bit freaked out about new paint on the roadways, I hope you will keep in mind that the benefit of these investments in our communities can ultimately be measured in lives saved and injuries avoided. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kieran Singer. Kieran Gesser. Kieran Singer. Okay. Sorry for that. My name is Tim Kieran Gesser. Mine. Tim. Apology is mine. Okay. Tim. How is About that? a year ago, I moved to Edmonton from Toronto. Soon afterward, I started a group called the Edmonton Wayfinding Project. We advocate for a city designed with pedestrians in mind as well as motorists. I speak to you today as a member of that group, but not on behalf of it. I'm 36 and I don't own a car, even though I make enough to afford a nice one. I love cars. I buy car magazines like candy. I've rebuilt cars with my dad. The reason I consider Edmonton a superior city to Toronto is my ability to move about it without using a car by using my feet or my bicycle. My walk to work every morning has increased my quality of life immeasurably. My rides to the city on my bike are precious to me. So I speak to you today as a pedestrian. It's important to note that cyclists are pedestrians. We move about Edmonton quickly, nearly as quickly as cars, but just as quickly we get off our bikes and we walk into stores or we say hi to friends. In short, we interact with the street. If you think of cyclists as pedestrians, new, real, new realizations come into focus. Pedestrians spend more at street side retail over time than do motorists. New studies in the UK and US confirm this. We interact with the streets, businesses, people, nature, because we don't have to worry about parking. But pedestrians do more than that. We add vibrance to streets. Vibrance draws more people to streets. People like to be around other people. And these people add to street safety. Unfortunately, cyclists share the hazards of being a pedestrian in a car-focused city like Edmonton. I would encourage you to review your 2011 overview of collision statistics and consider the stats for pedestrians, cyclists and walkers, when colliding with cars. A fender bender between motorists is often an unfortunate inconvenience. For a pedestrian, nearly every collision with a car, as confirmed in your stats, results in an inju injury or too often a death. In fact, I have also nearly been hit several times in just 10 months here. So let's talk about bike lanes. I want you to reconsider how you think about them. First, bike lanes are not annoying add-ons to roads. They are not negations for drivers. Roads are built for taxpayers to move about their city, and pedestrians are taxpayers. We just beat up the roads a lot less. Cities tend to view motorists as taxpayers and pedestrians somehow as less than that, but it's not true. I pay taxes, and soon I will own a home. And I don't cost the city as much because I don't drive on its roads. So if we're talking about the cost of bike lanes, I would submit that the real cost unexamined here is the cost of drivers. From infrastructure to greenhouse gas emissions, to traffic congestion, to street vibrance. Bike lanes add to safety on our roads for all involved, cyclists, pedestrians, and motorists. Further, they add to safety on our sidewalks. Cyclists in Edmonton tend to ride on sidewalks currently because they don't feel safe on the road. This puts walkers at risk and sees cyclists riding through intersections at places where they are hard to see for motorists. Bike lanes would solve this. So what sort of bike lanes do we need and where? We need segregated bike lanes, bike tracks, and we need connected bike lanes leading to, from, and through the downtown core. We need a dedicated east-west and north-south route that can handle lots of bike traffic. We need a network. In summary, I'm here to ask you to stay the course. Cities tend to look for, for reasons to say no to bike lanes by consulting to death. While continue continuing to build roads, we tend to judge disconnected bike lanes as failures when people don't use them, rather than realizing they're just like highways. Connect them and people will use them. We need to start accepting all the reasons to say yes. 
we need to learn from Vancouver, where motorists subjected and loudly to bike lanes when they were installed, then quickly adapt, adapted to them. We need to hear the many people saying they want bike lanes with their feet and their wheels. You see us all about the city in growing numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Neil Dunwald. Hello. Um, my name is Neil Dunwald. I'm the Civics Director at Blue Quill Community League, and uh, I'm also a member of the Southwest Area Council. And uh, I'd like to publicly thank uh, Councillor Walters for all the hard work he's done over the last four or five months, uh, giving voice to the concerns of his constituents. Uh, his report uh, was very instructive for all of us, and um, I would like to read a or part of a letter um, from the Southwest Area Council. Uh, this letter was circulated among our ten community leagues, which are bounded essentially by Black Mud Creek, uh, the um, White Mud uh, Freeway, and Calgary Trail. And the, there's about ten community leagues in this area, and we've come to uh, some conclusions on this matter. The major request, and I believe you all have the letter, is that while SWAC recognizes and supports the city's commitment to active modes of transportation, particularly bicycling infrastructure, the process, planning, and outcome of the dedicated on-street bike bicycle corridors in our area have proved unacceptable to our residents. Moreover, we do not believe that the current plans can be salvaged in bits and pieces to achieve a satisfactory resolution. Um, accordingly, on behalf of our member leagues, we are requesting that the dedicated on-street bicycle corridors be removed from the neighbourhoods served by Blue Quill, Greenfield, Duggan, Ermanskin, Royal Gardens, and Yellowbird Community Leagues. Now, this um, does not mean uh, that we're divergent, really, from what Councillor Walters has recommended. The major difference, uh, I believe, is that a timing issue. Uh, Councillor Walters has uh, identified several problem areas and has recommended removing uh, the dedicated on-street paths and replacing them with something else. Uh, the letter we have left open from our community leagues is to say, yes, remove them, but let's discuss what we're going to replace them with. And if the choke points are nearer the university, if they're nearer downtown, we've only got so much money, let's spend the money on where we can get the biggest bang for our bucks for our cyclists, uh, rather than what we have been doing. So we're, we're, in, we're intentionally silent on the types of bicycle infrastructure that may come about in the future. Um, I think that the communities want infrastructure, but not as it was trialed in our neighbourhoods. Uh, our requests leave all north-south commuter routes mainly unchanged. The routes on 119th Street, 114th Street and 111th Street would not be impacted at all by our uh, recommendations. The uh, route on 106th Street, if Councillor Walter's uh, proposal was accepted, would be changed by a um, Cheryl between 40th and, 100, or, and 51st Avenue on 106th Street. So that would be the only major uh, north-south uh, commuter change. We have also advocated in the past and uh, for better infrastructure along the 111th Street corridor and on the 23rd Avenue corridor and the multi-use multi trails there. Um, and again, it's an it's a impact of budgeting. I walk uh, between Century Park Station and Southgate uh, quite frequently, and quite frequently the multi-use trails are snowbound, icebound. They're difficult to walk on. And we seem to find ourselves ways of saying we're going to invest in snow removal on streets and this and that, but we're really not. Um, we're, we're really not focusing our resources on making the corridors available to the cyclists, etc. And I, I want to speak a little bit to what I think. Um, this is not on behalf of the council or Blue Quilt Community League, but what I think has gone wrong with the process. Last March 13th, I spoke to this body. And I indicated that on this effort, the biggest problem is that before the infrastructure was trialed, that uh, a statement or a series of statements was not made. Uh, and I think the paradigm uh, here is that the whatever infrastructure we're trialing, it must be proved safe 
and effective for an intended use. The dedicated on-street bicycle lanes that we got did not have an intended use statement. We see children in them, and sending children out onto the streets to play is not safe. And we, at the end of the day, have no data on, after a three-year trial, whether safety has been improved or whether efficacy of those uh, trails has been improved. And I, I think that's a, a major public consultation problem. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Alex von Bertaldi. It's Axel. Thanks. So my name is Axel. Um, I've been living in Edmonton for about seven years. I'm a software engineer in town, um, and I live in Toroilgar, and I consider myself a cyclist, though I also have a car and drive sometimes. Um, and I commute to work every day. My commute is about 12 kilometers each way, which adds up to about 6,000 kilometers a year, and that's 6,000 kilometers I'm not driving. Um, but like I said, I do drive too sometimes. Um, and so from following this issue, um, I gather that for opponents of bike lanes, uh, one of the main arguments I hear against them is that uh, uh, adding bike infrastructure takes away from on-street parking, uh, takes away from driving as well, slows traffic down by taking lanes away, and also takes resources or could take resources away from uh, from cars uh, for road maintenance, uh, winter maintenance of roads, and and new roads. Um, and generally, that bike infrastructure would take away from car infrastructure, which you know I can't argue against. Um, and I also uh, hear people. Even some councillors, I think, if I understood them correctly, suggest that um, when designing bike infrastructure, um, the infrastructure should accommodate, or you know, should be, I guess, in my view, sacrificed to accommodate uh, these concerns. You know, on-street parking uh, and basically inconveniencing cars. And um, <clears throat> I think, I believe that that's a fundamentally wrong-headed um, line of thinking and it's sort of a symptom of Edmonton's uh, car-centric car culture and here's why I think that. Um, so I think bike infrastructure is a matter of public safety. It's not something that's nice for cyclists or a gift to cyclists. Um, I think when the city doesn't provide adequate bike lanes, adequate and safe bike lanes and forces cyclists like me uh, to share the road with cars, they are endangering cyclists, and that's me. Um, and I actually, I really believe that because I experience that five times a day, or sorry, five times a week. Um, I've had weekly, basically, I have uh, I have close calls with vehicles which, at best, don't see me, and at worst, are aggressive, uh, deliberately aggressive towards me. Um, and so I don't think, uh, I don't think city planners uh, take drivers and parkers' convenience when they're designing things like crosswalks, because um, crosswalks are a matter of safety. And so I also don't think they should take uh, drivers and parkers' convenience when they're designing bike infrastructure, because it's a matter of safety. Um, also, I think if, if the city compromises uh, the quality um, and the safety of bike infrastructure for the sake of cars, it's going to mean that driving is still more convenient and more attractive than cycling. And so less people will cycle than they would otherwise. They'll continue to drive. And so the, you know, the bike infrastructure experiment will sort of fail before it even gets going. So I think cycling infrastructure, and this applies also to, to public transport, has to be at least as attractive an option as driving. Otherwise, people will just continue to choose cars over cycling. So it's sort of a matter of common sense. Um, and I think it's also a matter of fairness. Um, I pay taxes too, and with every one of those 6,000 kilometers a year, I don't drive and cycle instead. I'm subsidizing road infrastructure, ever-expanding road infrastructure. Um, and since I drive too, I wouldn't really begrudge that if I was getting what I needed, which are bike lanes. But I'm not, so I do begrudge it. Um, so when I hear, you know, when I hear people and even counselors suggest that bike infrastructure should should uh, 
I should make concessions to, to driving infrastructure. I get a little bit excited. Um, so this, I mean, I think the city is one big concession to the automobile. Um, there are roads in my neighborhood that don't have sidewalks, so walking isn't even safe in some places. Um, and I think it's kind of a, a pretty glaring example of the, the car-centric culture, um, which to a certain extent the city enables by, by continuing to, to expand um, automobile infrastructure at the expense, arguably, of cycling infrastructure and public transport. Um, so I think, I think cars have had their way for long enough in Edmonton, and it's time, for, it's time to give other modes of transport a try. And if that means taking away from, from automobile infrastructure, I think that's a perfectly reasonable compromise. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Robin Jerry? Yes. <clears throat> I'm Robin Derry. I live on the south side in Ward 10, and I work at uh, Concordia College, University College campus. I'm on the faculty of the University of Lethbridge, the Edmonton campus, and my office is over uh, on the Concordia campus. So uh, I'm also a writer, and it is about, just flashing on and off, my commute is about 20 kilometers each way. I do use the, uh, and I'm 60, and uh, I, I think that biking is really my only option to getting fat as I get older because I sit all day like so many of us in our jobs. So uh, this is my attempt to kind of cost Edmonton and Alberta a little bit less money by uh, trying to stay healthy. Um, I don't think that I fit of most of the stereotypes of the kind of radical bike commuter uh, as I encountered the, the stereotypes and images that were being uh, kind of presented and looked for at the Ward 10 uh, meeting back in November. I attended that meeting that uh, Councilman Walters organized and I appreciated that. There were a number of people there on their bicycles or who had arrived on their bicycles. Um, I've read the report from the meeting, and I was one of the trained facilitators at the tables. So uh, I completely really agree with the findings of the report that um, it represented the majority view of the people that were there. There were hundreds of people there who were up in arms, who were angry about the new bike lanes, and then there were dozens of people who had come on their bicycles who were... Uh, a little quieter and uh, trying to sort of express their own viewpoints and their own needs. Um, I think that it's true the large, vocal, strong majority are uh, unhappy with the bike lanes as they were installed and they feel inconvenienced by them. Um, and my perspective is that they need to open their eyes uh, a, a good bit to the number of cyclists that are around and not assume that uh, these are just for people who are kind of extremists in some way. Um, and I think also that while certainly a democracy is meant to represent and respond to the needs of the majority, um, I think it, a measure of its success is really how well it also attends to and pays attention to and protects the needs of its minorities. And uh, bicycle commuters are a minority, uh, but they are a, a healthy, contributing minority that really supports the strength of Edmonton and attracts many people from other cities who might come here because of our wonderful parks and our wonderful uh, bike routes. We do have multi-use trails. We have parks through the river valley and the ravines. And I encounter dozens of people every day on their bikes on these paths. So uh, I encourage you to think actively about this minority and the very tiny, tiny number of roads that have been uh, put into use as bike lanes. We're not asking for a majority of the roads. We're asking for a small handful of the roads to contain bike routes uh, so that we can cross the city in safety and get to the multi-use trails and the, uh, the larger trails through the ravine or to our workplaces safely. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, uh, to all of you, uh, we'll go to uh, questions uh, from the council members now. So, no, uh, we're done uh, for this panel. We'll uh, we'll have questions to this panel, then we'll go to the next panel. So, Council Walters. Thank you. I appreciate everybody being here, and speaking passionately about this issue, and it's uh, certainly been an issue, as no one's surprised to hear, that's been in front of me uh, for a number of months. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you how I feel uh, as we go through, but the questions I have, I want to start with um, uh, Mr. Chan, and you, you described, um, you know, I think of, you know, you, you reflected the vision that's in the bicycle uh, transportation strategy uh, very well and that we have broader goals other than just an automobile uh, being an automobile centric city uh, which I support but can you give me a sense of uh, why in your opinion uh, we rolled out the strategy the way we did that we did lanes and neighborhoods where we were certainly to anticipate more opposition and less awareness than in neighborhoods like downtown and Strathcona? Why, why in your view, was it rolled out that way? Um, well, there's a couple of reasons. Of course, uh, what you're getting at is that the routes that we're looking at for the future, 83rd F and 102F, are going to cost more money, and they would have cost more money than what was allocated for, for uh, the last capital budget. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, so the city implemented routes that, that were more affordable, but it still went through a, a selection process that prioritized routes. So for instance, the Southgate area in the, transpor er, in the transportation surveys uh, has one of the highest proportions of, of cycling uh, in mm -hmm. the city. So in the past, I've, you know, my sense is that many people in your organization felt that it would have been more strategic and, and and uh, smarter to put the lanes where they were going to be met with celebration as opposed to the kind of opposition that we've seen in the outer communities. Do you, do you believe that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, question for, for Mr. Dar Darnell. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, your views and I thank you for all the information that you provided me with. Uh, for every person that, like yourself that's given me this kind of support, you know, encouragement to continue forward, there's been a hundred that are opposed. And, and I'm not overstating that in terms of the communications to our office. What's your sense of, you use the term freaking out. Um, can you say a little bit more about why you think, why you feel as someone who cycles, it's clearly well researched why you feel the communities of Ward 10, as an example, have been as, as concerned and upset as they are, and as you, I know you're aware they are. Yes, um, I, I do think that it was very unfortunate timing for the installation of the bike lanes, uh, right at a moment when there's sort of a critical mass of conversations with the election coming on, uh, and I think that may have fed some groupthink. Uh, I don't know that that explains the entirety of, of what you're uh, speaking of. Um, and I don't know that I have, uh, I, I, I have tried to understand some of the concerns about traffic flow and parking because uh, those seem, uh, I'm an engineer by background and uh, uh, I, I like solving problems. So I've, I've spent some time driving on these roads, even when I didn't have somewhere to go on these roads, to try to analyze, well, where, you know, where are the hang-ups? And I have to admit, I have not found uh, the kind of problems that, that I imagine are, are being described so vociferously. And I also haven't heard very specific descriptions that, that match anything that I've seen. So to some degree, I think that the freaking out factor is about people not being well prepared and engaged with okay. what was going to happen. And I'll, and I'll ask these questions of administration, but um, uh, as someone, so I'll, I'll ask you this, uh, Mr. Kressinger, as well, you talked about, you know, over consulting and we shouldn't worry about that, but part of consultation is education. So based on the opposition that, not just in my ward, but this has been a conversation now for a number of, of months. How well do you think the city has done in terms of educating the public about the benefits of bicycle infrastructure and how these actually work? 
Uh, since I've only lived here for about 10 months, I couldn't, uh, everyone who knows me would be surprised that I'm going to say that I don't really have a great answer. Um, but okay. um, I would have to say I don't have a great answer on how well okay. you've, you've done to educate. So I won't waste your time on that. I'll switch the question to Mr. Chan. How would you answer that question? About, you know, in terms of the, the city, or, you know, helping get the communities organized and supportive and educated and bought into this stuff, how, how well has that gone? Um, well, clearly there's, there's, as the city has said, there's been challenges. So mm -hmm. um, we definitely support uh, changing the, the process and, and finding what can work better. Okay, I'm out of time for now, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to uh, Councillor Nack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Darnell, uh, you mentioned the research shows that increased ridership, or rather, um, the, the research shows that having the painted line still does improve safety. Um, do we know if that increases ridership? Does the research show that? I'm curious. Yes. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers right in front of me. Okay, yes. no, I was just curious. Um, Mr. Chan, you and I have talked about this before, I think, we're, and um, just, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but if you had the choice, let's take the spots where we just put the painted lines on the roadway, would you rather have that or would you rather see dedicated infrastructure, like a dedicated bike lane, if you had the choice? Recognizing, yes, it costs more money, but. Uh, sorry, uh, you, the options were just. Pa the painted line like we have right now in a couple areas or a dedicated bike lane or a multi-use trail, something like that. As in separate from auto traffic? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, you know, it, there is a bit of nuance because it depends on the road context. Sure. There are some roads where the expense uh, and the the road width considerations don't make sense. But but just all else being equal, yeah, protected. So in recognizing context. expense, of course. But yeah, I think uh, safely would that be sort of the impression? If you had the choice to the most of the cyclists, would you prefer dedicated lane? versus just a yes, no? Yes, definitely, and I'll, and I'll mention the, the new bike lanes on 40th Ave. I use those regularly, and I've seen cars drive and park on them very often, so the, the only option, I think, to avoid that, well, I mean, you might say education is an option, but uh, I, I don't know how well that would work. Um, so I think, yeah, separated bike lanes, uh, multi-use trails would, yeah, would be my preference as well. So then to, to Mr. Dunwald, um, so in order to make some of these changes, whether it's the, the um, replacement of lanes, so let's take, I'm going to take my neck of the woods in 95th Ave. Um, if we want to make changes, which is either putting in a dedicated bike lane and maybe maintaining the two lanes of traffic or moving it onto a, a corresponding avenue that still provides that direct route, that would likely mean we have to spend a little bit more money. Um, so as a taxpayer, what's your thought? Would you be willing to spend a little more to potentially accomplish common goals, to which it both gives us better bike infrastructure and great movement of uh, goods and people on vehicular traffic. Would you be willing to spend a little more? Well, I, I think the, you know, testimony here on March 13th was it takes $20,000 per kilometer to install these. Um, so uh, city administration certainly doesn't think uh, that it takes very much money to install. The bigger questions come uh, in maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a 500 kilometer uh, bicycle network on roads where uh, you may get one rider a day in the winter and you're spending $20 million to keep these, snow, these uh, bicycle lanes free of snow, no, I wouldn't. I, I don't think that's a wise use of money. I think that you want to take areas where there's obviated demand and design infrastructure to meet that demand. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that it's really important for the city to lead and say, we're going to create demand for this. Because, you know, with the, with the money we have for infrastructure, I think crosswalks at schools with flashing lights are every bit as important as bicycle infrastructure. And let's face it, we have we have to balance our, our budgets and our priorities. And what we have uh, indicated in our area is not to get rid of the bicycle infrastructure, it's to get rid of the on-street dedicated infrastructure. And the, the routes that we're advocating being removed from are very low volume routes. Even in June and the busiest of days, you get 10 or 15 riders on these. It is not worth the uh, 
the investment of resources, in my, in my opinion. And that's a cost-benefit thing, and, that, and this is why I said earlier, the biggest thing that we are missing in this whole debate is when you set out to test these things, it should have been said beforehand, success means that we will have X riders a day using this, we will have very few incidents of people having to park in the bicycle lanes, we will have blank, blank, blank. But now, after three years, we're, going to, we're, we're talking about, oh, from now on, we're going to evaluate. We said, there, well, this was done improperly in the first place. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Henderson. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm just trying to think where to start. I, I, guess, I guess my first question, Mr. Chan, let's go first, because I, and one of the things that's been puzzling, and I, I, I'd have to say in some ways, um, I would be delighted to have all the infrastructure spent in my ward, because I think there's huge demand for it. 83rd Avenue, I know there's been a lot of work. That having been said, I'm recognizing there's a whole bunch of people using the infrastructure right now that that will not serve. Um, so I wanted, but I do have a question about making sure that what we are putting in and the level of compromise we go to, understanding that any kind of retrofit, and we had this with the LRT, there is no way to retrofit these kind of things into a city without there being some kind of consequences. So I want to make sure as we go forward, even with some of these other ones, Mr. Chan, that we're getting it right, that we're not trying to make everybody happy and as a result make everybody miserable. Um, and I, I'm just wondering in terms of some of the stuff we've done, the, you know, the way you know, where we have shadows because we have to move around something, whether or not um, we're being vigilant enough and actually creating, creating a system that is making people feel safer and, 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 and getting more usership on some of the pieces we've already put in. There are certainly examples of infrastructure, like infrastructure in Edmonton, where compromises have been made both to appease local uh, needs, such as on-street parking, um, and, and perhaps just engineering restrictions of road widths. Uh, and the result is less than ideal cycling infrastructure. Um, so looking forward at the 83rd Ave and 102 Ave routes, um, we really are quite hopeful, even in the RFP that the city put out, it, it described the kind of infrastructure that we want to see and not just, um, not just something, but very specifically it, it said bike boulevards and cycle tracks, protected cycle tracks. Okay. And, and we're confident that, that uh, the West Downtown Complete Streets Group and the Strathcona Complete Streets Groups have both already come up with those ideas yeah, as, I, as applicable yeah, and yeah, useful. I, and, and that's the idea. I'm even wondering about where we're painting lines, so whether we, can, whether we need to do that job better. And, I, and I'll go to uh, Mr. Patoldi, because I, I have your experience all the time. I mean, I bike, I bike constantly. I go the places that I, I have to go because no other, I'm not going to go around 10 blocks. The bicycle is not going to go around 10 blocks. It's not a realistic expectation in order to find that safe place to go. So you're forced into traffic if you're going to do it. I'm sort of belligerent about it. I go, I pay my taxes too. I have a right to be there. But I have the same experience you have because I'm in the drive lane where I have every right to be. But a lot of times the vehicles clearly don't feel I have a right to be there. I, I went down the hill on, on uh, uh, just down here one day, and I can't believe what, and I'm going, I'm going the same speed of the traffic when I'm going down that hill, I can't believe what vehicles do to me and how aware I have to be. I had one truck come in the same lane as me with another car in the same lane. There was no room for three vehicles there. So really the question is we need to create, so everybody has clarity, a safe space where the bikes can know where they are and where vehicles can know they have a right to be. And that's got to be the objective. Whether it's a painted line or something else, that's really what we have to achieve here, correct? Correct, though I guess from my experience, I would say that a painted line isn't enough. Uh, and I, I think that was my question to, to, to Mr. Chan, but, but the painted line at least creates clarity of understanding of where everybody is supposed to be on the road, which is already legally the case, right? We're not changing anything that isn't already the law, but it creates a sense of, it, it actually does create clarity for everybody about what the rules of the road are, which makes it better, correct? Better. Somewhat. Yeah, better. somewhat. Better. Fair enough. I, I agree with you. I mean, I, yeah, as I say, I preface this by, I preface this, and I, because I'm, I'm, you know, my thinking and my encouragement is being, look, bring it on in my ward where there's a lot of high ridership, but I recognize that does not serve any of you, and that you have a right to be safe as well, and I think that's the message that you've delivered loud and clear today. Correct? You just want a, you want a space where you as citizens of this city that pay their taxes can have the rights that are already yours, but are not being accorded to you by current 
by current practice and driving practice, correct? Correct. Great, thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nickel. Well, I'm going to read a couple of letters here, and I'd like um, Mr. Chan and Mr. Dun uh, Dunwald uh, to speak to them. And uh, I'll let these letters speak for themselves, and I'll give you three examples. Councillor Henderson has spoken about certain rights that need to be ensured, but uh, these letters go towards certain rights that are being taken away because of the bike lane infrastructure. So, first of all, this is from one constituent. The bike population is maybe 5% of the population, yet the city's pouring millions of dollars into this. This money should be spent on fixing roads for others, 90, uh, for the other 95% of the people driving on them. Uh, this is not a need, and if his safety is an issue, then it would make more sense to widen sidewalks and make them shared use. I have another letter here from another constituent. I'm 97 years old and a retired physician. My wife and I are both handicapped and in wheelchairs. We are longtime members of our, I'll leave the church out, on 76th Ave. Most disturbing to us was the recent news that the city of Edmonton was planning to ban parking on 76th Ave for a bike lane. Please know that this would result in a severe hardship for not only my wife and I, but for several other members of the parish who are handicapped like us. During the winter months when the snow is heavy, we can hardly park on 76 Ave. To ban parking would create great challenges to, great, uh, to, uh, to those of us facing health issues. And then thirdly, I have another one here about a business that's on 97th Street. And he, literally the quote from the business owner, the minute the bike lane was installed, my Noonard business dropped by 30%, costing me thousands of dollars in revenue. Phoned the city planner who implemented the plan, and quote, he said to me, it looked good on paper. So I'd like uh, maybe your response to, to these concerns, and maybe we can start with Mr. Chan, and then maybe go to Mr. Dunwall. There's quite a few misconceptions uh, in some of those letters. Some of the points certainly will be valid. But uh, for instance, uh, if 5% of people are using those bike lanes uh, and the city is spending millions of dollars on them, then the city isn't spending enough because those 5% of people are paying much more in taxes than they're getting out of it. Um, as far as widening sidewalks and turning them into multi-use trails, that's just not practical or safe in many areas of the city, uh, the, the vast majority, because of all the intersections and driveways and everything else. Where it can be done, absolutely, um, but uh, it's, it's just not a realistic way to get around the city uh, safely for uh, bike, as bike infrastructure goes in a lot of cases. Um, parking on 76th Ave, the city did extensive parking surveys and studies, including Sunday mornings and, and church times on 76th Ave to, and counting how many par parking spaces there were as well as how many cars were actually using them. Um, and so they looked at all of that and, and, and made sure that parking would be accommodated. Um, and Mr. Certainly. Chan, that did not happen. I, 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 I've door knocked that street several times. So that just, whether you're under one perception, I'm under another. So I'm afraid that just didn't happen. So I'm sorry, I have to disagree with that statement. Well, administration can, can provide you with and those. We'll, and I will ask the administration numbers. on that. So. And, the, and the third issue with regards to the business on 97th Street with loss of revenue. Um. Because nowhere in your statement, Mr. Chan, and this is what I'm asking you about, you talk about lifestyle choices. But all, every time we make a lifestyle choice, we all also have to consider economic impacts, do we not? And yes. In very many, yeah, in so. Toronto, Montreal, Portland, New York City, uh, building good bike infrastructure has been good for businesses uh, in those immediate vicinities. So it's difficult to, to look at, to take one example and, 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 and um, hold that up as... Mr. Dun Dunwald, I'm, I'm almost down out of my time. Infrastructure. So. Well, uh, I'll, I'll go back to there. There's in, in testing these things out. There's there's two distinct, um, I guess, uh, flows of thought. One is is safety and efficacy. Uh, we hear, oh, these things are going to improve the safety, blah blah blah. But when you come down and you see the data that's coming out of administration, it all relates to behavior modification. 
Stan Such, who was the past president of Nate, stood up at a meeting, and I think Don Iveson uh, attended that meeting, and asked administration, look, after you've heard all these criticisms, are you willing to say you've made a mistake? Administration's response is, this is about behavior modification. Now, it's not about modifying the behavior of the cyclists. It's about modifying the behavior of every other member of the community, the residents, the businesses, the schools. They all have to change for the cyclists. And in the entire plan, let me just give you a couple of instances. There is no change in behavior for the cyclist. The very, very minimal things such as, well, if you are on a road which requires a license, should you not be required to have ID in case you have an accident or, or something like that? No behavior change on the cyclist. There's, there's no, no age what? restrictions. Time, time is running out. Okay, there's no age those. restrictions. There's no need for proper equipment. There's no need for proper insurance. There's no need for proper attire. There's no need for proper uh, regulations in the behavior while you're in the lane. So it's all changing the behavior of other people. Thank you, Mr. Walt. Uh, Councillor Oshry. Uh, Mr. Chan, did you discuss with administration the strategy for bike lanes in sort of more of the out outlying areas of the city, or was it only focusing on the core downtown south side? Um, are you talking about in previous years or? Ever. Uh, certainly we. Recently, let's say recently, last couple. Yeah, I mean, we've been, we've always discussed with administration on all of the, all of the bike plans. And, and, and what do you think of the bike lanes outside of the core and their effectiveness and use? Uh, it's all part of a of a network, and how you prioritize that, um, as as Councillor Walters is, has indicated, um, maybe we should be focusing on the core first. Um, but there is great value in having those networks that reach out, so that all the people that don't live in the core can still get there. You used a number of ten percent of the population commuting. Is that what I was? Is that what you referred to? No, uh, in the city's survey of, of confidence levels of cyclists, you have like the, the one to two percent fearless cyclists. Then you have the confident cyclists, about 10 percent, who are okay with those painted bike lanes. So, so I read in the Waze plans, and I, I'm not 100 percent sure my number is right, but that was two percent of the population is consider themselves cyclists. Is that yeah, what and that would be uh, that would be one to two percent of, of mode share of, okay. of trips, and that would be. Uh, Many of them are the, the fearless, but also that includes the, the confident uh, cyclists as well. Okay, so um, I'm going to switch to uh, um, Ms. Derry. You're sitting there nice and quietly. I've got a question for you. Um, so really, from your perspective, uh, as from, from the non-commuter non cyclist perspective, I'll say, um, you know, do you think the cities strategically, have we looked at this properly? I mean, I look, from my perspective, I look at it as, you know, the commu there's bicycle commuters, and then there's families. And I don't see a lot of families using bike lanes. Um, I, it, it seems to me that they're geared predominantly for the, for the commuters. And so, as somebody who, I think you're, and correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying that you use it more from a recreational standpoint, um, and maybe commuting to your, to your, to your, uh, to the school, but um, can you, can you, can you give me an opinion about that, whether you think they're effective, or is it strictly, um, only. Well, I certainly think of myself as both a family bike commuter, a bike cyclist, and uh, and I do commute to work about 40 kilometers back and forth. Um, so, yeah, I see people. Uh, I mean, my family, my kids, and I sometimes bike together on some of the bike routes uh, heading across on 40 Ave. Uh, I I think that sometimes you see. Family. I mean, if you're thinking of families as young kids and the families all going out together, uh, you know, families don't necessarily want clusters of kids on, you know, on one of the bike lanes. So they might be more inclined to uh, to keep them on a uh, on more sort of quiet residential, uh, less traveled roads. But uh, I've certainly seen people bicycling with kids in bike trailers and uh, and younger kids commuting along uh, 106th Street and 40 Ave, and as well as the multi-use trails. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm just, I'm not sure that we have a, the right strategy, not the right, I'm not sure if we have a, have a overall strategy as to whether, what these are for. And I'm not sure we do a good enough job on the family side, but um, secondary. So um, let me ask a question for the panel, and this is gonna be very facetious. I'm trying to make a point here. Are you aware that it's winter here for six months of the year? Are you aware that I saw several cyclists today, yesterday, yeah. throughout the week? Yeah, are you aware that there was probably hundreds of thousands of cars on the roads? At the Are same you aware time. that I walk to work every day? Yeah, no, that's fine. So, um, <laughs> so what my point is, what my point is, is you know, there's lots of there's lots of bike paths that are covered by snow all winter uh, that don't get used, and so I'm not sure. I mean, maybe this is a question better for administration whether we should be even having a seasonal bike path on some of these made ar arteries, and, and and maybe the the answer is to say from this month to the, this month it's a bike lane, this month to this month, no one's going to use it as a bike lane, so maybe we need to. Uh, Deal with it as more of a of a of a of a car, yeah, car. I think it's plastic. fair also to note that uh, a big chunk of the roads just don't get used for six months of the year because they're covered in the windrows yeah. of snow. So shall we shut down some of the parking lots and parking spots that aren't being used right now uh, at after six p.m. because oh, um, yeah. they're not being used. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's that's not what it, that's not what my point was. My question was <laughs> many of the bike lanes don't get used because they're covered in snow. No, I know that's exactly my point. And so, whether they're covered in snow, or, I mean, on a day like today, when they maybe they're not covered by snow, but it's minus thirty, I don't see a lot of people on the bike lanes. I would have biked to work today if I. I I'm not talking. I'm, I'm not talking about a, a, a vocal, passionate minority, which which I get. Time is out. Okay. Uh, if time, time is out. Oh, okay. Councillor McKean. Thank you very much, and I, I guess uh, Mr. Chan and Mr. Dunwald, I guess I'll both get you to comment, please. We are, it seems to me we're looking, uh, the focus of a lot of the questions today are about today. And um, city councils, I, I believe, are duty bound to be looking 10, 20, 30, 50 years ahead. Um, we know that we're undergoing tremendous population growth and, I, and we're hoping to get some stats back soon on not just traffic congestion today, but in coming years. So, Mr. Chan, Mr. Dunwald, is it prudent for us, knowing uh, population growth, maybe knowing the, um, the even the uh, threat of rising gas prices and peak oil, that we look at these, that we be planning now for uh, shifts to other forms of transportation and, and maybe it, uh, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Mr. Chan, I'll start with you. Uh, it's absolutely necessary for Edmonton to maintain its, its road system as a functional network for cars, especially uh, to, to look at increasing the mode split for walking, transit and cycling and building for that. Well, uh, to be clear, um, what we were talking about is dedicated on-street cycling corridors. Um, people are not saying that we shouldn't cycle in our society, and we're, we're saying that we, we, we do want to provide choice, and we just wanted to do it in a smart way. And I don't think that what we did in the last three-year trial was a particularly smart way. Uh, on the Saddleback route, um, from numbers that we have, and I extrapolated over the three-year period, uh, you would have had in the order of 20,000 single-user uh, rides on bicycles on that group of roads. But for um, the passengers that have to use that road in automobile, automotive vehicles, it would be about 3 million. So you're talking, um, you know, a factor of 100 Time. So you're, you're inconveniencing 100 people for every one passenger ride on the bicycle. Yeah, okay. I, I, no, and I understand that, and, and I appreciate that, and, and that we may have done, made some big mistakes. The way we implemented this is, is completely possible. Uh, a number of us weren't around and didn't see all that. But I guess by uh, – so it, given that, we want a strong economy. We don't want our roads congested, and, and if we get serious road congestion, we're going to affect the economy, because you know, uh, movement of labor, movement of goods. 
given that, it seems to me that we're duty bound to look at this, and, and I don't think we're talking about implementing bike lane, a bike lane network around the city um, in the next couple of years. But it also seems to me that we're duty bound to start doing this. Would you agree with that? I, I think that you know the overall regional transportation plan is very important. I think Mayor Iverson spoke to the importance of, of integrating that regionally. But you also have to understand if you if you wish to uh, compare us to Portland or New York, or, et cetera, this city I think has. 45% of the population involved in construction, fabrication. They go to NISCU, they go to Sturgeon County, all the major... Well, we're probably not talking about those people. We're talking sort of about commuters, and if we could get a certain percentage on the bikes, it's probably good. I don't even mean from individuals or health care, which I think are sort of... Those are, those are great for the individual, but we're all, I'm talking more about collectively as a city. Is it not prudent for us to be to try to get fewer people commuting by car yes. and and what i was getting at is we've advocated for improving the bi bicycle infrastructure for example along the 23rd avenue corridor to tie the west and the east end of the city all the recreation centers the lrt all together and to me that makes a lot of sense but i think when you analyze the city uh we're talking about cities where people go from the suburbs and commute downtown in edmonton that's not the case you know, yeah, so, absolutely. It's, so, it's complex. So we for have to think a little bit differently and think a little bit out of the box as to, okay, yes, if, if we have cyclist needs over by the university, that's fine. Uh, but are, are we going to, you know, Edmonton's going to expropriate that land or incorporate that land out to NISCU? That's going to be a large industrial area out there. Are, are we going to provide... Infrastructure that way. Thank you. My time Thank is up. I had one more question, but I ran. Mayor Avison. Uh, Mr. Chan, I uh, earlier you mentioned that you thought there were three evaluation criteria that were important for us to bear in mind: safety, capacity, and viability of alternatives. In thinking about what we do next, can you elaborate a little bit on on each one of those? Sure. So, uh, I mean. I Safety is a fairly obvious one. If um, bike lanes have been shown to inc increase safety, even these less than ideal uh, forms of, of just the painted lines do increase safety. Uh, if, if we look at the traffic data and find that they're not doing that and that they're having a negative effect, certainly uh, that's cause for immediate reevaluation. Um, design capacity is a really important one because if we're talking about what is the effect of bike lanes on traffic flow, um, then we have to know what is the acceptable impact of bike lanes on traffic flow because it's possible that they may have none, none, but we can expect that maybe there will be some impact on traffic volume and speed. And so this touches a bit on the trade-offs yeah. that you run into with this, with this kind of change to the roadway configuration. Yeah, and okay. so there may be something that we have to accept and have to accept that trade-off. And then alternatives are looking at um, routes that still make sense. You know, within, you're not asking a cyclist to do an extra kilometer just to find a safe route. Uh, and the, that also makes sense from a cost perspective and, and finding that right balance. And I think that, that um, there's a common thread between the safety and the viability of the alternatives. Um, one and also the the impact on the rest of the road which is that there's um you can design for the users who are already there to make it safer for that 10 percent and then the other question we're kind of talking about is how do we actually break out beyond that to make cycling a viable choice for not 100 percent of the people maybe not uh getting to the welding shop but maybe on the weekend the, the welder might want to take his family to the movies on uh, on a bike path if that made sense um, so how do you so there's that one question about how do you break out past that 10 percent and I think most of the most of the data that I've seen and I'd be curious for your thoughts on this and mr. Darnell maybe is that the painted lanes don't really help you break out past the 10 percent very well that you need a more a more separated um, kind of facility or or some buffering from traffic in order to get into that other 90 percent essentially the the casual and family riders is that fair 
Yeah, the more separated you are from traffic, the more comfortable it's going to be, and the more attractive it will be for those those uh, that wider demographic. But that takes up potentially more road space. It's and it's going to be more costly. It takes more road space and it costs more money. So these are these are all of the trade offs we're trying to balance, and and I think we tried to balance in the last few years of implementation. We've tried to inconvenience as few people as possible, and we've tried to to tried to make the dollars go as far as possible. Um, as they to say that we cheaped out on it because I don't think that was the intent but but really the resources were quite limited and so the balance tipped towards you know trying to get that 10% to move um, a little more safely and a little more defined space on the road at not great expense and I think Councillor Walters was kind of trying to ask you if you what you thought the motivation was and I'm going to suggest to you that I think the motivation was was to try to inconvenience as few people as possible and try to cost the least amount as possible. Do you think that's really going to help us, if that's our continued approach, do you think that's really going to help us break into a broader shift that our transportation master plan calls for and that at a high level the bicycle transportation plan calls for? I think to really make that shift happen we're going to have to start building the high, higher uh, level of service infrastructure, those separated with that higher degree of separation. I, I think the kinds of lanes we have now form a critical part of the, the wider network uh, and there will always be a place for that uh, but uh, and it again depends on the specific road context but certainly to, to make that shift happen we're going to have to focus more on, on the higher level service. And we're going to have to be comfortable then with the fact that that may have some higher design implications on uh, the roadway that gets reconfigured potentially and that that may have some higher cost. Absolutely. And as taxpayers, we know where uh, um, Mr. Dunwald stands, but the other four of you are okay with that. Okay. Well, so Please. am I. Please. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Well, we're getting close to, uh, to lunchtime, and uh, uh, I just want to have a few questions. Uh, I haven't asked any, I haven't asked any questions. I've been very generous with you as chair, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, the uh, Mr. Uh, Dunwald, uh, bike lanes are not unique to our city. They are in every major urban center. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you have seen them in other cities. So how do our bike lanes differ from uh, other cities? Well, I, I think, um, you know, every, every road, every uh, thing that you install, you have a City of Edmonton branded bicycle lane in a particular area that's intended to find a particular use. Um, so in our area, we're saying that the dedicated on-street bicycle paths were not successful. But how, how are they different than other cities? Say Calgary, Vancouver, how are they different? I don't know. I was reading the other day that in Toronto, down Bloor Street, they're spending $250,000 to remove the bicycle lanes. Okay. Uh, uh, but I will say in Edmonton, uh, you know, the observations from Councillor Walter's report was that the ETS drivers are almost unanimous, uh, that these are very complicated things to deal with. Uh, they've created a lot of safety issues. The safety issues, and again, we keep going back to the safety of the cyclist and a very, very narrow focus on the safety of the cyclist. However, that cycling corridor is there 12 months a year, 24 hours a day, even when there are not cyclists. Thank you, Mr. Anwar. I, I, I have other questions. Okay. Uh, Mr. Darno, on the, you mentioned something that the, the, the design of the infrastructure is very critical. How is it designed? Uh, 106th Street, for example, it's, uh, it's not consistently designed. You have parking some places, there's parking banned in some places, where so uh, you know, dedicated lane, then turned into shadow. So that lack of consistency, uh, and uh, and that creates challenges for the uh, operation of the um, of the transit system as well. Because you know you, you're you're expected to behave differently at, at different sections of under 60 Street. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Well, uh, uh, I I think the the research provides a, a general lesson, which is that you can make a difference, uh, a substantial difference. 
uh, with this infrastructure development on both participation in cycling and safety. And that would be safe safety for drivers as well as for cyclists, yeah. although cyclists are generally the ones who bear the the brunt of the injury problem. Yeah. Uh, and that's and pedestrians, and that's why they tend to be counted, I think, a little bit more highly. I, I, I'm not really qualified to comment about the design decision specifically on 106th Street, okay. but I think you've got good people working on it in the okay. administration. Uh, Mr. Chan, on the... Uh uh, I ag agree that we need to have a, a straight east-west, north-south, uh, good connections. Uh, but we also have done some areas where the bike lanes go in circles, you know, and uh, and uh, very uh, low use on uh, on those. So if we were to focus, I think we are kind of agreeing into a into an un, unsigned social contract with, uh, with the cycling community that we will focus on, uh, on high corridor, high use corridors, and we won't focus on, uh, on low use corridors, but those, those are going to cost more, right? And uh, the, the, when the decision comes at capital budget, right, I think we need to be aware of that. You know, if we're going to be focusing on 83rd, if we're going to be focusing on 102nd, uh, and not focus on other parts of the city. Then decision is we we can, we kind of kind of make that kind of a, uh, a commitment to uh, put that kind of money into it. The the lower use court uh, sections are are still part of the bike network. You can see on the yeah, they are. Uh, yeah. on the map, um, and and so uh, we've built quite a lot of that now already, and and that's really good. Um, and and now yeah, uh, at the expense of building more building more of that, we're satisfied with that trade-off to focus now on those okay. those higher quality core areas. Okay, and uh, all right, uh, well, we are at 12, but we have to move. Uh, ask, ask the question of the we, next five speakers. Can, can we extend the order of the day for 30 seconds? It'll be, I just, it, it was begged by, the, by Councillor Oshry's line of question. Mr. Karen Gesser, my question to you is, if we had told you right now that you had to have a car in order to live in this city, which is essentially what we're pretty close to, would you have moved here? Absolutely not, and um, I'd, I'd submit to you that that's why I do the work I do with my project. I'm trying to push back against car culture, make your city more livable for people like me and the millions okay. of others that are gonna come here, so but thank Anyways, you. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, another item at uh, 1.30, and we would have to go to that item before we come back uh, to the second panel. So I hope you are able to. Yes. No? Uh, it's 1.30 item. You're time correct, specific. Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair. It is a 1.30 time specific item. Um, can we? You would have to go to this unless you decided to make another motion again. Oh, I see. Okay. Then we'll come back to this, uh, this item at 1.30. And un unfortunately, the 1.30 item related to the uh, Religious assembly parking uh, will not be dealt at 1.30. It'll be a little later on after that. Okay. Thank you.
north, south, and east, west of uh, the river there. Um, yes, no, no disagreement. Great. Thanks. That was my question. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Anderson? Uh, Mr. Kinney and Mr. Crotty, and I'm not eliminating the others, I'm focusing on you two because you've been involved in meetings that discuss a variety of things pertaining to uh, active transportation. Um, if I wanted for future active transportation planning to ask administration to focus on shared use trails where it made sense as opposed to an on-road lane. I'm sure you have heard because I have that a commuter on a shared use trail when he comes to an intersection and decides he wants to continue at 31 kilometers an hour off the trail across the road and onto a trail again runs the risk of being wiped out by somebody turning right. In uncontrolled intersections, we expect pedestrians to stop looking, listen, or point, pause, and proceed. We expect cars to slow down and turn in safety, look, et cetera, et cetera. Is the intersection concern on a shared or multi-use trail sufficient to not use those where they geographically make sense? Is that a sufficient reason not to focus on that as the solution for the act of transportation? Um, for I myself, I and on with the TPRAC committee, I would say that a protected or separated cycle track for active transportation, while always preferred, definitely comes up with some of those issues where you may run into intersection crossings and that, where, and that, that's where some of that education or perhaps enforcement comes in. We'll see quite often there may be cyclists who, instead of stepping off their bicycle and walking it across the street and then continuing cycling along that path. Or slow down and ride it across. <laughs> correct. They, but they may not do that. They may continue riding across. I hear, I hear you. And I think that in a case like that, I would have to look at see what research has been done in similar areas. So if we had areas that can be considered for that area versus non-street path, we would need to look for information on similar intersection with traffic flow where that has been tried to look at statistics for there and what any issues or successes have been. Thank you for that answer. I mean, the, the, place, the kind of places I'm thinking about is 34th Avenue, for example, between Gateway, or Cape, uh, Gateway Boulevard or Calgary Trail and 119th or 122nd Street. I mean, that's 17 blocks and there's two intersections. The shared use trail makes eminent sense. The guy gets to ride as fast as he can for five, has to slow down, look after himself, cross 114th Street and continue for another five blocks. And my question was, is it a sufficient reason not to investigate the use of shared use trails for cycling active transportation? Uh, shared use trails are great. They're very popular. Uh, they, you do run into conflicts between cyclists and pedestrians and dogs and et cetera, et cetera. They are not a panacea. Giving cyclists uh, purpose-built infrastructure is going to get, obviously remove that conflict. And active, or these, those trails are quite expensive probably just as expensive as the on-street cycling infrastructure is as well, so. Yeah, just a, a, a last comment. Every, every new road widening requires a sidewalk on one side and a shared juice trail on the other, so they're going in anyhow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, to all of you for being here. We are done with... Uh, with the questions, so if you could step back, we're going to go back to administration for questions. I just want to get a sense from, uh, from the committee. Uh, we have other items on the agenda, and, uh, and there's a possible motion related to this item. So should we put the motion uh, on the table first uh, to talk about it and at least people understand what the motion is? Or we want to go to questions first and then wait for the motion to be on the table? Right 
So if we could, uh, uh, Councilor Walters, you, you're making that motion, right? So. Okay. So I'll move that the administration provide a report to Transportation Committee by the end of June 2014 outlining the following information. A proposed 2014 to 18 implementation plan for new bike lane infrastructure including recommendations for an enhanced public engagement strategy and recommendations for enhanced public education programs. Number two, an assessment of the selected routes, 106th Street, uh, 40th Avenue, and 95th Avenue that provide options to better meet the needs of both neighborhoods and cyclists, including A, recommendations and costs for alternative routes, including consideration of external factors such as scheduled neighborhood renewal, B, recommendations to address safety and operational concerns for both motorists and cyclists. Number three, an assessment of other routes uh, in the city that have been underused, including recommendations and costs for improved routes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Avison. Well, just to just to double check the motion <clears throat> against what administration had had offered in the report. Um, your, if I read the report correctly, you're putting a pause on. The, develop, the expansion of the network this year so that you can do some work on public engagement and education and some planning work for uh, some of the higher value, um, higher need facilities that, that we've talked about, say, on 83rd Avenue and 102nd Avenue. That's correct. That's, that's, that's your position in the report. So um, you would you probably need to come back. And actually, I think there was a report um, last year at some point where we saw a, a prioritization approach to that effect. So um, so if you brought that back and maybe fleshed it out a little more, that, that would address point one in the motion. That's correct. And so we'll some of that, that. So, so the good news is some of that work has happened and you could bring us back some more. Uh, in a, uh, would you be able to do that in this timeline? We could bring that part back in, within this timeline, yes. Okay. I. I uh, and I, so I think that keeps us moving, and that addresses the, what I think is a consensus that there's, we want to keep building uh, some infrastructure uh, in a reasonable period of time, and that we may want to focus our efforts um, in the higher need areas, and then we may want to actually put in some, some higher quality separated buffered facilities in order to show that, that, in order to see how they work, and hopefully show that that's successful, and then maybe build from there. Um, the assessment of the selected routes um, that, that I think it's good to ask for. I think it's, it's fair to say there's work to do to evaluate um, how these are actually working. Uh, there, members of the public have raised safety questions. I think it's important for the technical experts to have the opportunity to see how they perform for a period of time. And if there's, if there's an imminent safety issue, obviously you would intervene, but if uh, but if you, there isn't an imminent safety issue, then to have some time, but then also to report back more formally on the findings of that assessment, I think makes sense. Um, the, only, the only question I would have is whether that might take more time than June 2014. That will certainly take more time than the end of June, yes. Okay. Well, that's a consideration for, for Councillor Walters, that the part two to do it properly might actually take some more time. And... Uh, and number three might take some more time as well. So I guess, I guess to the mover then, the question would be, um, I think analysis and, and reporting is good, but, but we might want to think about the timing. So we could, um, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yeah, well, I'm asking you for your... Yeah, so there's, there's, part, so there's a couple ways to look at it. One is you can answer the question, how much more time to the number two and number three for me, please. I believe we could return with a report uh, later in the fall after so, having a summer season to evaluate. End of September? And end of September, I, I would suggest, would be appropriate, yes. Okay. So I appreciate that it will take time, and I, I could separate those two, those two. So the first one would be if within the July, the June time frame. If that's friendly. I don't, I don't know how I'm doing on time because the, the lights... It's friendly. It's friendly to me. Okay. And then the, um, the, the one maybe disconnected in, in point two there 
is it asks for options, which I think are fine for us to consider, but then in part two it asks for recommendations for alternative routes. So I guess either we're looking I at I think options, options is a better, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, yeah yes. I think it's just consistent with what's above there. And it doesn't put administration in a difficult circumstance um, of having to read where we want to go. I think council's got to give some direction on that based on some analysis and based on some options. So, so overall, then, I think uh, with those changes, the motion's taken us in the right direction. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilor Esslinger. Thank you, and uh, certainly support uh, looking at an implementation plan and certainly enhanced public engagement strategy because I think we've heard that you've had some learnings for that. Um, Councilor Walters, I, I guess I was just trying to understand what is the enhanced public education programs? Were they programs about bike lanes or are they programs to educate the public about cyclists? Well, I would hope that they're both. I think that this is uh, a relationship between the world as, as we know today, which is card dominant and will remain so for uh, a long time, uh, and people who choose to uh, cycle and will make the choice to cycle. I think that one of the things that is clearly lacking when I, on a daily basis, see people driving upon the lanes on 40th Ave, thinking that the buffers uh, that were put in place are actually the point at which they can cross into the lane, uh, completely missing the point of why it's there uh, is another reason for proper education. Thank you, and I would agree. I just want to make sure we did capture both of those aspects, because I agree. We've heard that today through many of the speakers, as well as what we've witnessed, that we really need to not only educate our public how to work with them, but even for cyclists, when they should get off and walk across the crosswalk. So thank you. I would support that. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Councillor Walters? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, so one of the, the primary questions I have is, uh, and I think it, you know, it's par partially been addressed by what you said earlier. Uh, at the beginning of the report, it talks about the public involvement uh, under 2013 bike route installations. It talks about public involvement uh, considered the route locations as set in the bicycle transportation plan strategy plan. So that means you went to the communities and the lanes were set. The routes through the neighborhoods were set. And now, so and there, those weren't going to be changed. You could, people could have a say on, you know, some of the ancillary uh, items around the lane, but not on the route itself. So what I heard you say earlier is that for future installation, there's, the community will have more say potentially in the route through their neighborhood, which maintains the connectivity of the network. Yeah, we'll okay. definitely have to have a conversation about alternative routes through the community mm -hmm. and the route in the end uh, may not be what was in the bike plan. Oh, oh sorry, no, carry, carry. Oh, so the route that we may end up um, going with when we go to construction may not be the route that's currently in the bicycle transportation plan. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important uh, move forward concession for us because I think part of the you know challenge and tension underneath this all is people felt like there was a group of people that well the, ma the the transportation master plan or the bicycle master plan had a lot of people involved in designing those routes from a, a high level the local knowledge that uh, exists in communities wasn't really you know wasn't respected and I think that asking a community not whether they support a bike network or not, which that decision has been made as, as a previous council. I don't see any appetite to change that, but asking how their neighborhood contributes to the connectivity of the network is essential. So I, that's what I'm hearing you support and, and what your department now thinks. Is that fair, Audra? That is correct. Okay, so I think that's a, a very positive step in terms of really uh, honoring what communities have to say. Um, can you, uh, one of the other questions I had around, and I raised this earlier around the buses uh, and talking to transit drivers around, were transit drivers directly consulted on the placement and the locations of the, of the routes? Or was it more of a planner to planner? It was more of a planner to planner, so we certainly work with Edmonton Transit to review the routes and the designs of the routes. 
I'll be honest, uh, the feedback that I've heard from you uh, based on what you heard from the transit operators is the first that I've heard of uh, concerns being expressed by the operators themselves, and we certainly need to look into that. Yeah, well, I would encourage you because they were pretty passionate in their conversations with me about that. So, um, okay, I think I'm good for now. That's fine, thanks. Councillor Anderson. My one question of the speakers referred to the potential to use shared use paths instead of on road cycle lanes where it made linear or geographic sense. Um, Mayor Iveson suggested that if that was going to end up being a direction that it would take some changes in the bicycle, the sidewalk, and active transportation plans. Would it be possible as either a subsequent motion or as a part four here to have some information come back supporting or opposing that idea and perhaps indicating what might have to adjust to have that become a plank in the active transportation platform. Uh, we, we could certainly bring it back as uh, item number four with this motion. We do also have an outstanding uh, report to Council that is uh, in response to a motion raised by Councillor Gibbons, which was looking at shared use paths in utility corridors and on other rights of way, and we could certainly address it in that uh, report as well. So it's uh, really up to you whether you want it included as part of this motion or that other subsequent report. The Gibbons report is coming back? It will be coming back. Right now we don't have a determined due date on that. And will it, will it address my question? What are the possibilities? What are the pros and cons of doing that where possible? That was the intent of that report as well. So it would be part of that. As part of the active or bicycle plan? Yes, yeah. The, bi the bicycle transportation plan looks at a range of facilities, and shared use paths are certainly considered as uh, one of the facilities that we employ where it makes sense to do so. And we have been doing that, but we can certainly elaborate on that for council and indicate where we feel those types of facilities So are the most Gibbons motion report will handle my inquiry. I, I can ensure that it does handle your inquiry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. I feel bad for your three ladies. Um, I'm going to be honest about this. I was hoping to see somebody else here from senior management, to be quite honest, to answer some of these issues. Dorian's right there. But he's only been, and let me finish, he's only been here five months. I asked him when he started, signed up to the City of Edmonton, it's been five months. And I know he's the general manager, but in all fairness, because of the holds that I've seen in the public consultation uh, process here, is, uh, well, it, it, somebody has to talk about the elephant in the room, and I guess, I guess it will be me. But the first question goes to the mover of the motion. Uh, does your motion address... Um, the removal of ex existing routes, is that a consideration under this, um, under this motion? It was never about removal of the routes, it was about changing the routes. So the qu even of, when I alluded earlier to the 100 to 1, much of that 100 is not against the bike plan and, and not against bike routes. It was about the fact that they had no say and the replacement of the routes, and that those routes are not working for them. And they have a myriad of concerns about those routes. So the way that the motion, the reason I drafted the motion this way and brought it to the, to the committee this way was because I wanted to give the communities of Ward 10 and other communities um, the options to have more of a voice in how their community contributed to the connectivity of the network, which is not at dispute. Hey, Councillor Walters, you're going to have to help me a little bit with this. I'll ask you another question then. So what you're saying is, is that this motion does not address the uh, existing routes that, let's talk about 76th Ave or 97th Street, in my ward, uh, that I've had a very clear understanding from my constituents, they want them removed. If that is not part of this motion here... Uh, Number three would 
I would assume that the third part, this is not about 76 staff because that's a second. There's a different uh, motion around that and a report that's coming back on that, I think, to a, the next Transportation Committee. So, so you can, it's your choice to ask about that, but then the 197th would fit into the part three of the motion in terms of a, an assessment and options for different routes. Sorry, I just think I think that answers is just a simple yes or no. Yes, yes, there will be discussion about yes. Removal. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think it's uh, hard for Councillor Walter to assume that because it's the understanding of the administration. Okay, whether let's flip it back to yeah. administration. Councillor Nichol, the, the point uh, that we're saying is that we need to take a look at these routes. Let's look at let's look and learn and see what has been done, what's working well, assess it based on criteria, and, and bring that learning back so that we can use that learning to move forward. Okay. I live on 76th Ave. Let's just be blunt about this. I don't want the bike, I don't want the bike lane there for a whole pile of reasons, right? So when do, uh, because they feel, I have letters here, I have quite a few letters here saying for the reasons why and so on. And will I be able to go back to my constituent, right, and constituents along 76th Ave and say, yes, there will be a chance to have this bike lane removed if we put, if, and I'll be coming back to council for consideration? Councillor, I think the first place to start is let's take a look at um, an evaluation and assessment and, and how are the bike lanes working? So we use some examples, get some statistics, uh, some observations, that kind of thing that we first of all need to set out um, a, an assessment, how we go about set criteria so that it is an objective, bring that back so that it can be reviewed, and then how does that apply to specific routes or not? Okay. So, Nicole, just I know it's I know I'm using 76 as an example, but we already have an existing bike lane on 97th Street that's causing considerable problems. So I'm kind of using them interchangeably. So I understand 76 Ave is uh, with the motion that you've had that's floating out there with a the report. Yes, so I'm yeah, it's been postponed. So uh, in the minds of many of my constituents, it's a foregone conclusion. So I'm trying to draw out, and I'm speaking on behalf of my constituents, that that, that that gets addressed because it has caused considerable consternation. Now, let's, let's go to the public consultation side of this, this whole, um, well, this whole enterprise. And well, it says, you know, on one side of the page, it says considerable consultation has been done. On the second side of the page, well, it says that uh, we didn't attain the local, uh, the local area knowledge uh, until the design is initiated and implemented and so on. So how can you say on one page that it was done properly and on the second page it wasn't done properly because we didn't, uh, we didn't, we didn't get the local knowledge? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing with pu uh, public consultation with the affected groups? So um, we had a, we've always had some fairly extensive participation in our consultation processes, and we've heard a lot of information that helps us make decisions. Um, into the the spot of the report where we're talking about um, the local knowledge that was missing, that was a learning we had from the first time we did this in 2010 when we did not do any consultation, and there was a little bit of a disagreement with that and we um, went through a process and, and found out that we were wrong. So, I'd like a second round when you get an opportunity. No problem, thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Well, just to put a little bit of history in that because I lived some of that. Um, and and in, you know, when, you, when you talk about that example, I mean, that it was really the discussion around the, the piece of 76 Avenue in, in Ward 8 and Ward 10 and what was then, I think, Ward 5. Um, and, uh, and 106 Street the same. And, and we knew the routes were going to go in there, and the community said quite justifiably, okay, we know the routes are going to go here, yeah. um, but there's other information we can bring to the table that, uh, that would help us make it a better way of going through. Rather than us going in and saying, this is what it's going to look like, here's what the engineering says it's been, they wanted to have input in the how, not the where, correct? That's correct. And much to our great surprise at that session, I was at those sessions, there was some real learning from that. And the community did have some really good information, not on the where question, but on the how question. Absolutely. 
The where question was part of a, just to be clear, was whether or not we need to go back and do the where question again, I think is another discussion, but it was part of a very extensive consultation, but it happened six, five, six years ago. Yes. And it went on for like a couple of years, is my memory. Um, and it came here and people came and spoke in favor of it, but maybe, maybe what didn't happen on that is the people that were gonna care about the where question didn't realize in some ways that what the implications were gonna be for them and as a result, we're not part of it. That may be what we have to go back and re-examine. But in terms of clarity going into the public engagement process, you guys went in and said, we're not, we don't have the ability to talk about the where question because that's already been passed by council. We're here to talk about the how question. And that's, that's the bit where the learning happened and that's what happened last year and then it got pushed back to the where question, correct? This is correct. Yeah, okay. Um, my, um, the, one, the one question I have too, so that we don't end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater on this, is that I know even in the core area, and, I, and I, you know, I'm being a little bit selfish here because I recognize the issue is different, and I would say on the 76th Avenue piece, and I know we've had that in place for two or three years now in my area, and we actually have numbers that show, I, my understanding is we've seen a 30% increase in use based on that. That's our most recent numbers? Roughly 30%. Yeah, so that's two or three years into something that was contentious at the time and a lot of the same issues came up, but it's also slowed the traffic down in areas where we'd had complaints about traffic as well. So there have been other benefits. Not everybody's happy about that, but in actual fact for the people living along the street, it has had some benefits, correct? And that's also part of what we're now, now understanding now that we've lived with it for two or three years. We, we certainly do look at opportunities to address other traffic issues like speeding traffic when okay. we're putting in the bike. So the my way. simple question is, I know in the area that, you know, that I represent, hopefully, and I think it's gonna happen, we're gonna be doing some neighborhood rebuilds in this period 2014 to 18. And I would hate to think that we weren't gonna continue with the opportunistic ability to be able to improve the infrastructure as part of that process. Our, our intent going forward is still to collaborate with neighborhood renewal and, right. and I just, arterial collector renewals. If all, we're, if all we're doing, if all we do for the next four years is, is 83rd Avenue, which is a high priority and I think is a chance to do better infrastructure and 102nd Avenue, we're gonna miss some opportunities in some high use areas. Where we've proactively done some, some, some not great infrastructure right now so that people can get used to it so we can put in the better infrastructure when we rebuild. That was Belgravia 115th, which is a fairly heavily um, the, the, the 100th Avenue piece in, in Old Strathcona, those are all pieces that are rubble right now, so they're not terribly useful. We put the shallows over the rubble, but that's anticipating what's gonna come next, correct? That we'll have a chance to do it right when we actually do the rebuilds in there? Yes, when the rubble goes away, we intend to leave behind a good product. Great, okay. Um, I just wanted to do a double check on that to make sure we don't stop doing that work as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Council Catherine, I just want clarity on number two the assessment on 106th Street, 40th Avenue, and 95th Avenue, your understanding is not the removal of uh, uh, exclusion of those from the, uh, uh, from the routes. My, my understanding is that we will look at uh, a number of criteria when we're evaluating those routes. Yeah. Um, exclusion of uh, removal of a route is not on the table, but I think we would look at whether there needs to be changes yeah. to the route to address The reason am I asking that is that's going to open up a totally different discussion what Councillor Nickel is talking about, 76th Avenue, and Councillor Katrina may talk about 121st Avenue. And, uh, uh, you know, I could talk about other roads and uh, others can talk about other roads. So I think we need to be very, very careful that we are not getting or settle back, you know, Millwood's Road, any road. So we could open up this whole discussion and where we put those bike lanes. I think we need to be very, very careful. I, and I, I need to be absolutely clear. This is not about revisiting uh, 106th or 40th or 95th. We don't believe it to be okay. about if that is, removing that's your understanding, routes. then I'm fine. Okay. Councillor Caterina. Uh, hey, just, can, just hold on. Councillor uh, Walters, can you... What please? it says is there's options for alternative routes which could potentially have the impact of changing those routes, of removing and relocating them. Those are, that's part of the assessment that I'm looking for. That, and that is our understanding. Okay. Within the same neighborhood. Right? Within the same neighborhood. So the connectivity gets maintained, but the routes may change. That's part of the process and the assessment. That will be part of our evaluation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Katrina? 
Okay, thank you, and uh, I think uh, without speaking to the motions in that, uh, just to clarify, um, we set the transportation plan, the bike plan, uh, who picked the routes, and then where was the consultation in that process? Give me a one, two, three, four step uh, to get to where we, uh, where we got to. Uh, the, there was uh, a number of opportunities for consultation over a two-year period. Probably the greatest effort that went into picking the routes was uh, community meetings and stakeholder meetings where we threw maps out on the table and asked people just to draw lines as to where they live and where they work, where they go to school, what other facilities they'd like to be able to ride to, and we used those lines to determine what kind of network would assist them to do that by bicycle. Okay, so the process uh, uh, you're saying is that it was consultation first, and then the plan was rolled out, and the maps, and this is where the route is, and the, the, that sort of thing. That, that's the process. I, I think maybe I just want to clarify one thing. The premise with the bicycle transportation plan is ultimately to create a network that nobody is more than a five-minute ride from a good bike route. That good bike route may be a shared-use path in the utility corridor. That may be an on-street bike facility, it may be a community connector just in their local neighborhood. Okay, the if intent... you could, uh, we've only got five minutes here. So you set, or the department set that five minute, you didn't get that from the public coming forward and saying, well, it's got to be five minutes. You, you, you set a goal there, you implemented this, rolled it out, and then asked people to comment on a route that was already decided. We, we That's set been that my goal. experience, and I attended many of your meetings here at City Hall, which virtually nobody was there. So the fact that many, many were in attendance, I, I didn't see them. Uh, I've got two uh, that uh, the actual consultation happened after the signage went up. Then you asked the community what they thought of it. Stakeholders, I don't know who you're, you think the stakeholders are in, in this, but given that the, the people that were actually affected were not involved, I don't know who you're calling stakeholders. And it doesn't matter what the routes are now. So uh, I don't know if the, the process has been uh, consultation and then implementation, or if it's been setting the route and then asking for comment. Uh, and most of the people that I've talked to felt that it was, uh, the route was set and they were to comment whether they liked it or not. Okay, but the route was set. The signage went up. Th that's the impression I've gotten from most of my constituents. And so now going forward, let's say that what's on the bike plan, you get consultation now, and for whatever reason it doesn't work, or it's, there's going to be major issues. The fact of being able to move it, help me understand, you're saying that that's not what you're looking at, or you are looking at that? That whatever's set is really not set you'll give people an option to say, well, maybe go one street north, one street south, one street west, one street east uh, would be better uh, based on the local knowledge that, uh, uh, unfortunately, I've seen that as well too, where the department has not even gone out to a bike route physically to see what happens at peak morning or peak evening. On paper, it looks terrific, but in actual fact, it's uh, the worst uh, uh, route that you could uh, possibly take. Well, this was, I, I'm asking in, in, in the question that this is what's happened and I want to know how the structure is going to go forward. Whatever's happened has happened. How is, the, how is this going to go forward in, in the process? You're going to consult first with the community, the actual stakeholders that are affected, okay. and then make a recommendation on the route? or vice versa? Councillor, we'll be consulting with the community to get information that will help determine the optimum route within the neighborhood. Does that cover it? Okay, so and that wasn't quite the case originally, as you stated. It's, it's, this is a learning process. Okay, and if some mistakes or serious mistakes have been made up until now, will there be an option to revisit those rather than just saying we made a mistake, it doesn't seem to be the right route, but we did it, so leave it alone. You know, we ha do have the outstanding motion in Newton, the 121 Avenue, and, and the intention would be to look at that process 
um, to help bring some of the elements of this new process to that question. So, the, so those are postponements, or how would you categorize 121st and 132nd? Are they postponements that you're going to bring forward again, or are you actually going to go out to the community this time and, and get their feedback and see the actual reality of it? We'll be doing consultation on those routes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roshi. Um, so to be clear, um, from my conversations this morning, I'm actually not, I'm not against bike lanes. Um, you know, I, I look at my role here as trying to, is, is to, is to ask some tough questions to try to get the right answers, and um, I'd rather do that than throw some softball leading questions like some people. Um, so anyway, um, he's, not, he's not even listening to me. He's busy over looking over there. So can I ask, talk a little bit about consultation? So. When we're uh, talking about issues like this, and maybe this is sort of a bigger consultation question than necessarily for you guys, but I'd like, I'd like you guys to answer this. Um, when we're talking about an issue like this and we have, um, um, the, obviously, the, the, the individuals and the groups that are, that are I'll say, pro, pro bike lanes. Um, I noticed that of the 12 speakers or 10 speakers that were here, we didn't have anybody who was adamantly against bike lanes. So when we're in situations like this, how do you consult with, you know, at a public meeting in a neighborhood, you're likely going to get people that are pro bike lanes, um, and uh, and and people that aren't, you know, that may be against the bike lanes, or maybe to the extent or how they're affecting their neighborhoods. They're not really, you know, they're not going to bother coming out to a meeting. So how do we get um, the consultation process done so we can get the voice of of the people that are less less passionate about? Less, I'll say that I mean I mean issues in general, but let's just use this example of this issue. It's kind of an outreach question. We try to reach the different groups um, as much as we can. When we do, like for example, with these meetings, we had 1,800 people participate. We had a very wide range um, of viewpoints and voices as a part of that. Um, we also provide different types of tools so that, um, for example, uh, having a survey online helps for people that can't come to meetings. So um, we use all those different things to make sure we're trying to get a, a wider range. I mean, I just, don't, I just don't want to end up in a place that we are right now where we do something again and then afterwards there's a, you know, a, a certain, a large segment of the population that's not happy with, um, with what we're doing, even though they're not passionately not happy about it. And, and I guess it's a challenge for all of us. So um, just a, a question to speak to number three, point three. Um, and I'm not, saying we, I'm not saying we need to take out bike lanes, but I do think we have to have the option that we can take out bike lanes if they were put in the wrong place. So I don't know. I mean, I just want to make it clear if, that that's a possibility. Not saying that we're going to end up having less. Maybe we have twice as many. I'm not, that's not my point. My, my point is that there may, and I don't know if there are, but there may be some that are in the wrong spot, and there might not, need, there might not be a need for an alternative one block over. So is that a possibility? Okay, so I think the idea is that the assessment comes back, and then that discussion happens as to what, what options do we have going forward. And if, if it's really clear that that's one of the options, that's one of the options that will be presented. Okay, so the ones that are, especially on the underused ones, um, there just might not be a bike lane needed in that neighborhood. I'm, I can think of one offhand. I don't know if we want specifics. Everyone's talking specifics, but um, that's a possibility, though. Let's say, let's, let's leave that open as a possibility because I don't think we can completely eliminate it. Um, I think the idea of working with the community on uh, the communities, what the community is looking for in terms of that, how do they so, connect into the bigger network? So, so, so let me use, the, as an example, on Wolf Willow Road, which is in my neighborhood, which is a dead end sort of street, kind of long, windy street, kind of dead end. Kids ride their bike on that road all the time before bike lanes after. I don't know if we need to keep it there or not. Um, but, you know, there's no other option. You're either going to have a bike lane in that, in that quiet neighborhood with a dead end or you're not. So I just need to, you know, I don't know the right answer whether we should or not, but I, I just need to be clear that I think we have to look at the potential if it's in everyone's interest to, re to remove the odd one. So is that, is that something that we might do or is that off the table? I, uh, just uh, by way of history, actually, that's one of the routes that isn't in the bike plan. Uh, one of the reasons that we looked at bike lanes there was actually to look at a greater issue of speeding on the road, and it was felt that the bike lanes might be something we could try to give the appearance that the road driving uh, area is narrower. Yeah, so all that, just, just as, a, as an anecdote, all that did was you have parking now, and now you've moved the bike lanes to the middle of the road, so now they're actually closer to the traffic. So, so, so certainly we can examine that if it's felt
felt to be a wrong decision, if we're creating an unsafe situation, we can look at whether we need to remove all or part of that route. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nack, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I wanted to speak to the motion and, and start off with, it's very interesting, well, really how much interest this topic generated. <laughs> um, in fact, in the last year between campaign and since I've been, been here, I've heard from more people about bike lanes than I have any other issue, and that includes budget, that includes winter road maintenance. Bike lanes I've heard about more. Um, yeah. <laughs> And, but very recently, just within the past few weeks, what seemed to be interesting is this debate seemed to shift into an either or instead of a best of all world, worlds discussion. And so with that in mind, first, I want to thank Councillor Walters um, for the fantastic work, work you did on that report um, before creating the motion because you really went out to seek a, seek a substantial amount of feedback, gain perspectives, and then draft this. Uh, and anyone who hasn't read it, I, I really encourage you to do so, as it, I think it gives you a wide range of, of the various opinions on this topic. Um, on a side note, maybe we should look at using that as we go forward with some of our consultation in general as a city. It was a really good design. Um, back to the motion. Again, I think this motion is going to help us achieve the best of all world solution. Um, almost every person I spoke to over the past year agreed that dedicated cycling infrastructure or multi-use trails... You, are you speaking to it now? Oh, sorry, yeah. Did you, okay, go yeah, ahead. If I was going to speak okay, to it now, okay, yeah, if that's fine. Do you want me one? Okay. Um, so again, sorry, everyone I spoke to agreed that the dedicated cycling infrastructure, multi-use trails, that would be the preferred option as it both increased safety for the cyclists and thereby actually increases the ridership, which I believe is one of our core objectives of this entire plan, which is to get more cyclists on our roadway. Uh, and the great news is that we can actually provide that type of infrastructure without making driving more difficult. We can do both. Um, you know, within Ward 1, there's, I have some options. I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards on them and, and share some suggestions, but I won't go into the specifics there. Um, I just wanted to sort of note at the end here that, you know, I am one of the people that actually wants to be a cyclist in the city of Edmonton. Um, prior to being elected, I rode my bike to work in spring, summer, fall, and I walked to work in winter. So I actually, I just realized this over lunch that I was primarily a cyclist in the city of Edmonton, and I never quite understood that. And that said, I always rode more on the neighborhood streets. Um, because I wasn't really comfortable on the major streets. Uh, I, I'm not confident in my own skills, and that feeling still exists today. So as somebody who is an aspiring cyclist, um, I'm actually very excited about the proposals for 102nd, 83rd, and I actually hope to see more of that throughout the entire city. As again, I believe that's going to improve the safety, which will thereby increase our ridership, and it also ensures the efficient movement of goods and people for vehicular traffic as well. Um, and so this motion should help us achieve that, and I hope the committee supports it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gibbons? I was here for the start, and I wrote down a few notes, but um, when it says that the, um, you had low attendance at um, public hearings and so on, Yet one of your answers, just as I arrived back, because I can't read a motion from upstairs, so I had to come back. So, did you have low attendance? Oh, if or I did you have lots of people, but only at Councillor Walsh? Yeah, it, one year in particular, 2012, instead of doing kind of larger meetings, we tried to do kind of individual neighborhood meetings, because we figured neighborhood issue, that would be a good thing. But um, regardless of what we did to try and promote that and outreach and get people out to it, that was when we had low attendance. Um, we haven't had issues of low attendance um, for uh, the bike routes in general. So you also said you had on-site meetings, example, a church. Was it, that wasn't my very concerned church up in my end of town about where the bus, uh, bike lanes are beside it? That was one of several churches that we had on-site meetings with. But we had them in my office with Bob Butelier and, and Father Romano. And Father Romano was the most gentlest man in the world, about 10 feet off the uh, ground on that one, uh, floor on that one. So where did you consult in, uh, in Northeast Edmonton, if I can ask? With the 121st Avenue route, we... Well, that's, I'm, that's, I'm, I'm talking Ward 4 now, that's the old Ward 3. 
And when I was Ward 3 Councillor for um, nine years, I don't remember one there at all. Oh, we haven't, to the best of my knowledge, put any bicycle facilities in the outer part of the northeast ward. 40th Street. Uh, other than 40th Street. Up. And that was done as part of a road reconstruction project, so a slightly different process. But again, uh, what we learned from there is certainly that churches and schools and other stakeholders are worthy of having independent meetings with, and that's why we instituted that for the 2013 process. So if the motion up here goes forward, number two, when you say, um, an assessment of the selected routes, and it seems to be... I think we can't prescribe avenues and Councillor Walters isn't here, but we've got to be careful what we prescribed as on here because I can add 40th Street to it also. And there's, we, we've got to be careful now. And then the last one, number three, and I did hear you talk, uh, I mentioned to Councillor Anderson that my inquiry on moving bike lanes onto um, pipelines and or whatever the other will be coming back and be part of this as well, right? That will be part. Uh, we'll be looking at the issue of shared use paths and the connectivity through not only utility rights of way, but alongside road rights of way as well. So just talking 40th Street, because it seems like we was mentioned, and I quite agree with it, if we have extra wide streets because of poor planning somewhere along in the 1990s that we put in lanes that are not wide enough for four lanes, but they're too wide for the two lanes and nobody understands where they're supposed to be without lines seems to be what happened on 40th Street, what happened probably in other cases, and or whether there's been speeding as a major concern that our city wants to control, which I'm quite I'm behind that totally because that particular wide streets create that. We have to, I, I think in the case that I tried to push was um, where we had no sidewalk on 40th Street forever and we had an, an extra wide boulevard there that was wider than you really ever needed, why we couldn't have put a bike lane up to there instead of putting it behind angle parking. So a church that has 1,500 family members on, that has three services between Saturday and two on Sunday, that um, everybody comes in and they park an angle park one side, somebody's going to back out of an angle park and take a bike out one of these days, and that's going to be the sad part. So we need to pay attention if we have to build separate trails, separate um, separate from the sidewalks. If everybody's so worried about sidewalks. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a little bit more consultation with our public because I think that this is... Um, and uh, Councillor Knack is talking about how many inquiries he's had well, we've had inquiries for a long time, but we've been too stubborn to move forward to actually, uh, um, and I'm t saying we as the city, of trying to make sure it works before we uh, throw it out with like the baby with the bath water or the other way around. So I think we have to do this right. So, Thank you, Councilor. I, I know absolutely that point you made about identifying the streets and avenues uh, is a valid it's a valid point, but I, my understanding of this is that they, uh, these streets were mentioned in the report, and the understanding is that the learnings from uh, uh, having a discussion with the community around these three routes doesn't mean that routes will not be uh, that uh, bike lanes will not be built on those communities. Right. They will be. It could be a different avenue than, uh, say, 40 or whatever, right? So, but the learnings will be applied to other areas as well, right? That's my understanding. You're nodding your head. Okay, that's how... So understanding I, as this is taken out of the motion or taken or, or add to? Because we can't just do something for Ward 10. We have to do something for the whole city. This is why yeah, when you get elected on council, that. you're aware... Yeah, that that, that, I, I share that concern as well. So, so if I can just speak to that, Councillor Gibbons, I appreciate that point, and I, I asked that of when we talked to talked it through with the clerks is part of this is because there's recommendations in this report that we'll be asked to receive for information that suggest improvements to 40th, 106th, and 95th, which I don't think go far enough or and don't really capture the concerns of the community. So that's why we specified these and provided number three as an option so that routes all over the city, because uh, it's not about Ward, 95th Avenue is not in Ward 10, it's in Ward 1. No, but right? at the same time when 
uh, administration doesn't want anything to be done in their motion coming forward, they always write for information. So hopefully you, you forget what's written in there and you, you, we go on to adding stuff in. Too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Loca. Thank you. Sorry I missed this morning. I had other commitments. Um, so I'm going to try not to be repetitive. I have a couple questions and then I might speak to the motion. I'll see what kind of answers I get. Now I'm looking at the report, I'm looking at the consultation process here and I was racking my brain trying to remember if I had ever attended a consultation process in Ward 3 regarding bike lanes and I don't think I have. And I'm look, looking at the schedule that uh, January of last year um, up until um, April of last year and I don't see any meetings that were um, held in Ward 3 or even around Ward 3. Is that correct or did I miss something here don't believe there were any okay so if we're truly going to be consulting people we need to do it in every community not just the south side of the city uh, or the west end of the city um, now my next question is is there a plan for Ward 3 specifically can you show me anything where proposed bike lanes are going to go so part one of the motion that Councillor Walters has made today is asking for a five-year plan how we're going forward and so certainly there are our routes in Ward 3 and those will be presented as part of that. Okay and the public consultation process for that in Ward 3 would begin when? That's also what we're going to flesh out when we come back with information on in June. Okay, and I agree with, thank, thanks for that, and I agree with Councillor Gibbons, uh, uh, Councillor Sohi, that I think, um, oh, it looks like it's been removed. I think the motion, again, is too prescriptive, um, and I can't vote on it here. Um, but this is, isn't about one part of the city. This is about the entire city. And um, the larger question here, I think, as well, if I, and I, again, I missed this morning, I don't know if it was touched on, is the way we consult communities. So I think this is a good, uh, a good example, uh, not an example is not the word I'm looking for, a good opportunity for us to do a proper consultation process citywide, especially with an issue like this. This is a very contentious issue. Uh, I can tell you in my word, I'm really not getting any, any feedback about this. And uh, uh, having door knock back uh, just a th few months ago certainly wasn't a big issue uh, and, and my word, it didn't come up very much, but it will be if we don't consult properly. So we must consult properly. That's, that's, uh, that's how I'd like to finish on this issue. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Anderson, you want to speak to this, right? Uh, well, during, during the election process, I went to Councillor Walter's uh, forum, and I went to the com a community league forum, and if my memory serves me correctly, the biggest round of applause for any candidate in the election in Ward 10 was for anybody who said bike lanes are bad and the ones that are in here suck. Standing ovation. We're going to elect. We're going to elect him because he doesn't like bike lanes. Now, I, yeah, everybody who was running said bike lanes are bad and everybody got a round of applause. So when we do something that results in physical infrastructure where 10% of the people say, no way, I don't want them ever, 10 people say, yes, I want them all the time and everywhere, and 80% of them say they suck, something went wrong. We just can't do that and have a complete set of neighborhoods opposed to what we did. So, Councillor Anderson, I think the I think we can all acknowledge that we need to learn from what has been done. I don't think there's any question of that. I think the question is um, how can we learn and how can we go forward? How can we do things better? And there was a lot of discussion this morning about this idea of of a network and let's focus on the center. And I think that's that's what we need to look at and how do we move forward? Well, I think it was Councillor Katarina that. I think before we put signs up and before we lay down rubber on road, there has to be an opportunity to have meetings where you say, this is what we want to do in the future. Give us 
your thoughts and your opinions. So I hope that there's a, a, an alternative way for us to come to where we want to be with the general support of our communities. Thanks. Councillor Nickel. Well, I guess uh, to follow up on Councillor Katarina and Councillor Anderson's statements, can you give me some examples of, uh, of where you have learned and how you, what kind of, give me some, some, some sense of a metric that you're going to use uh, uh, to extract the local expertise, if we will, about a proper placement of a bike lane. Can I clarify, is that learning from process or learning from the design of a bike lane? How about we say both for now? Oh. So uh, learning from process, um, we, we talked about that example. Another um, example we can talk about is we brought stakeholders together for this year's um, program. Historically, we have always talked to them, we worked with them, um, stakeholders as in community league representatives, um, adjacent community or adjacent businesses if they were there, schools, um, et cetera, the, the, those, those types of groups. We always worked with them, but we sent them information or met with them individually. And as you know, often types, those, type, those groups have different points of view. And this year we brought them together uh, into the first round of consultation so that we could have a conversation with them and they would be talking to each other as well. Okay, back to the question. The question is, what are you going to, is there something you're going to do fundamentally different than what was done through this process? Um, a few things. One, we need to look at having more lead time and a longer um, period where we're out there talking to people because we've been um, going on an accelerated way. Um, but the most important one that we talked about um, is when we're going into neighborhoods, um, historically, the way we've, we've understood our, our role to be is to say, this is, you know, the bike route that has been approved in the, in the bike transportation plan. And we were having conversations with people about how to best fit it in, how to do that. And uh, the concern was about route location. So, you know, um, well, that just... You just said it was, um, you can certainly understand, don't you think, that that kind of approach kind of goes to a show and tell kind of a criticism to not to just this bike lane process, but to some other processes the city has, where you've come in with a set plan and you said, this is it, this is, this is the route, this is what's going on. I can read you a letter right here where the impressions from the constituents clearly say that they were led with the idea that it was a done deal and, and basically uh, they didn't feel they were consulted at all. Yeah. So d you, you understand the point I'm getting at. Oh, absolutely. As administration, um, it was our, you know, we did have the bike plan. It was approved by council, so it wasn't really our role to change that. Um, and I know how that can be difficult okay. coming to the people, so but let's, let's, we're let's, learning. And Councillor Henderson will probably take great pains to educate me what happened five years ago. <laughs> and uh, I was on vacation thanks to another uh, person at this desk. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank him for it. I, think, I, th I almost thank him every week for it, to tell you the truth. And so um, I guess what I will do is I'll, uh, I'll speak to it when, when the opportunity arises after... You can speak now. Yeah. No, no, I, I'm going to take all my five minutes. We have, four, we have four more items on the agenda, so I hope people will be reasonable with their time. So, Councillor Caterina. Uh, I agree with you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, uh, but I think you were here for community services and you had a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't take my five minutes there. So I'm going to make this, make this brief so I really understand this. Councillor Loken asked you if there's a plan for Ward 3. It is on. If there's a plan for Ward 3 and your response was, yes, there is. So, and then the plan's already there, but now you're going to go out and consult. So that was my original question. Before you develop the plan of where the bike route is going to go, 
is get the stakeholders involved and get the neighborhood input and then possibly come out with a recommendation saying this could be the bike route, this could be the bike route, not to come into these consultation meetings with this is the bike route, so what do you think about it? Well, okay. That's the impression that people are, are getting. And I want to really score this point. On 132nd, your signs went up. I had no idea that that was a bike route until I read the sign saying bike route is going to be done here. And for me, that was the dumbest road that we could have ever picked because the stakeholders there, the high school with 2,500, 2,800 students, the rec center next door, the junior high school next door to that, and the school across the street, you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of students, and yet no one had ever gone there that designed this bike route or proposed it there had actually gone there morning and, and afternoon of what happens. 3D parking. All illegal, but 3D parking. Uh, so I don't believe that the stakeholders in this cir circumstance were the ones that were um, asked or consulted, the true stakeholders. And in, during that meeting, the Area 2 Council, representing 10, 12 community leagues, weren't in favor either. So I don't know where you would get the idea that you had community consultation in that particular circumstance where virtually everybody wasn't aware and uh, wasn't in favor of uh, the bike route down there because it, it was actually dangerous for the majority of the students that uh, uh, are in that area at least twice a day. So if you're going to consult, consult, then make the decision on which lanes you're going to propose and suggest and give us an option of not just one, that's not an option. Give us an option of two or three, and what the virtues would be of better, worse, in the middle, and, uh, but make sure the community actually has a say first uh, before this happens. Uh, you know, so. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Henderson. Yeah, just to speak to this, I, and, and, I, and I actually want to jump in now, having gone, gone this route, uh, and in, in defense and clarity, I think, about where the administration is and what they've done and the role, the role that we have played in this, and understanding that most of the councillors around this table didn't play a role in that. But I just think we need to understand that to understand how we move forward. Because, and I was part of it, it was before I was elected, I know then Councillor Iverson was part of it as well. I know a number of us went to this. There was very, very, very extensive work and a consultant brought in citywide work on a bike master plan. And it was, it was a citywide consultation, and this is maybe one of the glitches about trying to do things citywide and coming up with plans citywide, is everybody from the city, citywide gets involved, and I know, you know, we voted for this plan, right? So when we say we don't like a particular route now, we approved it. The trouble is, and to, to Councillor Loken's point, the trouble is that the neighborhood doesn't come to the table. They, they were part of that. They had absolute, Ward 3 had, it was then Ward 2, had ample opportunity to be part of that process. But until it comes to your front door, you don't pay attention, you don't look at it, you don't, because you don't think it affects you. You like the idea of the bike plan, but you don't understand what the actual effect is going to be for you. And somehow or other, we need to come up with a system that puts those two things together. But at this point, we put the administration in a difficult position because we approve something. And they're not, they don't have the ability to go in and say we can move this because we said that that's where it was going to go. That probably means a rethink on our part about what kind of ability we, we want to have to make these routes adjustable once we start having the local question. And, but that's a question back to us that we're going to have to be able to struggle with and deal with. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm nervous about some, I mean, I'm, pre I'm prepared to be supportive of what's put, because clearly we need another rethink of this. Clearly we need to go back and think a little bit more broadly about it. I find it ironic, I mean, in my, in my area, I think I'm in a different position, and I think this is another place where the city has been built in different kinds of ways, so there's different interests. That's not to say it's been clear sailing in Ward 8. Um, but I think clearly there was a demand and a need in Ward 8, and, and, and we've toughed it out. It has been no different from my perspective than the same kind of discussions we've had about trying to retrofit an LRT through Ward 8. It is just as hard, it is just as difficult, it is just the same kind of trade-offs. And you have to make choices and there's no way to do it. I think we're kidding ourselves if we think we can do this without there being some consequences. And that would be my one caution about this motion, is it begins to suggest that there's a magical solution to this where we can have our cake and eat it. I'm not convinced we can. 
So I think we need to keep that in mind as we go forward. I'm, I'm torn because I'm, I'm elected to represent the entire city. And that, that means, you know, a lot of the people that came in, in front of us today who are bike riders who want that infrastructure, I'm hearing loud and clear, and I will continue to call people to account for that, that putting it in the center of the city where I'm allowed to be parochial and say bring it on is where we're beginning to go. That's ironic given that we really work as councillors so hard not to fight for our own wards but to make choices on behalf of the whole city. But, but, if, if we, but maybe there's an argument that we need to build this system out, that you need to create it in a good way, high quality, so that more people can use it where their demand is and then it begins to be able to become more and more usable by the rest of the city as it grows out. And I'm hoping that's where we're prepared to go. I'm hoping this opens that door. But I think, I guess my one caution about this is we need to be a little bit careful if we think that just opening up the whole can of worms again and saying that, 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 that if we just move it a block, it's gonna, there's going to be a magical answer. I'm not convinced that that's the case. If we truly want connectivity, there's going to have to be some choices made. But I do think we need to do a much better job in retrospect, going in and figuring out a way with all of our con consultation process, because it's not just here we run into this problem, to find out to make, to, to make sure that everybody, even the local issues, are part of the bigger conversation when we have them. Because I don't think this was, I, I really want to defend, because I think there was a very thorough job on the, on, the, on the larger plan, and we're yelling at them for a choice and a way that, that, that we made it happen. And if we need to go back and rethink that, that's part of the whole consultation discussion we need to have. Um, but, but I don't want to suggest that they made up the, the, the master plan. It was made up by a large community who worked for two years to do it with a fair amount of resources going into making sure that it was, whether it's working or not, whether or not we need to go back and re-examine it is a different question. But uh, um, if, if that's where we need to go, then that's the question we need to open up. Good. Before I go to uh, to Mayor and uh, and to Councilor Walter, uh, Councilor Nickel, you want to close? Uh, stay, make your statements. Make my statement. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I guess the phrase is that this bicycle crash didn't have to happen. To use to put it in kind of an, uh, a little soundbite, and you know, I am not anti bike lane. I'm pro bike, I'm pro modes of transit, and to, to, to take this, what I would consider like, and I was talking to Councillor McKean earlier over lunch, a relatively benign idea of facilitating more, more access for people who want to ride bikes, a benign and a, and a great idea. Um, this process has poisoned the public mindset, and which is really unfortunate. But that, uh, and so, you know, we have to go through the learning exercise, as it's been said, we have to take a step back. Uh, you know, it is a, um, my questions go to uh, some regards to the process about the monitor, how the monitoring of the outputs, meeting of the objectives. Um, you know, one thing I have not heard is, we've heard all about one side of the argument, with regards to health and wellness and being, but there was a very few, uh, there was very little discussion with regards to economic disruptions, with, uh, with regards to businesses, in, uh, for example, in Ward 11, where bike lanes went, and uh, they need to be talked to as much as, uh, as the communities. And unfortunately, I feel, and, and people might think I'm rather harsh, that this report really kind of is sugarcoating some of the some of the failures that we've had in the public consultation side. And it's, and I hope, I hope we'll take our, uh, our lessons and our lumps and we learn from it. Clearly to me, bike lanes make sense. You do not have an argument from Councillor Nickel to say no to bike lanes. But the failure has been in execution. It has been in the consultation. And it's, and it's, and in the end, compiled with all the other public consultation issues that we're having in the city. This issue has grossly undermined people's confidence in what City Hall does through the public consultation process. Got to do better. And we will do better. I'm optimistic. And, and the only other unfortunate part of this is, is the money spent, is the time being spent doing this again, and uh, I'm, unfortunately, we have to, 
because, you know, I'll speak on behalf of my constituents. They feel very strongly about what has happened in, in Ward 11. And uh, I appreciate Councillor Henderson's point of view uh, uh, about the, trying to support the entire city. And I think Councillor Henderson is right. I think when we do these sorts of projects, when we're talking about fundamentally trying to change some aspects of behaviour, that it's important to take small steps, not, not big huge steps. And we take it one piece at a time and we evolve, you know, it's an evolution, not a revolution. And that's the, that's, that's the way public policy needs to be taken sometimes. And this is one of those issues where we need to evolve it in certain areas of the city where there's great public acceptance. And then we also have to turn around and admit in some areas that they just don't belong. And that's just the simple fact of it. Thank you for, uh, for your presentation. I do appreciate it. And uh, uh, hopefully we can get on with this and, uh, and we can get this thing fixed sooner rather than later. Thank you. You took only four minutes. Well, I think there, there are potentially three schools of thought here. One is let's keep on doing exactly what we're doing, and I don't hear anybody arguing for that. Um, one is, the, the, the next is that we're just not going to accommodate cycling, that we're not interested, we don't take it seriously, we don't see cyclists as legitimate citizens and taxpayers, and, and uh, very rarely will anyone actually say that openly. But it lurks under the surface in a lot of this conversation, and it bothers me as a cyclist and a taxpayer. <laughs> Uh, and it, it bothers me as someone who believes in a city that does have to change over time to have more choices in it, more mobility, more transportation alternatives, um, which is uh, uh, which, which I didn't hear anyone arguing against that either until it actually comes to the, the pressure of having to make the change. Um, but I think the largest group it, in, in the three schools of thought is... Um, we're not sure how we're going to do this, but, but we think we should, and we want to do it right. We're not quite sure what that looks like yet. More work is needed. That's, that's I think, the consensus that I hear, um, and that's encouraging, because it's not that we shouldn't do this, and it's not that, uh, that cycling isn't an important choice out there for citizens. It, it just says we've got more work to do. And I hear administration has got that message from us. That's a message we got from our public. I don't think we need to, to berate administration for following the pre direction of the previous council anymore. I hope we can move past that in this conversation and get focused back on okay, what did we learn from the last several years? Um, and, uh, and then get focused on how are we going to make room for cyclists in our transportation network. And the challenge is going to be that, that we're going to have to work through some give and take. You know, and this requires good design, which may require taking out parking uh, in certain places. It, it may require, require reconfiguring a road. Um, you know, and this is going to require good consultation, which may mean changing a route. It shouldn't mean, well, we're just never going to do it because we can't agree. But it, it may require some flexibility on the, city's, on the city's front, some openness to suggestions for alternatives. There may be a better alternative out there. But it shouldn't result in stalemate and, well, we're just not going to do anything. Um, and most of all, it'll actually require investment because if we are going to do it right, we're going to need to build, um, we're going to need to do more than just put paint on the streets. And that's where, because resources are limited, I think, if we're coming to a consensus that it does make sense to put the higher value and, and costlier but potentially more effective and inviting um, separated lanes and buffered lanes in, in the core where there's existing demand and high potential future demand, then I think that's, that's a good next place for us to go while we look at, while we, um, through the motion here, have a chance to reflect on how would we make it, if, how, what, based on what we've learned from the last couple of years and what we might do in the next few years in the core, how can we then take that out constructively into the other parts of the city over time? Um, and hopefully that will uh, put it back on, on the right path and uh, get us to where we want to be. So, um, so I appreciate the, the, the measured uh, tone of the motion. I think it gives us, it's going to give us data, it's going to give us analysis, and it's not a step backwards, but it is a, a bit of a pause while we consider how we're going to move ahead with bicycle infrastructure effectively in the coming years. Well, 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before I go to Councillor Walters, I want to say a few words as well. You know, I, I, first of all, I really want to uh, uh, acknowledge the uh, the difficult time that you, as an administration, has gone through for the past almost uh, two years. You know, uh, when we started implementing this, when we started hearing from uh, from the public and some of the opposition and some of the, uh, I would say, the beating that you have taken in some. Uh, in some cases, sometimes unreasonable, right? So I think, uh, I, 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 I feel like saying that. I, so I really feel that uh, uh, despite the, uh, you know, the learnings and uh, some mistakes being made during the implementation uh, plan, but you, your heart was in the right place and uh, you tried to do what you thought was the best thing you were doing, implementing a plan that was approved by council. It wasn't your document, it was council's document. And we, as the past council who approved it, also have some sense of responsibility too. Because we approved it. And if we were not able to identify problem areas where those bikes were going to go, we should have known at that time. We should have paid better attention to the document. I think we also need to take some responsibility. Um, uh, another thing that this issue has really divided the community. And I hope that as we move forward, we are able to bring the community together in a way that they understand that cycling, like driving or transit, is a very legitimate mode of transportation for people to move around. And it fits into our long-term goal of creating options and dealing with congestion and dealing with some of the environmental health-related outcomes that we as a municipality want to achieve. I think we need to frame it in that, that context as well. I and also, I was li I'm still a li little bit nervous about mentioning of uh, streets and avenues in, uh, in, in part two, but the way I understand that this will give us some framework to move forward on uh, and learn from uh, the consultation that will have to take place in, uh, in these neighborhoods and uh, apply that to, uh, 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 to other areas as well. So I'll, I will support with the, this with that. That, uh, that understanding. I'll go to Councilor Walter for close. Thank you. Appreciate everybody's time today and the work of the uh, past council of the administration to bring forward a bicycle transportation plan that, uh, at the high at a high level and in spirit, I support. Uh, we imagined a bike network that would inspire Edmontonians to cycle safely and cycle in all seasons. And the last council passed it, and I was glad that they did pass it. Uh, I think that sustainable and active transportation is critical to our city. It's a vision that I support. Uh, but in order to achieve that vision, which we've heard, you've heard over and over today uh, as an administration, uh, we cannot simply claim that we know, we as a city know the path forward, that we have to invite as many other people onto that path as possible. And that leadership is about meeting people where they are and not expecting them to meet us where, they want, where we want them to be. So I think as we go forward, and you've heard this a million times, and I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, beat this drum, but I think there's a question about empathy. I think that often when we bring change uh, to the table, we risk being glib about our ideas in uh, relation to other people's experiences. And I think what I learned is that what we've done so far, uh, and what we need to do going forward, is have more empathy for seniors who have. Uh, lived and driven in this city their entire, their entire time here and are confused and anxious about bicycle infrastructure that they don't understand. Uh, we need to have empathy for young parents who because of you know, previous urban planning decisions and cultural pressures and time pressures and the need to race from one thing to the next as a result of education policies uh, are in their cars a lot and have to drive a lot and that's the way our city is today. And we have to have empathy for them in this process. And we have to respect the other forms of transportation, like transit, which I don't think we've done uh, a very good job of here as well. Uh, so I think the strategy overall is the right strategy. Uh, and as you've heard, and I agree with, and it's the point of the motion is we haven't gone about it right. So I think the motion gives us a fresh start. One thing that it does uh, is it gives council more voice. We get an implementation plan back. We get a better consultation plan back that puts community interest before the roots, which is what Councillor Katarina has rightly dug for, is that 
You can't just come with the roots because people need to feel like they're contributing to the network. That it's, we want them to own the network. We want our citizens to own the network. I think this, uh, it's not about me trying to hoard all the good public consultation and engagement in Ward 10, that this is germane to this report and that there's things that we can learn from uh, in the installations that were made in 2013. And that ultimately, number one, two, and three, gives each of us on council the opportunity to show real leadership in how the engagement happens in our community. That it's just not upon the administration's back to do it right. That we need to be actively involved in making sure that our communities are properly consulted and bought in to whatever routes ultimately form the entire network. So I'd encourage you, uh, because of those things, to support the motion. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. All in favor? That is great. Thank you so much, and thanks to everyone for participating. Uh, we got to move on to our uh, other uh, item, uh, which is the 6.6. Uh, .6, uh, religious assembly parking and uh, traffic options. Uh, we have five minutes before, uh, before we take the break. Should we take the break early and uh, then come back at uh, 3.40? Yeah, is it okay, committee? Yeah. So motion to move early. A break early and come back at 3.40. Yeah. Done? All in favor? Carried.
Good afternoon, everyone. We would uh, like to convene with this meeting. Uh, the, uh, the next item on the agenda is 6.6, uh, .6, the uh, Religious Assembly Parking and uh, Traffic Options. So I, I do not have a presentation prepared, but I do have speaking notes. If you'd like me to run through them quickly, I can go through a very short or I can go through a medium length. Well, uh, can you just uh, briefly comment yeah, yeah, on I can. that? So this report is here from a motion from September 16th, 2013 at a uh, city council public hearing. Uh, there was a DC2 zoning that was uh, approved by council on that day related to the site that's in attachment uh, one of the report. And um, there were a few questions that were asked in a subsequent motion by council on that day uh, related to parking, roadway upgrades, and costs of the upgrades, as well as arterial road assessments. So the details are within the report. Um, in a sense, the parking issue or the parking discussion was, is there enough parking? The, the site uh, has space for about 240 stalls if you wanted to maximize the full site, uh, the zoning bylaw would look for about 40 stalls. So there is plenty of space. The roadway upgrades that have been outlined in the DC2 uh, have been outlined as specific conditions. Uh, so the costs range between 1.1 and 1.3 million dollars for road upgrades for the site. Uh, arterial roadway assessments are a requirement of the DC2 condition 4MI. Uh, the assessment uh, of the site which is based on the full site development would be about $230,000 based on 2013 numbers. Um, and the current status of the application is uh, December 2013 we received a formal circulation of a development permit that we're working on the details uh, subject to this meeting today and, and city administration will process it in short time. Thank you. We'll go to uh, Mr. Sayed uh, Sohawardi, please come uh, up here. I'll uh, briefly explain to you the process even though you've been watching <laughs> here this mo all morning. Uh, you will have five minutes to speak. Green light will indicate your time is starting and uh, yellow light means you have one minute remaining and red light means your time has expired. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity. I'm representing the Canadian uh, Ministries for Islamic Learning, which owns the, uh, this property on 71st Street, Southwest. And um, uh, uh, there is no doubt that those roads uh, w should be and will be upgraded. But the question is when? Right now, we are not developing any new structure. There is no new development. We are going to use the current structure for, uh, for the re religious assembly. This is a community project, and community is giving their donations. And they, we strongly believe that it is a wastage of money. Uh, to upgrade roads at this stage where there is no increase in traffic at all. We are already using the same access road and we are praying our Friday prayers at the curling club. So it is the same traffic which is coming on the same access road but right across the street we have curling club and which is accessible to, to all of us. We are not developing the site yet when we will have an area structure plan, at that time we will have a new structure and definitely we will go through the process of uh, you know, applying the uh, new development permit for the new structure. So since there is no new structure, there is no increase of traffic on the road, access road, because we are already using that facility at the curling club, which is just across the street from, from our property. So it's a wastage of money to invest uh, in the upgrading of the road at this stage and it does not make sense at all. And the community is, uh, is very strongly saying that uh, we should be able to upgrade it uh, once uh, we have a new structure there or new, uh, new development permit. Uh, I know the, uh, the parking is not an issue and, and the city planning department has said so, but only the upgrading of the road is uh, we will request the, the committee and, and the council to give us some relaxation at this stage uh, because we are not developing anything new. There is no new traffic uh, at all. 
and uh, we are just uh, using it for temporary usage until we have an area structure development plan which will include the, all the upgrades of that area. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, during the break, uh, I had some conversations with uh, uh, sustainable development and also with uh, the legal uh, department within the city and transportation. Uh, the challenge that they have identified, and I'll, I'll ask them um, when they come back, is that everything that is needed to be done is included in the in the zoning bylaw, right? Because you know the road upgrades, the uh, the assessment fees, and uh, or uh, and the parking. Parking is not an issue uh, that they were agreed upon in the in the zoning bylaw that this committee does not have the ability to uh, direct something to the administration that is prescribed in the zoning bylaw. So I think that is what they have identified to me. So we'll ask that, confirm that in public so you can hear directly from them. Um, I, I personally absolutely understand the challenge that you're facing uh, about uh, the, the need, uh, uh, the why there's a need to upgrade uh, and to, put all their money into uh, into infrastructure when uh, uh, you are already getting there by using the same roads into the same area right, so exactly and and i mean it's, it's a wastage of money too because we know this whole thing will be upgraded or or, or developed later on when the the whole area will be have an area structure plan and and all the other sites will be developed and we are not developing anything new but um, i understand uh, that it is part of the the bylaw that has been approved, but is it? I'm not sure. I do not know the process. If it, it is possible that we can get some relaxations temporarily, as we are using our property anyway for temporary usage uh, at this stage. So, if there is any possibility, I would uh, request you to to please consider that possibility that we can temporarily have some relaxation. We will ask those questions yeah. to administration. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you very much. Thanks, and thanks for waiting uh, for, for such a long time. So please come forward. So can you explain to me in, uh, in this form, what do you explain to me when we had this discussion during, uh, during the break, why when we know that uh, that road that currently exists is being used by the same number of people who will be using uh, the re religious assembly and they use that curling club. So they already go there and use that road. And uh, uh, if, if that road is able to accommodate uh, the traffic and we are asking them to upgrade to a uh, urban standard uh, and what are the reasoning behind it? Um. First, uh, an easy correction. We're not asking for an urban standard. We're asking for a rural standard okay. upgrade. So the road is oiled, gravel. We're looking for a paved roadway with okay. a sidewalk and streetlights. Um, when we looked at the application, it came to us as a direct control, which is a very site-specific zoning uh, allowance within the zoning bylaw. When we review applications, we look at sites, we try to determine past history, and we make determinations on what we think ought to be or ought not to be included within that direct control. A recommendation was put forward by uh, administration for the DC2 that did not support the DC2 on the day of the hearing, which again was a, a formal city council public hearing, statutory. Uh, the condition that we wrote in basically says uh, in the direct from the DC2 as a condition of any development permit. And it goes on to speak about payment of ARAs and construction of roadway. At no time was that contested during the public hearing process. It wasn't voiced, it wasn't brought up, it wasn't spoken to about around during that hearing. If there was a time to remove that condition, it would have been during that public hearing process. Uh, I think it was brought up during the uh the discussion at the bylock, I think that's why we made this, uh, uh, th that's why council made this uh, motion, but I don't know if you had that conversations when application was being discussed, but I, uh, I know, Michelle, I might be wrong. 
I think that this, this when we issue had did the come application with, review, we yeah. advised the applicant that these costs would be incurred, and we had to include it in the direct control zone so yeah. that it, with any development permit, we'd get the roadway upgrades to service the needs for that site. Um, there was no motions at council to amend that. Okay, all right. Uh, there was a subsequent motion, which is the result of resulted in this report. The, the council. Yes, to follow up on having yeah. transportation prepare this report to outline the numbers around the costs to upgrade. Yeah, I think the key significance to clear up is that it was approved, and a subsequent motion was made after the approval of the conditions. Yeah. Oh, after the approval of the bylaw, so this was made. Uh, this subsequent was made. Right. So. In order for any relaxation on the uh, on the upgrading of the roadways or uh, building the sidewalk or, or or installing street lights, what is the option available to uh, to them? We we've been very specific in our wording in our text that basically says that ARA shall be paid on the full area and the road construction of option A going to the north and over to 66th Street or going to the south and over to 66th Street be part of any development permit. So any application for any development permit, Council's direction through approval of that DC2 is those be elements that are included. The only way to challenge that or to change that would be to amend that DC2 document at a formal City Council public hearing. And the process to amend the DC by law is what? The applicant would come through my staff and pre prepare an application to amend the DC2. They would have to do a pre-notification and just we would review it and then bring it back to council after transportation has a chance to respond to that amendment, whatever is being proposed, and then we would just go through a normal public hearing process for council to make that decision. So it will be application to open the bylaw or change the bylaw, have another bylaw, um, it would be an application to amend DC2 to DC2. It runs through the same process in terms of public notifications, having a public hearing, having all the city administration review. They've got to again. do it all over again. Exactly. So I'll, I'll also advise in that process part of the reason that there weren't, um, I, I speculate that part of the reason some others were not there in objection were because they saw upgrades to the road system that we've heard many, many years of concerns about. This is the, the country estate residential that has no water, no sewer, no storm. Um, they don't have some of the basic services that adjacent neighborhoods have. And so there's, there's a desire to see improvement of some level. Hmm. So there aren't many options then other than uh, Going through the bylaw again, and then going to the community consultation, and uh, and then and, and saying that we don't have the resources to do this upgrade, and that will be included in the body body of the bylaw. Then council has to decide again, right? So. Correct. Yeah, that's true. And a, and a position may be the same or may be different, put in front of council to try to make a decision on on a new DC two. Yeah. I. I really don't know. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's a totally totally different approach there. So they have that available, but I don't know if they wanna pursue that. That's up to them. But probably I'll have an offline talk with the with the applicant just to explain them the process in more detail. You know, thank you. I you know it's uh, yeah it's 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 frustrating in a way that. Uh, we have a non oh, sorry, sorry, Councillor Caterina. Thank you, and uh, certainly understood uh, your explanation on the bylaw here, but uh, um, what, what's being applied for now? What's the development application for? The development permit is to essentially use the existing single detached home for religious assembly purposes. So it's a change in use permit, essentially to get the development permit, the reason for the application is to change the use from single det detached housing to religious assembly. 
that they're already using that for? It's non-conforming right now, is that what you're no, saying? No, the Religious Assembly group assembles at the Ellerslie Curling Club at the moment. They used to occupy the single detached home and our enforcement compliance team was called several occasions and it wasn't suitable at the time to accommodate the use. So it was sort of not, not legal. So we had um, to stop, sort of give them stop work order, I guess. Okay, um, so uh, not necessarily for this one here, but any zoning uh, approval DC2, uh, when uh, an application is made to develop anything, whether they're putting up one stick or a hundred sticks, that is the trigger? The trigger for this is the development permit, which in this instance is a change in use. And subsequent to that, if you want to alter the structure, that would also be part of a develop development permit. Okay, so with uh, this, and, and you said there's no other option here, and uh, just play devil's advocate here for a mm -hmm. second, what if they withdrew this application, just continue to use the house for their purposes? Then what would It would happen? not be in accordance with our bylaw, and they would be asked to cease doing so, and they would be fined, and they, I think, you know, we can do some court action against that type of thing. It's, it's an unsafe situation right now for the single detached house to be used for the religious assembly. That was our conversations with the applicant prior to them applying for the zoning. Okay, with uh, this, during the, uh, I'm sure they were advised by the department uh, what type of zoning to look for, were they worked with? And at the time, was there an expectation either from us or you or them that they would be uh, going ahead with a development permit for a bigger building or major? No, the, the direct control zone was crafted in such a way that they could utilize the existing structure and accommodate the on-site parking for the religious assembly. Given the fact they were also advised that things like fire protection would have to be included, on-site sewer, on-site water, upgrading the roadways, providing their proportionate share, share of these ARAs and things, all of that was outlined prior to them actually doing the direct control zoning application, which is, and Councillor, that's the reason for essentially this direct control application is because we didn't feel sort of a carte blanche religious assembly use in that location without urban services was appropriate. Okay, so as of, as of today, and maybe I should have asked the, the uh, uh, applicant here, uh, as of today, where do they hold their religious services on Fridays? Uh, again, they, they assemble at the Ellerslie Curling Rink, which is across the street from this property. Okay, so if they were to continue that until such time that they're ready for, or we're ready for an ASP, then they're okay? Um, we don't require an area structure plan. I think that um, the applicant okay. sort of just mentioned that. But at any rate, the answer to your question is, uh, between the Curling Club and the Religious Assembly Group, they have an, uh, an arrangement right now which certainly could continue, and that's third party. We, so we're they, not they, involved. Then they would have no issue, or you would have no issue. There's no development permit on the table, and they continue with uh, whatever arrangements they have now with the curling club until such time that they're prepared to do something with that home. Correct. Correct. There is, correct. a there new is building, no do whatever. Then that would trigger the... That's right. There is no timeline on the zoning. It, it's right. there forever. forever. And so the day that they put pieces together to follow through with development permit conditions, they can move ahead. So that could be now, which they have a development permit in now, and there'll be conditions outlined as per the DC2. And it could be a year from now, it could be five years from now, it could be when they're ready to advance. Okay, so then they actually have a couple of options, maybe not uh, what they like, but uh, they can reapply for a change in the DC2 to a different DC2, uh, or they can continue operating the way they've been operating with whatever terms they have with the curling club. Uh, That's correct. Which we don't, we're not aware of and we're not involved in. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, the trigger is the development permit. Yeah. Uh, so whether that was understood from the beginning or not understood from the beginning, uh, I guess has no relevance. Uh, regardless, we can't read people's minds at the time or judge their understanding of, of it, regardless of who made the decision to go ahead with 
one application or another. You are correct, and and I guess on I heard lots leading up to the break on public consultation pieces. I I am certain that with all of our applications, when we send them to planning, we also ensure that our comments are sent to the applicant or the owner of the site, whichever one is puts their name forward on the application. So we do, uh, in my mind, a good job of ensuring that whatever transportation is putting forward for a condition is also given at the same time to the owner applicant. Uh, thank you for that. And I know, Councillor Sohi, you, you're going to speak offline. I'd, I'd be happy to speak to you as well. But um, I think you've heard where we are today. All right, thank you. Uh, so we will uh, receive this for information. and. Uh, and uh, we'll have some discussion later on, probably. So, Councillor Anderson? So moved. All in favor to receive this promotion? Thank you. Carried. Okay. Uh, we are at our uh, item 6.3, which is the sidewalk construction options and policy C544. Audra, you're back. <laughs> this one will be easy, probably. <laughs> All depends on Councillor Anderson. Uh, any presentation? Any opening comments or a presentation that you have? Please, go ahead. Good afternoon. Yes, I'm back. Uh, I'm going to provide just a very short presentation with some background on the issue of sidewalks on service roads. And the presentation will also outline the options that are in the report for Council to give us some direction as to how we should proceed, uh, given that we've got some objection to a, a particular instance of a service road sidewalk and how we would go forward with the neighborhood renewal process. So very briefly, uh, we've got 11 strategic plans, implementation plans, performance monitoring plans, and city policies that are approved by City Council since 2009. And they outline Council's desire to make Edmonton a walkable city, including the way we move, which is our transportation master plan, and the Council-approved active transportation policy. The active transportation policy reflects Edmonton's sidewalk and walkability strategies in stating that the city must take advantage of the opportunity to improve the requirements for safe and accessible pedestrian routes in conjunction with construction projects. The opportunity to undertake construction of missing links in conjunction with neighborhood renewal is both an effective and efficient way to address infrastructure gaps. Over the past three years, physical infrastructure to support walkability has been successfully incorporated into a number of neighborhood renewal projects, adding sidewalk and shared use path connections, curb ramps, and improving accessibility to bus stops. Examples include the successful uh, sidewalks that have been constructed in the Meadow Arc and Sherbrooke neighborhoods, as well as the sidewalks and curb ramps and bus pads constructed to serve transit in the Eastwood, or pardon me, the Eastgate industrial area. While communities generally support the idea of improving walkability, at the implementation level, many of the compromises that must be made have unpopular impacts. These impacts include the loss of landscaping on public property and roadway boulevards. Administration and Transportation Services considers these types of stakeholder concerns when we develop the plans for neighborhood renewal projects, and every effort is made to minimize the negative impacts that result when sidewalks are retrofit into existing roadway cross sections. The Laurier Heights example highlights some of the challenges faced in delivering sidewalk infrastructure with renewal programs. So Laurier Heights is scheduled for renewal in 2014, and there's currently a six block gap in the sidewalk network along 87th Avenue, which is an arterial road, extending from 142th Street to 149th Street. In this case, the proposed sidewalk on the 87th Avenue service road has been opposed by a small group of residents. 
The primary concern is loss of landscaping, even though much of that landscaping that will be impacted is actually on road right of way. Removal or relocation of mature trees and other landscaping is only done as a last resort. Consideration is given to aligning sidewalks to avoid the need for tree removal, and in some special circumstances, sidewalks or roadways are narrowed to protect trees. In the case of 87th Avenue Service Road, the proposed trade-off is to narrow the service road. This will require a change to one-way operation and some minor inconvenience in terms of access to some of the adjacent residences. The proposed sidewalk will also be narrowed to 1.2 meters in width, which is less than the typical 1.5 meters width for sidewalks. And narrowing the roadway and the sidewalk will allow for on-street parking to be maintained and will minimize the impacts to the adjacent landscaping. Up until this point, we've had no process for exempting uh, communities from having sidewalks constructed as part of the missing, uh, part of the neighborhood renewal project. But before discussing an exemption process, I just want to clarify that not all missing links are actually addressed as part of neighborhood renewal projects. Only those links that are deemed to be essential are considered for construction. These links are considered to be critical because they address the objective of providing neighborhood connectivity to transit and other amenities where no alternative routes exist, and such is the case with the 87th Avenue service road sidewalk. If Transportation Committee desires, we've presented two options for exempting communities from sidewalk construction on service roads. In the first option, Transportation Committee could consider a community appeal on a case-by-case -case basis and direct administration whether to construct the sidewalk or not. In option two, Transportation Committee could direct administration to amend the neighborhood renewal process such that community support is sought through some type of a vote before sidewalk construction occurs. If option two is pursued, it would require consideration of who gets to vote whether it's the adjacent property owners or the community at large, and what level of support would be required for an exemption to pass. Neither option requires the amendment of the, trans or of the active transportation policy. However, administration is not recommending that an exemption procedure be pursued for the following reasons. Sidewalks provide the basic infrastructure to support pedestrians of all ages and abilities. This support is particularly important in a winter city where roadway conditions may make it impossible for pedestrians requiring mobility aids to use the road where sidewalks are lacking. Sidewalk infrastructure is not provided solely for the benefit of adjacent residents, but for all members of the community at large. And allowing exemptions from the sidewalk construction through an appeal process will lead to a sidewalk network that is inconsistent and poorly connected. So why is it important to address the gaps in our sidewalk network? Currently, we estimate that there are 3,500 kilometers of missing links in the sidewalk network. In order to rectify this lack of infrastructure, transportation services will continue to address requests for sidewalks, curb ramps, and bus stops through our capital program for active transportation. But we will continue to rely heavily on neighborhood, collector, and arterial renewal projects to contribute significantly to the city's pedestrian infrastructure. If the city does not take advantage of incorporating missing links in conjunction with neighborhood renewal, a similar cost-effective opportunity will not present itself for many decades. And that concludes my presentation. I understand there's some speakers, and then I'll be back to answer questions. Thank you. So I will uh, ask if uh, Trish Scoopis and Liam... Oh, there you are. Still here. Hello, everybody. How are we? 
I'm going to try and be really quick because... Sorry, um, I'm sorry, I got tied oh. up here. Uh, let me explain you the process very, very briefly. Uh, uh, each of you will have five minutes, <laughs> and the green light will indicate your time is starting, and uh, yellow means you have one minute remaining, and the red light means your time has expired. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I think I remember it from last time. Yeah, sure you did. So what I want to do is go through this very, very quick... No, sorry. I want to go through this very, very quickly because in September um, our group was here and we made our presentation and the conclusion of that meeting was that transportation would go back and do a new report so that council could consider whether or not the policy would get changed to allow council um, to direct um, transportation to take um, petitions and objections from. So I'm not sure. Do you want me to go through the whole thing again? Because we do. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, last year, there was a neighborhood renewal proposal at St. Rose School. We went. We listened. We found out sidewalks are going on our little service road. At this time, we're only interested in 142nd Street, six houses. And we said, pointless, waste of money, nobody uses our road. Looked online, went through all the procedures. It stated that 51% object, then no, it doesn't happen. Went to transportation, we got our... 51%, in fact, we got 99% of our six houses, one said no, and presented. We were told then, after doing that work, that um, it doesn't come under neighborhood renewal. So, little confused as to why we were told it was, and then we weren't. So, need to be clear on how you present to residents, and you have to explain it to them properly, because these are <clears throat> our homes. We invest in them. We want to know detailed information and how to deal with it. So we started the process to get in front of you guys and say we do not want sidewalks. And so why we don't want sidewalks on that one road, and I'm going to move up 87th Avenue and include that, is because nobody walks on our road. It is adjacent to a t um, heavy main road arterial busy streets 142 street 87th avenue traffic circle in the middle i'm trying to rush <laughs> and nobody walks there because what are you going to do you're going to walk down to the zoo you're going to walk out and take a nice evening walk in our nice beautiful neighborhood so nobody walks on it why would you put it there so then they said because it has to be um it has to be that's all there is to it. So I asked, how many people did, does the city have as pedestrians? We did a, a survey, and it's no traffic walks on that road. It's a funky little road, and it services entry to our homes. Now, when you actually look at the area, and you understand that little curve, 87th Avenue, and the corner, it's a very difficult little corner. And you have to kind of understand, when people come to our houses for the first time, we have to kind of direct them into how they access the road, either from, you know, the north or the south. And many people phone and say, how do we find you? It's a bit dangerous. So all of a sudden now, we're going to make our road, our avenue and our road, into a one-way street because the sidewalk is going to um, narrow the service road. So now we can only go in one way and travel south. So safety issues come about and we um, have traffic lights that are gonna needed are gonna be needed to direct because if you're coming north on one forty second street, how we get into our property is we have to go up eighty seven and we have to get in the left lane to make a turn on 145th Street, do a, an immediate 180 to drive down to get to our houses. So when you want to exit on the traffic circle and you want to turn, you have to do it at a quarter, it's, if you're in the right-hand lane, 
which is illegal, but people are going to do it because they have no choice, or if they do it on the, from the right-hand lane, they're going to do that, and then within just a short distance, they've got to move over to the right to make the turn. I mean, it's an absolute horrendous situation, and multiple accidents will happen. So, I don't know what transportation has done in that respect. Yeah, follow the walkability. If you have people that need to walk places, and there's a lot of them, you need a sidewalk. But when you've got a road where nobody walks on, you don't need a sidewalk. Plus, you've got to look at the roadways as well. Nobody's ever brought up the roadways. Am I off? Yep. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon again, councillors. Uh, Liam Crotty with the Trails, Paths and Routes Advisory Committee. Uh, regarding the proposed change in road status from two-way to one-way on 87th Ave from 142nd to 144th Streets and the proposed sidewalk installation via the Neighbourhood Renewal Project, it's the opinion of TPRAC that this proposed change should go ahead in order to facil facilitate adequate linkage, linkage for vulnerable road users in the area. Uh, this area provides no alternative options for vulnerable road users to travel except through sharing space with motor vehicle traffic. This causes a safety concern and likely discourages those of limited mobility from travel at general times as well as during winter months. Uh, if areas that do not have this kind of sidewalk linkage between neighbourhoods would wish to opt out of having active transportation infrastructure added to their street, if this was an option that was to be provided to them, there would need to be a safety audit completed on, in those areas to address safety concerns for road users as well as future residents. Uh, de decisions like this where we're looking at not allowing active transportation infrastructure to be put in, in a neighbourhood renewal in an area where there are no alternatives, these decisions can't be based made just on current residents but they need to be made on potential future residents and other road users as well within the area via Edmonton Transit, local schools. Uh, in this particular case, given that this is adjacent to an arterial route with no existing sidewalk infrastructure, along with the road use information that was provided in the report presented in September CR 596, it seems that there are both user demand and safety concerns which might indicate a need for proposed infrastructure installation. Uh, especially via the one proposal that had the uh, road narrowing down and becoming a one-way street with less impact on the uh, property owner's uh, landscaping that they had. So I think that was a valid proposal put forward. Um, all neighbourhoods going through the renewal process should become interconnected with neighbourhoods surrounding them via active transportation options. Uh, that is part of the seniors, city's senior strategic, strategic plans, the ways which underwent that public consultation and really addresses and allows the safe travel of all road users throughout our city, including the vulnerable road users. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions to... Oh, Councillor Oshry. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, and thank you ladies in the back there for coming all the way from the West End to speak about this. I hope the bike lanes were useful for you. Um, so, question for you. So, so when this first, um, yes, I'm sorry, sorry. Um, Ms. Gubis, Ms. Gubis, yes. So, when you first talked to transportation about this, and I understand there is some concerns about the trees and the bushes and the mature and then, um, and then, but although it's city property, correct? Like, on the, like the edge of the road is is, oh, no, is that still my property, or is that city? Property? I'll, you know, I'll ask administration that. Yeah. Um, but, you, but, but you had concerns about that, and they, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but then you talked about, uh, th sorry, they they suggested that they could narrow the, narrow the sidewalk, correct? And then you had concerns with that, and they, and they said, well, we can narrow the bear, the uh, boulevards. Is that, is that a? Said they couldn't. Narrow they couldn't. Them. Okay, but so, but then you had concerns with the, with the parking that you would lose the parking, and so their solution would be to make it a one way. Then you'd have the parking and sidewalks and mature and keep the vast majority of the mature trees. Is that? If you think that the trees will live, yeah, I don't. But 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so how, how did you find that consultation process, by the way? Because that's been a theme for us. So with the transportation department. Um, One-sided. Um, <clears throat> Dale Lehman, who was so attentive and really tried hard, and we really like him, and he was so good to come out to our property and have a look, listen to our concerns, and then we all ranted and raved, and let me tell you, you get a bunch of people, it's a tough deal for the city folk when you've got everybody with a different idea. But at the end of it, so I said, okay, so now what? He said, nothing. I said, what do you mean, nothing? He said, it continues on. It's been written, it's been approved, nothing you say, nothing you do, whatever you feel, Nothing can be done. It's happening, Trish, so you might as well just accept it and get on with it. Okay, so right. that's good feedback. Um, so how does that road get used now from pedestrians? I mean, you, I mean, there's no road. Oh, sorry, there's no sidewalk. There's a bus stop there, so, I mean, pedestrians are there walking in front of your house on the, ro on the, on the service oh, yeah. road? It's really very community, and we do a lot of gardening on our street, it's, you know, and... It's a very communal community, and we say hello, and everybody walks down there, and it's just but, really nice. But they're walking on the road, correct? Oh, I yeah, mean, obviously, I love it. And I've gone out. I mean, I have put a, pretty much my whole summer into talking to everybody that walked. My office is not in my company's office. It's in my house, so I'm there, and I keep my window, and as soon as I hear anybody coming... I go out and go hi, blah, blah, blah. Okay. If we were to put a sidewalk down here, <clears throat> eh, what would you do? Would you, would you walk on it? And I've always done it in a manner not to sway either way. I've just been so, very... Um, so very I can cut you off another question. So, so I had a conversation yesterday or the day before with the president of the Community League, Mr. Henniger, and I asked him what the Community League the community in general has thought is because, you know, the way I look at it, it's not just the sidewalk for the residents whose house happens to be behind it. It's for the, the neighbors in general. And I'm not sure if you'd be surprised to know, but he said that generally the community is in favor of putting sidewalks there so people could walk, you know, down to the zoo or the IGA or, I mean, event, I, mean I know there's no sidewalks on the other side of the road, but other side of the traffic circle. Yeah. So, so what, what would you think about, I mean, what do you think about that? that he, I mean, well, he, he suggested to me that the, the majority of the community in general would be in favor of adding more sidewalks. Um, I think in certain areas, I, I firmly believe in safety and having sidewalks, and I support it 100%, as do all of my, uh, my neighbors. But on this particular stretch around the corner, yeah, if anybody walked on it, I'd be saying, you know what, guys? People need a sidewalk because they're walking on this, and you can't ignore. You've got to put in a sidewalk. <laughs> Bring the traffic down. They don't walk on our road. It's the people in, in our little community. So, um, I put in a survey, and I don't know if it's lost, but it goes with the uh, different, uh, the first time. And I actually counted how many people. I hired two students so, and sat them on my front uh, lawn, and I paid them. Can, um, can I just cut you off? Do it. Sorry, excuse There's me. Nobody I'm running out of time. One more question for you. What is your biggest concern for putting in the sidewalk? Is it the fact that you're now going to have to shovel it? Is it the cost that you have to bear because of this new sidewalk? Is it, or is it losing, making that road now a one way? Um, actually, sidewalk shoveling couldn't give a damn because I don't shovel. I have a company. They do it. Makes no difference. Put it in. My guys will shovel. Um, so, Walking so down the road. What's your one concern with having the sidewalk there? One concern? The, the, the biggest concern. I think it's accessing my home and danger of losing my trees. I think, and everybody would say the same thing. I want to be able to drive home as easy as every single one of you. And I have to say, can I? I'm worried about the collisions that will occur because they will occur. I've lived there, these people have lived there, and we have enough that come on that, and boom. I've had a tree completely knocked out on the boulevard because of a collision. And Thank I you. don't want to create a situation to me. Councillor Esselinger. Oh.
Thank you, and we, we certainly appreciate uh, you taking the time to explain the situation to us. Now, we are in uh, possession here of a copy of your, um, looks like the petition. And um, I, I'm just Which curious, petition? pardon? The 87%? Yes. Okay, yeah. I, I'm curious why you did that, because you had just mentioned that the gentleman that came out to look at your property said, we're just going in this direction. So. I'm not sure why you went ahead with the petition or what advice you were given on that. Okay. Um, I said, what do we do? And he said, the only way to change it is to get in front of council. So I started and we got in front of council in September. And when we came here, um, it was stated that um, if it was going to be where neighborhoods and residents could appeal and object, that a petition would have to be presented and it was discussed, not decided upon, that if 75% of the neighborhood did not want um, it to happen, whatever it was going to be, um, reconstruction of whatever, that really, if 75% said no, they don't want it, that that should be a good number. So after September, and I'm not sure which one, because six houses um well i know it was you that brought that up but have you got the petition there for six houses or do you have the one for 34 okay 37 so then we left that meeting and in september um shirley coglin my next door neighbor and i we um, went and started to get um, the signatures and we ended up with 89 percent of 87th Avenue and 142nd that said no. And the only ones we couldn't get um, were houses empty, two people, we never could get a hold of them. And one person says no. And in transportation's report, that one person uh, said because it's difficult for them to walk. And just so you know, that they told me that it doesn't make any difference to them because if it's turned into one way, they live near the end, so they're, they're just going to come the wrong way to go into their property, so really they don't give a damn. So there we are. Okay, I, I, because we are looking at public consultation, so I was just trying to understand what you were told when you, that was generated. Um, and I, too, was wondering about uh, the sidewalks, because right now with the service road, none of the neighbors have to clear a pathway for people to walk down that road. But if there's a sidewalk, then the clearing would happen, which would make it available for people to walk. Um, but that's not your concern. Your concern is really about the one way. Is Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, clearing the snow. I mean, everybody clears snow. We live in Edmonton, Alberta. So whether someone does it for us, we do it ourselves. We've got to keep our sidewalks clear forever in my life. I've kept mine clear and has my neighbor, neighbors. So that's not a concern. Safety around the traffic circle when we're trying to maneuver and trees. I mean, you cannot. It's a crime against nature to kill trees like that. They're all over Laurier. It makes our neighborhood absolutely beautiful. And I firmly do believe that I and my neighbors live in the best neighborhood. And you cannot kill our trees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kubis, uh, so if uh, the, the traffic issues uh, can be dealt with, right, that alleviates one of your concerns. We will ask the administration if that can be dealt with. Yeah, you know, they can put Turning it. in and, uh, you know, uh, you talked about accident, uh, the collisions. If that issue be dealt with, you'll be, that's one issue. Yeah. The second one is the trees, right? Yeah. And if the trees can be saved, right, you're okay with having a sidewalk? No, I'm not okay, no. So your problem is sidewalk. No, so your problem is side, not having a sidewalk. You don't want a sidewalk. We don't want a sidewalk. We don't want our road narrowed. We don't want to have to drive one way. Okay. And if you look after the safety concerns and make sure nobody dies, hey, I'm definitely in favor of that one. No, I just wanted to be absolutely clear. Yeah. It's not the traffic issues that uh, we can that can be alleviated. Uh, if they can be alleviated, it's not the trees only. Your issue is that you don't want a sidewalk. It's a 
collection and nothing is ever that easy to say one point. Um, cookie cutting things, um, it just doesn't work. The other, the other item, if I might add, if you go north of the traffic circle into Parkview, they've had their service road, 142nd Street, on the west side um, done and it's lovely and they have no sidewalks and it's two-way traffic and it runs completely in 57 years that that service road has been 87th 142nd in 57 years the percentage of accidents that have happened is zero so i don't know why ma'am i have two more questions okay sorry uh you go for a walk right do I? Yeah. Um, no. I'm pretty sure your neighbors do go for a walk. Shirley right? goes for a walk. I yeah. work and I am on my computer. I don't. I wanted to ask you that if you have a choice of a service road to walk on or a sidewalk to walk on, what would you choose? Oh, I could just go on the service road. Even if it's not cleared of snow. Yeah, because I used to walk. I had two dogs. They've since died. And they used to, I used to walk them every day. And yeah, I, would, I wouldn't use the sidewalk. I went every day down to Laurier off leash, and that's where we walked. And our neighborhood, if anybody knows it, our walk areas are beautiful, and that's where you go to walk. You don't walk by car fumes and a traffic circle. My dogs didn't like it. Mr. Crotty and the. Uh on the exemptions issue, uh, the, there are close to uh, 3,500 kilometers of missing sidewalk links in our city, right? If we look at exempting based on uh, adjacent properties opposition to it, I can understand if the whole neighborhood is uh, against it and they're consulted, then it's different things. There's got to be broader reasons, reasons to that. What kind of precedent do we set? Uh, uh, I just want to understand uh, giving that kind of, uh, I'm all for choice, right? But uh, uh, having that kind of flexibility where a few people who are directly being impacted, which I absolutely understand, have the ability to uh, modify a policy citywide policy that talks about building sidewalk connections. While Trish and her neighbors certainly are the most directly impacted, in situations like this and where we're talking about vital areas where there is no current linkage and we have the opportunity to link neighborhoods with transportation infrastructure for vulnerable road users, we can't have a smaller group of people who will not always be in that area setting the precedent and setting or just simply setting that precedent to not allow that infrastructure to be put in place. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just going to ask, you, you answered Councillor Sohi and I think I heard two different things, so I just want to clarify. Do you, do you believe that having a sidewalk results in a safer area for pedestrians? Or would you, do you believe a service road is safer for pedestrians? It depends what the usage is. Okay. And you can't sort of do it a sidewalk is safer on our road, no. Okay. Now, you mentioned that a lot of people don't walk there. Do you think it's maybe because you don't have a sidewalk? No. Okay. Uh, no, I, I wanted to know that because, I mean, you mentioned Parkview, which is my neck of the woods, just on the other side, and then I would say that based off what I've heard from Parkview, they wish they did now have a sidewalk on that. There's a reason I don't walk along 87th Avenue, because there is no sidewalk, personally. I don't feel safe walking on the service road. Now, I realize we might have a difference of opinion on that, but that I, I, from what I've heard on the other side, just on the other side, that's not the case. They would have preferred to have it. I know in Metal Arc, where we just did it, the min referenced it um, six years ago, um, again, there was initially a little bit of pushback, but now that it's there, I think the community in general is very supportive of it. Um, so I understand it can be challenging. I just, I was curious as to why you think one might be safer over another. It seems like typically sidewalks would always be safer. Can I make a comment? Sure, please. On, yeah. on your side, mm -hmm. um, there's not as many um, trees, mm -hmm. number one. 
Plus, you're close to IGA yeah. and the bank, so because it's only almost less than a block for a lot of people, they just walk down there. From our end, it's way too far. You know, when you're busy people and to walk all the way from south side to IGA, you don't do it. Okay. You drive. The other question I was going to ask, you mentioned about the traffic coming off and turning left onto 145th. Um, you know, I typically, I, well, I, I've driven it, I've taken the bus along quite a few times. Um, the majority of the traffic traveling along 147 going northbound is, is exiting right onto 87th Ave, which means they have to take that right lane. Um, so with that in mind, you know, because everyone has to take that right lane, you still have a full three blocks to e enter into the left lane. Nobody's coming off on the inside lane. So I guess you'd mentioned there was a concern of having to come off and then merge into the left lane, when in reality, from my understanding, there's, at least from what I've seen, there hasn't been very much. So okay. I'd like you to comment on that if you don't mind. Um, so what you need to do, yeah. and anybody else that is questioning that, you need to get on 140 session coming from downtown at rush hour yeah. when the traffic goes all the way almost to Stony Plain. Yeah. Probably 95th is a fair evaluation and it's backed right up and you need to be there and you need to drive and you need to make that right hand turn and you're in the right hand lane and you have to get over to the left hand lane and make the turn and then you come back and you tell me is there a concern? Okay. Yeah, you have to experience it. And let me tell you guys, I have studied this thing inside outside because mm -hmm. I, I don't like being wrong. I don't want to come here, embarrass myself and be wrong. I've sat in that lineup, in that traffic jam, 10 times to prove my point to myself so I can say it to you. It is hell. Yeah. No, no, that's fair. I appreciate that. I, I mean, I, I have done that, so I, I would yeah. potentially I have a different view, but that's fair. Um, I guess the last question is from, from what everyone else has been saying. So even if we were able to keep the trees and, and uh, make sure we have the proper safety, you still wouldn't accept the sidewalk? No. Okay. So I, I guess then the follow-up question is, would that, I mean, do you think that's, should we take that same approach across the city if, if you know, because the Laurier Heights Community League, from what I've talked to, has said in general they support it. Um, so should we, is that the precedent we do want to set? Do you think that's fair that we should be setting up a precedent where a select group uh, along a roadway can have that? I think you have to look at and you have to understand that corner of the world. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't open up for easy access to our homes. It's not walked on. And it is unique. Yeah. So when you find one that doesn't hit the cookie cutter yeah. and is a straight road that people walk on, yeah, those ones, it's night and day, clear, black and white. Sure. But when you get into, it's almost like a, a, a boutique situation. It's, it's kind of all different ways and different areas. Mm -hmm. You've got to make exceptions. You can't just say the rule is be done with it. I'm not going to be inconvenienced, which I might be if you vote. I thought it was already sort of set that it wasn't going to happen and all we we're going to do is uh, make a change to the policy so we could do what we're doing or trying to do. Um, Mayor Mandel even came to my house and said, Trish, I'm so sorry, you know, that you've had to go through this. How silly. Nobody would ever walk on a sidewalk. But, you know, that's in the olden days. It's not today. But, yeah, you've got to look at each situation and you cannot just put a, a rule in and, and expect people to be inconvenienced. And if I can't get into my house that I'm paying taxes on, boom. No. Sorry. Sorry, no, I'm out of time. I, thank I you, though. Time. Thank you. Anybody else? Constant Katrina. I talk way too much. I do know that. Sorry. Oh, don't worry about that. You're good. You're right. So I am. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you say to me. <laughs> uh, go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Put your light on. Um, how many houses on your block that this affects? Um, on 142nd, it's six houses. Yeah. And on 87th Avenue, it is 31. 30 okay. Um, and with the neighborhood, it's a part of a neighborhood renewal. Uh, have you been asked, uh, I should know this, but have you been asked to pay 50% of the sidewalks? Uh, no. Nope. Okay. That's good to hear. No. 
How if come? ever I want one and I need to pay for it, I will. Okay, I'm going to ask administration that question as well. Uh, on that, on why this doesn't, uh, we don't apply the 50-50. I understand that. Uh, we're paying for decorative lighting and we're fine, yeah. Okay. On that, and uh, the, uh, when, when is this scheduled to be uh, done? What, what have you been told? It was going to be spring of this year, but I highly doubt at this point. So April, May of 2014, but I don't think it'll happen that soon now. Okay, well, the neighborhood, nor normally neighborhood renewal would start in the spring, whenever mm -hmm. the weather uh, allows it to uh, Probably in, start. but not our road. Uh, okay. I think it's going to be backed up a bit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, okay, thank you so much. Do yeah, I thank you so much. Disappear now? Yes, please. And I will go back to administration. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. No, yet. Okay, uh, I'll probably go first. Uh, there, the the traffic issues, the getting in, getting out, and uh, and the and the collision, possible collisions that uh, was talked about. Can you tell me the uh, what are the challenges there? Like, uh, what is how real is it, and uh, what can be done in order to alleviate those concerns? Councilor Sully, we haven't actually done any counts, but we had some information that has been forwarded from the community. During the three days that they observed the road, I believe there was 30 vehicles in total using the, that bit of the service road. My understanding is that only four of those vehicles were westbound, so those would be the only four that would be impacted by the one-way eastbound uh, change. So you're talking about very small amount of traffic that would be impacted. Uh, I don't believe that there is a significant safety issue associated with traveling on that service road or entering into it. And uh, about the trees and how much disruption will be to the, uh, uh, to the, to the front yards of uh, the, uh, the people being impacted? So one of the reasons why the, uh, it's proposed to narrow the service road is basically to minimize the impact on the landscaping. So we're going to, we would take the curb out and then start from the back of the curb and build the sidewalk. So you will, you will continue, you will allow them to continue to use the cities right away where they have built uh, landscaping, right? So, you, so you're not taking that out? No, no. So even though that's a, that's a kind of concession as well, because we don't, we, we had this debate about uh, top of bank, uh, 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 and encroachments, and we forced people to, uh, you know, take out their landscaped backyards because they were encroaching onto uh, onto city property. But here, you're 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 giving that concession. You, you will continue them allowed to use that space, even though it's not there to use. That's correct. Right. So I think we need to understand that too. Right. So uh, so did you talk to the wider community? About this, what do the wider community think about it? In that area? Well, well, the uh, for the neighborhood renewal process, we go out a couple years before construction to start a dialogue with the community league. Uh, you know, transportation planning is involved, and uh, one of the things that we do is we look at missing links. Uh, what what would be a important uh, connection to put in? It's important to note that those are uh, paid for by the transportation department. Uh, many years ago, we used to assess those through a local improvement, but now now we're paying for those. Uh, all the reconstruction sidewalk is the 50-50 cost share. Right, but how, what, the, what does the community think about having a sidewalk there, I think, not having a sidewalk? I think the plan was shown uh, a couple times to the community, and, and they were uh, for it. And the plan? Well, overall, yeah. And the plan included a sidewalk? Yes. Okay, all right. I'm quickly out of time. I don't know why. Uh, Councillor Esslinger. Thank you, uh, and I would like to talk about the public consultation as well through the neighborhood renewal process and um, just trying to understand what they were told when they went through the neighborhood renewal and how much decision-making power they had. Because were you given, did you tell them that we were doing a sidewalk but there was no 
chance to input it. They pick their lights. I'm just trying to understand. Uh, the process that we go through is, uh, is to go out and talk to the community and see what needs that they think they have is for, to get some ideas of what improvements we can make because we know we're in a neighborhood, takes us a couple of years, and then we're not coming back for a long time. So what we do is, is uh, meet with them early to allow us to in incorporate those aspects into, uh, into the design. When it comes to something like the sidewalk network, we, we look to transportation planning to give us guidance in roads design and construction as far as what they think is a critical link, missing link. And we present that uh, to the community, get feedback. We, uh, we then go through with the local improvement notices that actually just got mailed out here on Monday. So uh, we follow up with a, a meeting, I think scheduled for next Thursday, which is basically us going out and explaining the local improvement process, how to protest and things like that if they don't want their sidewalks reconstructed. But for the, the critical links that the city is going to pay for, those are the ones that we, we feel that we need to do for the overall network. Uh, my concern in this is just what the community understands when we go out to do it because they, they obviously feel they, they have objected to it and what exactly what they were told. And, we have to be very clear on our communications and that was my concern through this process. So you feel confident that you explained that this is what was going to happen and they understood it. I just want to make sure. Um, I can tell you that uh, there are five other neighborhoods that we've actually done sidewalk on service roads over the past, uh, since 2012. So it's a change for people. We understand that. Um, Especially if you're going to convert a two-way road to a one-way road that we we do understand there's a change uh, I can tell you though that the ones that we've done we've got very little uh, Negative feedback after the sidewalks have been uh, installed uh, Same with the construction program when you close a road There's an initial period where people have to make a change and adjust their routes But once they do things settle down and they find the safest way to you know to get in and out of where they got the way, where they have to go yeah, it's uh, once it's done, the things will settle down, but they're not settled down at first. It concerns me what we're telling people. I think sometimes we we raise their expectations through public consultations, and so that that's my concern. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walters. Oh, Councillor Anderson. Can I get the clerk to put the motion up on the screen, please? I'm going to make a motion and then ask a couple of questions and speak to it. The administration provide a report outlining amendments to the neighborhood renewal process to allow for seeking exemptions of sidewalk installation adjacent to service roads through a process similar to the local improvement process and include an option that allows the majority of impacted property owners abutting a service road with no existing sidewalk to determine whether a new sidewalk is to be installed or not. I'm not talking about houses with no sidewalk facing a busy road. I'm talking about houses who for 40 years, for 56 years, have faced a service road separating them completely from a busy arterial. Over three days and 30 hours, the average number of vehicles on the service road per hour is 0.6, seven per day. The number of people who use the road are also in percentages of one, parts of one per hour. They have lived there for, and I'm sure everybody on service roads, because we're not doing a lot of service roads in new neighborhoods. <clears throat> I have a 20 and a 17 year old grandson and granddaughter who have lived their entire life in a neighborhood with no sidewalks and they haven't had a close call yet. Uh, according to our circumstance, not having a sidewalk would put them in, in jeopardy or in peril. I, I think that people facing a, a service road, not a regular road, should be given the same opportunity 
as exists with the local improvement exemption. And I'm making this motion. Thank you. So, uh, if this passes, right, and uh, no sidewalk is constructed uh, uh, on uh, uh, adjacent to the properties affected, is there a sidewalk on 87th Avenue that people can use? No, there's not. Because right. I think uh, Councillor Anderson is making an assumption that uh, every service road will have an adjacent sidewalk. I'm never, I'm not making that okay. So that means the option would be that you will people in that area wouldn't have a sidewalk at all. They will be expected to walk. Okay, they will be expected to walk on the on the uh, on the service road, Absolutely. right? Okay. Do we clear service roads, of no? Not typically. Typically when, in the city snow control policy, when the local roads are cleared? Uh, Councillor Sohi, we treat that uh, as a residential road, so when we do a residential... So we just to scrape it. It's, it's correct. It's just bladed down to uh, our snow policy guide. So if we are going to give this relaxation and this ability for homeowners to decide whether they want to have a sidewalk or not, should we not also expect that they clear part of the service road? <laughs> I'm just being facetious here. Because I think we're setting double standards. That's my problem with this. I think uh, we're having different expectations from different people about uh, making ability um, a choice for people to walk on sidewalks and uh, and taking the ability away. Because the, the sidewalk is not only for people. Nobody walks on my sidewalk. It exists. Should I put planters on it? That's my problem. The sidewalk is not for the people or adjacent property owners. The sidewalk is for the community. So maybe I'm going to amend this motion to, uh, to include that, uh, that we allow, uh, this is the, include an option that allows the majority of impacted property owners averting a service road. What I'm going to amend is that allow the majority of community members within that homeowners, within that community to decide whether a sidewalk should be built abutting a service road. Because that way I think it will be more of an inclusive approach, more uh, uh, at least and people will understand that if they are unable to have a sidewalk, then they will know the consequences. Yeah. So, uh, Mayor, Mayor Avison. Well, on, on the amendment, I, I understand where you're going with this, and I, I agree with the point that you're making, because the, the sidewalk is a, is a public work. It's not a, it's not a private amenity that the immediate adjacent uh, owner is the primary beneficiary of. It's a, it's, a, it's a public asset as part of a transportation network, and that's, that's the spirit behind which um, the policy uh, you know, that's the spirit that the policy rests on that's in our sidewalk strategy, which, um, you know, again, that's four or five years ago that council did that work, but the sidewalk strategy calls for a network to benefit the community. So I, I, I agree with your point. My concern is that if we start doing it this way, we're pitting neighbor against neighbor uh, rather than the city just being consistent in its decisions. And I think our policy is clear, and our policy is that where we have broken links, uh, in the pedestrian network, we will fix that. And we will fix it at the city's expense, which is at all of our expense, but we won't burden people with the local improvement. So I think that's a reason, reasonable saw off here. Um, and even where we have the local improvement option, um, and there is the, uh, the opportunity for neighbors to petition to say, okay, we don't want the sidewalk upgraded, the city doesn't let the sidewalk wither into gravel and then back into you know, um, pre-biblical dirt. What we do is we maintain the sidewalk in a safe and passable condition for the benefit of pedestrians in the community because the top principle there is safe and passable pedestrian network for everybody. 
And that's, again, that's the same motivation for why we would, why the sidewalk strategy says addressing missing links is important. And then I think administration has the right approach here, which is to say, well, we're in a neighborhood anyway, pouring concrete and doing work that we ought to make the upgrades um, in the most cost effective and integrated way possible, which is what we're doing neighborhood renewal. And so, so with or without the amendment, I, I'm not going to support the motion because I think Oh, okay. Well, then, well, I'm speaking. I'm speaking I was to both. Making a point. I'm speak. I'm speaking to both because a, a road, a road is not um, a safe space for a pedestrian, uh, even at the best of times. And the, a, um, a service road may be one of our least busy roads. But unless we're prepared to try to clear that to bare surface and make it. Uh, or sand it and make it safe and level and passable, not just for pedestrians, but people in wheelchairs, mothers with strollers, people with a variety of mobility issues, There's the space that our sidewalks are set aside for, and I don't think we're going to do that, then, then I think what we should do is, is uh, apply consistency and, and apply the principles in the sidewalk strategy. And if we follow all of that, as administration is recommending, then we would put sidewalks in here. And I appreciate the work administration has done to try to mitigate and reduce the impact on landscaping, and I recognize that comes with some trade-offs in the one way, but um, so so I'm I'm happy to receive the report for information and carry on with the work um, as proposed, uh, and I will not be supporting this motion. Wait, wait a minute, I'm one. I'm on. Councillor Nickel. Jeez, can't let go. First of all, uh, Councillor Sorgi, as the communities in Bloom champion, I would encourage you at any time. To plant flowers in front of your house. I do. And I, I'm I, with, as, I, I on the side as you can. <laughs> on the side and, and, and that would be a good thing. So, that pitch aside. <laughs> now, let's, let's uh, I'm just, I want to talk a little bit up a level about the policy in general. I have a specific case here with Don and School where I have the constituents not wanting a sidewalk. It's, they're going through a neighborhood renewal. The school, I believe, I'm just waiting for the letter, doesn't want the sidewalk across because of safety issues. And they don't feel they have an appeal process to bring this forward and the city says, nope, the sidewalk's going in. And it's really a sidewalk to nowhere. It's not connecting to anything, it's just we have to put the sidewalk uh, in because it's by the school. And so my question to uh, administration is if the school doesn't want it, if the citizens don't want it, uh, that are affected by it. I got the pictures here and everything. Um, what would, it, would, what would, what should happen next? Should it just too bad, or it, can we talk about putting in an appeal process uh, for some of these um, other situations? I think uh, our message to council today is that we would appreciate some direction. If you would like us to implement an appeal process. We can look at how that should be done within the neighborhood renewal process. Um, but up till this point in time, our direction from council has been not to have an exemption process. Okay. Uh, just to speak to this, um, I would support council, if I was on the committee, I would support Councillor Anderson's motion for a whole host of reasons. But I, I would like the Transportation to Committee perhaps to consider uh, an appeal process for where sidewalks don't make sense. And that one, the one size uh, fits all policy, there, there are exceptions to the rule. And that putting some guidelines and an appeal process in is just, just makes good customer sense. Um, I have a case here where the signatures are there, the, the letters are here. Uh, it's, a, it's a sidewalk to nowhere kind of situation. They're saying, why spend the money? And um, trying to get some common sense to that. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor uh, Walters. Just a quick question. Let's walk back 57 years for fun. Why, why were they built that way? What was the f philosophy behind that kind of planning? And what's changed? I, I think if you look at how the city has evolved over the years, uh, certainly the recognition of options for transportation, like walking, was not as prevalent as it was or as it is today. I, I think it was a different time and people 
had less vehicles, maybe more people walked in general. I I'm, can't speak to how the planning went 57 years ago, but uh, certainly as you look at how the city has evolved, we've got neighborhoods with no sidewalks, we've got neighborhoods with sidewalks on both sides of every road, and we've got a whole bunch of neighborhoods somewhere in between that with sidewalks here and there and a few missing links. So it's, and I understand it's really about completing that network, that pedestrian-oriented network in every neighborhood. That's what the policy is about. That is what our sidewalk strategy says, is mm -hmm. we're trying to give people reasonable options for walking on a sidewalk. So it's not a sidewalk on every side of every road, but it's trying to create some proximity of sidewalks to all residents and for people of all abilities. So, I, and forgive me if this was asked earlier, because it might have been, but I, the, the claim around increased collisions, so where you've in, installed sidewalks or filled in missing links, what have you learned? Is, is that, can you verify that there are actually increased collisions? I, I will be honest to say I haven't studied that, but we have not heard anecdotally that we've increased collisions by adding sidewalks. I'm good. Councillor Ashley, go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, um, just to administration, a quick question. I was looking at Google Earth, and there's there is a bus stop, correct, on 87th Avenue that people would have to walk on the on the service road in order to access. Yes, there are bus stops. Yeah. So, okay. So they, okay. Um, so just to speak to this, I mean, this is in my ward, and ladies, thank you very much for coming and uh, taking the time and effort. Um, unfortunately, I, I I can't support this. I think we do also need to have um, sidewalks connecting for everybody. Uh, and I know change is tough sometimes, but when I look at your neighborhood and the fact that we're not going to be really be um, affecting your landscaping, you know, a little bit of one-way car traffic, I understand, is going to be a little bit different than it is now. Um, but when I, you know, I live in a cul-de-sac, quite a deep cul-de-sac that has no sidewalks. And when I wa and I go for walks with my kids all the time, and when I walk in and out of my cul-de-sac, for the life of me, I am paranoid that someone's going to come flying into my cul-de-sac and take out one of my kids or somebody in my family because there's no sidewalk for us to walk on. And I think that's a mistake for the city. Um, and, and I wish we had sidewalks in my cul-de-sac, as, as an aside. And when I look at your neighborhood and, and the fact that there's no sidewalks up to the IGA, I think that's, in, in Andrew's, uh, to Andrew's point, uh, Councillor Knack's point, sorry, um, you know, I think more people would be walking to the IGA if there were sidewalks there, as an example. So. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I can't support it. I, I do think that we need to have a common theme in the city where we have uh, access to transit, access pedestrians, access to what the mayor said to, uh, you know, people that need, you know, wheelchairs, that sort of thing. Um, and I don't think we can leave it up to a small group of citizens to um, make decisions that may, might be better for them, but not necessarily better for their community. And, uh, uh, and I think we need to have a consistent plan in the city and, uh, and that would uh, include sidewalks all around. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I'm just to speak to this. I'd be very worried if this went through, having gone through this with a neighborhood where this was a contentious issue in Windsor Park. We had them here in front of us. And, and the, the problem was that the issue of the people that were going to be getting sidewalks that weren't there before were very different from the other people in the neighborhood who wanted to be able to walk to the River Valley. And these were important bits of connectivity that were not there. And because the policy was in place and because there was clarity about the project in place, we were able to work with the community to come up with a solution that abided by the policy and created the connectivity, but was able to adapt to some of the other concerns we were hearing. But I don't think we would have got there if we didn't have, if we, if we allowed the people in one part of a neighborhood to speak for the, because it was in front of them, to speak for the interests of the whole neighborhood, which is essentially the conflict you create with this then it, it's much, much harder and you will, create, you will create grief and turmoil in a community and we will end up with connectivity in some places and not in other places. Uh, I, I think it opens a door that would, makes it much harder to work out something that ultimately works for everybody. And my experience in Windsor Park is because we had clear policy behind us, we were able to work out something that everybody was able to be okay with in the end. And in the one instance in Windsor Park where maybe it didn't really make sense for anybody, um, we, the policy still allowed us to be a little bit creative, and I think maybe this is part of the lesson for all of us, a little bit creative to go, look, this isn't really a missing sidewalk. Yeah, it's only to the benefit of the four people that are living on the street. If they don't want it, 
they're affecting people for forever on that street because we won't get back to do it for another 40 years. And, and so in some ways they are dealing with other people. But, but uh, I, I, my, I think it would have been very, very hard. And I and, you know, bless the community president on that one because he took it as much as I did and, uh, and was prepared to stick by policy and really work with the community. Uh, we would have been up against it if there hadn't been clear policy in place. And I think this muddies the water in a serious way. Thank and you, Councillor. Councillor Esselinger. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Councillor Neck. You haven't had a chance yet. I'll just be brief, and I just want to, I mean, I appreciate that there's definitely local concerns specifically right within the, those particular houses, but I have to concur with um, Councillor Oshry and Councillor Henderson. This, um, I know that having spoke with the Community League president, it's, it's something that the Community League supports, and we even have to look beyond that. We want to create a walkable city, um, and I do believe we need to support that with proper sidewalks throughout all areas. Um, the fact that Metal Arcaza, we were one of the first, I think you would mentioned, when that started on some service roads, it's, it's very beneficial now to the community, and uh, I know it's going to cause a bit of short-term pain, and I, I, I know that's tough. Uh, and that's challenging, and uh, I hope that going forward over the coming years, just like we did in Metal Arc, we see that as a huge benefit now to the community because a lot more people are walking through the neighborhood. So I uh, just wanted to say... Uh, I, I, say Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Esselinger. Thank you, and I certainly am struggling with this one, but when I look at the big picture, I think we want a walkable city. I think we want the connectivity, and uh, I know that many of the... The residents have lived there for 57 years, but they may not live there the next 57 years. And as we have people uh, moving into the neighborhood, I think they may want a sidewalk and they may want that connectivity. Um, and I think we are, from what I've heard, being flexible and not taking their, their trees out. Um, so I don't think I could support this amendment or this motion. My concern was really about neighborhood renewal and having processes and how to hear the public engagement. We heard that through the bike lanes. How do we engage your public best? And I, I still think we have to work on our communication, but for this motion, I will not support it. Well, I'll, I'll speak to this as uh, quickly as well. Uh, uh, I will not support it either. Um, I think we need to be consistent. We have a policy to create connectivity, and there's about 3,500 kilometer missing linkage that we have to build. And if we have this kind of uh, ability for uh, adjacent property owners to determine whether they're going to have a sidewalk or not, I think we'll have a very inconsistent, inconsistent approach to uh, uh, dealing with it. Uh, uh, I. Uh, I'll ask the administration, and you've been working with the neighbors, that please, please continue to work with them, uh, mitigate the impact related to the traffic or the, uh, the collisions that they have, or uh, 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 preserving the uh, frontage, uh, the trees, and, uh, and the landscaping. I'm pretty sure you continue to do that, and, uh, and also giving them the ability to uh, enjoy the... Uh, uh, enjoy the frontage that they enjoy now, right? And uh, so, uh, but I, I, I can't support that despite the fact that there's impact on the, uh, on the adjacent property owners. So this is more about the mobility in the neighborhood, not just about the, the residents uh, abutting uh, uh, the, uh, the proposed sidewalk. Councillor uh, Anderson. To close, we've had a 20-foot wide sidewalk called a service road for the entire time they lived there. We've got 3,499 kilometers of sidewalk that people are asking for, and yet we're going to force people who don't want it to go to the top of the list. Uh, this motion would make it consistent. Everybody who faced a service road would have an option to have a sidewalk if the group wanted it, or not to have a sidewalk if the group didn't want it. I think it makes sense, and I'm going to support it. Sorry, we have a motion on the floor. All in uh, favor of the motion? Opposed? Opposed? So four opposed. And well, thank you so much. We have uh, one more item left. Oh, it was uh, even though there was a motion defeated. Well, we should still receive. Do Do we still have to receive this for this in report for information? So well, moved. There was no motion passed. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, we received this information. Uh, all in favor? All in favor? Carried. Opposed? Opposed? Oh, well, opposed. Councilor Anderson is opposed. I thought you always supported information, Brian. Like, uh, 
Michael, uh, Michael, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We are going into private. Oh, before we go into private. Oh, yeah, we have that. Sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. We got the bus facility yet. I thought you resolved that issue, Mr. Stolte. We did, uh, Mr. Chairman. However, we just want to make sure we um, close the loop. Okay. Please, go ahead. Uh, just a brief overview, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, we were requested back in September of 2013 to uh, join up with Sustainable uh, Development. Can you just, uh, Councillor Ashri, can you just step out with the, with the rest of the group, please, so there's less uh, disruption here? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, we were requested to um, ask me to intervene um, on this project and speak with the developers, sustainable development, and transportation planning and transit planning. And we did so and we sat down and looked at a modern and future planning opportunities with regards to the Grease Bus site and the LRT um, running north and south through the area. And we came up with an option that we do not put a terminal in the, in the site itself, but we use a looping facility off-street parking um, through the area. We think that matches um, our long-term goals with our bus system, and we're not going to be routing up through, and it'll ease the congestions in and out of the, the Griesbach area. Okay, Councillor Esslinger, then I'll come to you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. So I just want clarity. Does the Northwest LRT concept planning then will that reflect this change or, or because I want to make sure that it's not going to be left there and going to go forward in the future. Yes, yes it will. Um, once, once we finish hearing council, our committee um, approves this report for information, uh, we'll um, make the, the neighborhood structural plan amendments. We'll request that to sustainable development to prepare and work with the developer to, to make the plans, um, uh, amend the plans. Certainly, I support that. This is what the community wants, and I want to ensure that it was there for the future. Yes, it Thank is, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Loken. Thank you. So this is no mass transit center. Like, we have three of them already in that area, and basically a transfer point. That's correct. We are um, taking the opportunity with a clear transit center that's being used a lot right now, and the upgrades that we've done to Northgate, and the changes that we'll do to the Castle Downs Transit Center will service the area quite readily. Okay, so this won't interrupt uh, current transit service, uh, it'll enhance it, uh, shouldn't be any issues there? No, what we plan to do, as we are with some other sites um, in the upcoming years, is to create a, a very um, positive image about transit and the users in the area by upgrading the shelters, giving it a more of a, a friendly feeling and a safe feeling, um, and that's what we're working towards as we speak. Great. Thanks, Mr. Stolte. Thank you. Mayor Abbasan? Well, uh, what's the timeline of the next steps of work? You mentioned in a um, uh, plan amendment. We were speaking with the developer over lunch. He had the U.S. here this morning and very supportive of what we're doing. Um, I don't know. I have to check back with sustainable development and see what this It's not a hurry, though, right? Because this no, it's is not. concurrent with either their build-out or the LRT getting there, neither of which is imminent, right? That's correct. Because I think there, there might be one other option there, and I don't want to get into it, uh, but, but I'd, like to talk to, I'd like to talk to the landowners a little bit about um, business case for air rights and different kinds of things that, because it's a greenfield opportunity, I'd like to explore some other things with them. Um, and so I just, I'm hoping there's some time to do that. I think this is, this is a good fallback option. It's better than where we were before, but, but if there's a little more time to talk about some other things too. Unless the money falls from the sky tomorrow, which it might. We're doing okay on this. Uh, south, but Southeast LRT is first in line, so. Uh, yes, the, 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 oppor the opportunity okay. is there, and I'll okay. pass the information along to Sustainable yeah, I've Development. Spoken, and I've spoken to Marvin about it already. I've spoken to Dorian about it, so. Okay. Uh, okay. And I've spoken to the councillor about it as well, so. Anyway, okay, good. If there's time, then I won't belabor the point today. Thanks. Councillor Katrina? Yeah, just a uh, quick uh, update on this. Whenever this actually happens in that, uh, this will be an LRT site with no park and ride? Is that what you're proposing? That's correct. The park and ride is actually going to be at 137th Street. And so it's just going to be around Castle Downs over by the YMCA. And also we have a park and ride site at Eclair. 
the, new, the newest transit center on 97th Street. On 97th Street. Yeah. Well, uh, so this site itself, you said where? At the YMCA? That's correct. Uh, that's not that far, I don't think, but how far is it? Well, it's, it's not that far. It's not that far. I know the area, but and how the, far the, is it? Actually, the, pe the people... The people coming from Greensboro will be able to walk to the bus system, so the par the parking for the LRT w and the LRT stop will be up at Castle Downs and 137. So there won't be an impact on the neighborhood for parking. Uh, so how, how would you put a park and ride in at that intersection, 153rd and uh, uh, 137? No, um, we're not going to do a park and ride for transit. We're going to have a pull-off base. So there'll be no opportunities for parking. There is no park and ride. Okay, no. That, that's what I understood to start with, and that's why I'm clarifying. Oh, I'm sorry, no. There is no park and ride whatsoever? No. Uh, for so. No, nope, it's, it's all um, for residential use. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we received this for information. You're, then you're good to go. Thank you very much. All right, so all in favor of receiving uh, for information, uh, that is carried. And... Uh, uh, actually, uh, Council Walters uh, didn't want to exempt 8.1, but he did by mistake, so we don't Forgive need me. to discuss it. So uh, we don't need to talk about 8.1. So you will need to pass it, though. So we just need move the recommendation. Just move the recommendation 8.1. I'll move the recommendation 8.1, please. I'll move all the all recommendation. All in, all in favor? That is carried. Uh, any notes or motions? None whatsoever. We are adjourned.